Makati Productions presents an original Star Wars story, Sword of the Jedi, Book 3, Redemption, written by Gregory O. Scott. A war in the unknown regions threatens to spread across the galaxy. On the living world Zanima II, a strange coalition Imperial, Alliance, Chiss, U.S. and Vong, Mandalorian gathers to stop it. His leaders are all haunted by a tragedy named Darth Kedis, and to succeed Ben, Tahiri, and Jaina will have to face their failures and find redemption for themselves, and for Jas and Solo. Prologue, The Darkness Before The more he stared, the more he saw. His head was arched back to watch stars resolve from the night sky. Even as the stars shone brighter, the darkness itself seemed deeper, like an all-consuming abyss. Maybe it was the darkness of the sky that made the stars seem brighter, or maybe it was the other way around. He felt like he should know, and maybe had once, but couldn't remember any more. What are you looking at? Asked a soft female voice behind him. Jason Solo turned around, though it was night, and he had wandered alone into the forest of the middle distance. He had no problem seeing the squat, bird-like figure watching him from a few meters away with black, curious eyes. The figure rested on river-articulated legs. His head was cocked to one side and curiosity and a crest of red feathers flared atop its head. It seemed like the perfect image of his teacher, the late Vergeer, but he knew it was not her. He'd feel Vergeer's presence in the force, for one. Even more obviously, she did not breathe out puffs of vapor from her nostrils, and she trailed no three-toed footprints behind her. The surface temperature on Zanima II had dropped precipitously since the end of the battle for U.S. Hunter, and now a thin layer of white snow formed a crinkly carpet over the forest floor, interrupted only by the solitary trail of Jason's boots. He regarded the face of a world for a long moment before he said, Everything. I'm looking at everything. The feathers on Vergeer's neck ruffled in frustration. Second was so good at mimicry it was almost frightening. The living planet said through Vergeer's mouth, that's not very helpful. Jason looked back up at the stars. It feels like forever since I just stopped and watched the sky. The moment he said it, he recalled another time, maybe the last time. He had been with Vergeer then, the real Vergeer, on Coruscant, recently remade in the image of U.S. Hunter, the lost U.S. Hen Vong homeworld which they attempted to remake at the center of the dead New Republic, unaware that the true heir to U.S. Hunter was, fact, Zanima II itself. They had sat on the edge of a vine-laden cliff that had once been a building side and watched the twinkling rainbow lights of the bridge. It was there that Jason had finally realized, once and for all, that the U.S. Hen Vong had changed the galaxy forever and that he would have to change as well. He was still changing, even now. It had been barely a week since his fight with Onami, the true supreme overlord of the U.S. and Vong. With the help of his twin sister Jaina, he had stood firm and turned Onami's poisonous attacks on himself. He had not fought with physical violence, but by allowing himself to become a true conduit for the Force, passing beyond all definitions of light and dark, good and evil, life and death. For that brief, astonishing moment, he had felt at one with the whole of the cosmos, beyond the plane of normal existence which he had striven his whole life to reach past. Now he a normal man again, and he did not know what to do with himself. He talked to Jaina already and told her his desire, however vague and ill-defined, to go out and explore the galaxy. He wanted to uncover the secrets of all the Force-using sects that had taken different paths than the Jedi or the Sith. He wanted to reach beyond the overly simplistic dichotomy and find a way to commune with the entire unifying force once more. He knew the Antei, their listeners, Baron Du Sages, and the rest would never individually help him reach the exalted state he had felt during his fight with Onami, but he felt he had to try. There was nothing he wanted more. You are restless, Jason, Second observed. I've always been restless. Breath puffed in front of his face and was gone. It's just been a long time since I didn't have anything to do with that restlessness. But you have decided to explore the galaxy? Yes. You wish to find even more ways to experience the Force. Sometimes he forgot that he stood on the surface of a living being, 
one that could observe his actions and sense him in the force even when he was not aware. Yes, he said, I think I'd like to keep exploring. You wish to find out more about the force, and in doing so learn more about yourself, Second observed. In that, we are very much alike. You're hardly a typical being, Second. Neither are you, Jason Solo. I guess you've got me there. How do you plan to learn more going forward? I think you know. The U.S. and Vong are now arriving on this world. It is already proven to be an interesting family reunion. I can't imagine. As I learn more about them, I learn about myself. It is a truly symbiotic relationship, the kind U.S. Hunter once had with the U.S. and Vong, before they became so warlike that U.S. Hunter pushed them onto a plane of the four separate from those all other beings experience. Symbiosis? Jason echoed. Sounds nice, but I think I'm going to be doing this journey alone. Vergier's mouth drooped in a slight frown. It is not good to be alone, Jason. Your family and friends depend on you. Your sister, especially, needs you, though I sense she is too proud to admit it. I know, he allowed. A part of him hated the idea of leaving Jaina and the rest of his family behind while he went off on some quest of self-discovery. There are some things I can only do alone. He truly believed that. All his life he sought a personal, individual relationship with the Force, which was why he'd opposed Luke's creation of the Jedi Council for so long. The idea of the Jedi acting as nothing more than glorified political arbiters was still repulsive to him. The Force was so much more than that. You may be right. Fragir seemed distracted. Her head tilted toward the stars for a moment. Then back at Jason. Second asked, when I was born as a conscious entity, I was alone. I was afraid and confused. I had just been attacked for the first time by the beings I now know as the U.S. and Vong. My children had bombed me and destroyed the home of the Magister, Lior Hal. It was the pain and trauma of his death that woke me from a very long slumber. No lesson is truly learned until it has been purchased with pain, Jason muttered. It was something the real Vergier had told him, and he told her that he hoped to find another way. Even after his fight with Onami, he wasn't sure if he had, but he was determined to keep trying. To this day that event keeps a lasting power over me, Second admitted. I've come to view the place where Lior Hal died as a birthing chamber, and I feel stronger there than any anywhere else. You're a living world. Doesn't your presence extend to everything on the planet? It does, Second admitted. But even so, I found that my powers and sense of self are stronger in some places than others, and strongest of all in that place of pain, that place where I was, after a fashion born. Second laughed softly. As I told you, I remain a mystery, even to myself. May I see this place? Jason asked. He'd been so intent on searching for mysteries throughout the galaxy that he'd almost forgotten the great mystery beneath his feet. Of course, Second smiled with Vergier's face. I was only waiting for you to ask. I would give you a little advice, though, Jason Solo. Dress warm. It's going to be very cold. Jason stood in a fantasy of white. The morning light shone through a filter of pale clouds, and the mountain slope on which he stood was coated with thick snow. Even now, flakes lazily drifted through the air. The atmosphere on the mountain top was thin and cold, and Jason was dressed in an insulated suit with a fur-lined hood and a breathing mask attached to his mouth and nose. Even with nearly all his body covered, the icy wind still stung his eyes and the bridge of his nose. Yet Second had told him to come here, so he had no choice. He left behind the small organic second flyer he had taken to the mountain and began walking up the slope, as the living world had instructed. He kept his head down against the wind and looked before taking every step forward. It took so much effort to keep his footing on the snowy, rocky slope that he entirely failed to look at what was further ahead of him. Still, he felt it when he reached his destination. He picked his head up and saw something rising up out of the snow-laden mountainside. It appeared to be pillars, and perhaps the remnants of a wall. He climbed further up the slope to examine the ruins more thoroughly. They remained draped in snow, but he could tell when his feet moved off the rough scree of the mountain and onto the flat surface of what had once been the floor of a house. 
As he examined the ruins, he spotted a cave burrowing into the mountainside. Eager to get out of the biting wind, he stepped inside and turned on the glory he'd brought with him. The interior walls of the cave were smooth and angular. Surely, someone had carved this room as part of the building whose ruins lay strewn in the snow outside. He felt a presence. His body stiffened. It didn't have to speak. Jason knew when it was there. He turned to see Vergier's form crouched in the mouth of the cave. You're not cold, Jason asked. All of me is cold, the living world said. I am too far from Coruscant's primary. However, it does not hinder me the same way it does for you humans. Us humans, Jason shook his head. So weak, huh? No. Some of you are quite resilient. Enough with the flattery, second. Jason hugged his arms around himself. Can you tell me what I'm supposed to do here before I freeze to death? You are the one who asked to come here, are you not? Yeah, but you wanted me to come here. So what's the deal? Fragir's nostril snorted breathlessly. You humans so impatient. Well, some of us are freezing to death. Can you at least give me a hint as to why I dragged myself up here? Not even the real Vergier was this obtuse. Obtuse. Vergier's head shook. No matter. You are here, Jason Solo, because I want you to try something for me. Such as. Vergier extended one feathery arm as if to shake. Take my hand, please. Jason stared at the four-fingered hand. He stared at her face. Her body moved in imitation of breath, but no vapor came from her nostrils. He'd even been touched by second in Regier's form before. It had felt like nothing more than the faintest pressure. He knew he could walk straight through the Regier simulacrum if he wished. The living world could manifest images in the minds of its people but could still not take physical form. Please, second said. Jason shrugged, reached out. His fingers wrapped around Regier's hand and held on tight. He stared in shock. A slight, ambiguous smile appeared. So like the ones Vergier used to sport. He gave the hand a slight pull and tugged Vergier's body forward half a step. I don't. I don't understand, Jason muttered, afraid to release his grip on the arm of Vergier, or second, or whatever was in the cave with him. It is all right, Jason. The smile remained on Vergier's face. I have found that in this place, this cave where my existence was purchased with the pain of Leora Hall's death, I can come closer to touching the unifying force and perhaps discovering the secret that lies in the darkness before my awakening. But, what am I holding? This world contains all the building blocks of life, jazz and solo. Carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, all I have to do is draw on them, arrange them in the patterns, and bind them together with the force. In this way I hope I can speak directly to my children instead of using Magister Jabatha as a vessel. You're building yourself. A body. What is it you? I mean, it's not Vergier herself, is it? Jason stared at that face, that ambiguous smile. Suddenly something began to change. The feathers on Vergier's face seemed to wilt. Her face grew visibly more worn. Something in the black well of her eyes seemed to change. Her fingers tightened their grip on Jason's wrist and, suddenly, Jason felt something through the force like a punch. It was a familiar sensation. A familiar presence, one he hadn't though he'd ever see against after it faded away in front of him in the dark mining tunnel on the desolate world of Ebic Nine. For jeer, he shouted. He jerked his hand back in shock, twisting his wrist free. Suddenly, Vergier's presence was gone. Her image winked out too, right before his eyes, leaving Jason to stare at snow drifting against filmy white clouds beyond the cave mouth. He stayed there for what seemed like forever holding one hand in the other, waiting for some explanation as to what had happened. It finally came when he heard a long, drawn-out sigh behind him. He turned around and saw a short, blue-eyed, round-faced human boy, maybe twelve years old. He had dirty blonde hair chopped short except for a single braid that hung onto the shoulder of his thin white tunic. It took Jason a moment to realize he was looking at the image of his late grandfather. He still struggled to understand how such a small, innocent looking boy could become the horror that was Darth Vader. He hated when Second appeared in this form. His dead mentor's image was discomforting, but it was still far better than this reminder that even the best of the Jedi could become a monster. 
What happened? Jason demanded. He was in no mood for games. It's a little hard for me to understand, too. Young Anakin Skywalker crossed his arms over his chest. Second said, I can give shape and form to myself, but I can also call on those lost. That was Vajir. I felt her through the force. How did you do it? Vajir was very important to me, Second said. She helped awaken me to my true self. It is possible that the link she forged with me in life created a tether that ties me to her still, even in death. The sophisticated words sounded so strange from a child's mouth. Can you do that? Can you reach beyond death? Jason stared into the eyes of Anakin Skywalker, but all he could think about was the other Anakin, his younger brother, who had died saving the Jedi from the Voxen and Mirkir. He was suddenly overcome by the desire to talk to Anakin again, even if just for one minute, just so he could let him know that his sacrifice was not in vain, that the Jedi were strong and united as never before, that they had brought peace to the U.S. Vong and come to a new understanding of the Force itself. But as he stared into Anakin Skywalker's eyes, he knew his wish would never be. The living world sensed that too. The boy shook his head and second said, I'm sorry, Jason. I can't touch your brother. I never knew him. Even with Vajir, I feel merely shadows. Intimations. I am still learning these abilities myself. I understand, Jason said. Though in truth, whatever self-discovery second was going through had staggering implications. It could further alter the Jedi's already changing understanding of the nature of the Force. He wondered if, somehow, the living world was not also drawing on the same wellspring of cosmic power that he had used to defeat Onami. It will take time for me to work this out, Second said. As I said, I am barely beginning to understand my own mysteries. I know, Jason nodded gravely. And I'll keep this a secret, if you want. Please do, Anakin Skywalker nodded. Jason stared into the blue eyes of his grandfather and wondered, just for an instant, if Second could reach into the Force and touch the spirit of his dead grandfather. Jason's Uncle Luke, as well as his mother Leia, had claimed to speak with the ghost of Anakin Skywalker shortly after Darth Vader's death. It was through these visions that they knew that Anakin Skywalker, from all the horrible things he'd done in life, had been redeemed in the end and merged peacefully with the Force to join his old masters, Obi-Wan and Yoda, in whatever lay beyond the end. In this way, Anakin Skywalker's tale had not just been a cautionary one of how a Jedi could fall, but an uplifting one of how even the most evil could save themselves. Just as the greatest Jedi could fall, so could the worst Sith be redeemed if he truly sought redemption. Is there something you want to ask me, Jason? Ask the young, innocent face of Darth Vader. No. Jason shook his head. I understand you'll need time to develop this skill. I'll give you that time. But I'd like to come back someday and see what you've discovered. And I would like to see what you discover, Jason. It's a deal then. Jason did his best to grant despite the discomfort he felt. It is. Anakin Skywalker adopted a smile that was almost Virgir like in his playful ambiguity. Until then, his grandfather's image faded away before Jason's eyes, leaving him alone in the dark cave. He hugged himself, gathering heat to his body and pondering new mysteries. The possibilities were tantalizing, frightening, and exciting, he but knew there was nothing he could do about them now. Jason gave the cave one last look around, saw nothing of interest, and went out into the snow. Part 1. The Sun A long time ago. Ben Skywalker stands in his cousin's apartment. The sun is going down over Galactic City, and the towers of Coruscant skyline, each one a unique and artful thrust toward invisible stars, light up one by one against a backdrop of ever-deepening reds and violets. Sunset in Galactic City is beautiful, but Ben barely notices. He stands in front of Jason's dining table, double-checking the items he's crammed into his bag. Jason told him to pack light, but also to pack everything that could conceivably help them on their mission. So now, as the sun goes down and the lights come up, he deliberates over each and every item. He knows this mission will be dangerous and he wants to be totally prepared. Just as importantly, 
he does not want to let his cousin down. The door to Jason's bedroom opens and his cousin walks out. Jason is dressed in a plain dark brown jacket and trousers. His lightsaber dangles from his belt, the only outward sign that he is a Jedi. Jason hardly ever wears Jedi robes like Jaina or his parents, and when he's hanging around Jason, neither does Ben. And that suits Ben perfectly fine, because he doesn't like Jedi robes. He doesn't like the lingering looks he gets from passers-by, that mix of awe and fear that separates him from ordinary beings. He doesn't like the Jedi Temple either, or the looks he gets from the people there, which are at once patronizing and reverent. When he's with Jason, he's not the son of the most powerful Jedi alive. He's not afraid to draw on the Force like he was in his childhood, hiding out the U.S. and Vong War on the Mall. Ben only feels like himself when he's with Jason. Well, Ben, Jason asks, hands on his hips as he stands in the middle of his kitchen, are you packed? I think so. Ben deliberately takes a step back from his bag, wordlessly inviting Jason to examine it and make sure he didn't screw anything up. Jason doesn't seem to notice the offer. Well, that's good, because I've got everything I need packed too. We've got an hour before our ship is set to leave, but I think it's good to be early, don't you? Ben nods. Jason trusts him to take care of himself, and that means more than he can say. He reaches forward and closes the bag tight. Jason ducks back into his room and comes out against with the satchel slung over his shoulder. Ben takes his bag and does the same, though at 13 his bag looks and feels a lot bigger than Jason's. For a second it threatens to tip him over. You okay, Ben? Jason asks, a slight smile on his face. I'm good, Ben nods. I'm ready for anything. Well, you should be. The smile doesn't leave. A Dumer is a very strange planet with a very different culture. Have you been there before? Jason shakes his head. No, but I've read all the material from Alliance Intelligence. Just like you have, I assume. Of course. In truth, the data pad with all the info on a Dumer is crammed into his pack. He's been saving it for the long trip there. Jason probably senses his lie, but he doesn't seem to care. Good. That means you know the Adumari pride themselves on their fighting skills. They also have a strong sense of honor, which means their honor is going to be really offended when we bust the illegal missile manufacturing operation they've got going. Which means we could have to fight our way out. Ben feels a little dry in the mouth. This won't be his first combat mission with Jason, but it still makes him feel uneasy. I'm kind of counting on it. The smile is gone from Jason's face now. Very seriously, he takes a step closer and lays a hand on Ben's shoulder. You should be careful. I don't want to have to tell your mom and dad I let you get hurt on my watch. Ben can feel Jason's concern flowing through the forest. He says, don't worry, Jason. I know you've got my back. His cousin pats him on the shoulder. Just as long as you've got mine. Ben smiles. He can't help it. Jason isn't his parents or the teachers at the academy. Or the normal people on the street. To Jason, he's not an heir, not a son, not a mysterious magician or a noble warrior. He's a man, a capable and responsible adult, the kind he really wants to be. Jason withdraws his hand. Okay, Ben, let's get going. A Dumer awakes. Jason turns to go. Ben follows him over the threshold, and once they're through, Jason closes and locks it tight leaving the apartment cool and empty as a long night begins to fall. Chapter 1 A cool breeze washed over the clearing. Grasses rippled under invisible force, and the borer trees in the distance wavered, rustled. It caught Ben in the face but he couldn't look away, couldn't even blink. It was Jason, but it wasn't. It couldn't be. The Jason walking toward them through the field of tall rippling grass, his hair, Ben noticed, Unmoving despite the wind was not any Jason he remembered. Certainly not the Jason he had spoken to in the lake of apparitions, restless and bitter, no longer Sith but not repentant of what he'd done. Not Darth Kedis either, whose gold rimmed eyes blazed with fury. And not the Jason before Kedis either, at least not the one Ben remembered meeting after he returned from his five year odyssey across the galaxy in search of new Force users. Looking back, he realized there had been something grim about that Jason, 
something tired, something resigned, even before he sold his soul to Lumiaya in an attempt to bring peace to the galaxy. This Jason was like no Jason Ben could remember. His steps were confident but light. His eyes were alert and eager. His face was not young. It had been through too much for that, but it was not tired the way Ben remembered. It looked like it belonged to a man ready to go exploring. Second, Tahiri said confidently, not shocked at all. The living planet. Of course, Ben thought. He'd been told about this. The living world could manifest itself with thought projections, taking the shape of other beings it had met. Now it chose to greet them with the form of Jason Solo, Jason as he was before he began his long, awful fall to become Darth Kedis. Ben didn't know whether to laugh or cry. Why? He heard Jaina rasp. She wasn't laughing or crying. She was angry. Why him? Sekka stopped a few meters away from them. Jason's eyes blinked once, twice. His voice said, I'm sorry. I thought you would appreciate a familiar face. Please, said Tahiri more steadily, we would appreciate someone else. Very well, Sekut said. And then Jason was gone, and a U.S. Hinvong woman stood before them. She was tall and thin, her face marked by tattoos but no scars. She wore the tall, tentacle-topped headdress of a member of their shaper case. She appeared without Ben's even blinking. Jason was there one moment, this U.S. Hinvong scientist, also dead. The next. Is this better? The planet asked. That one's all right, Tahiri said. She looked at Ben, then at Jaina, whose hands were still clenched in white fists at her side. Neither of you met her, but this, Faye Sekut, is where and belonged to Nen Yim. She was the U.S. Hinvong scientist whose memories were implanted in me. The U.S. Hinvong nodded. The tentacles in her headdress bobbed slightly in imitation of natural motion but did not stir in the wind. It is fine to see you again. Are you calling yourself Tahiri now, Arena? You can't call me Tahiri, the blonde Jedi said. She did not show the visible discomfort Jaina did, even though Sekut had brought back the traumatic moments of her past, when the implanted U.S. Hinvong memories had warred with her natural ones, and the only solution had been to force a compromise where both self existed within the body of a slim, short woman with gold hair, green eyes, and three scars over her forehead as a reminder of what she was deep down. Tahiri seemed calm, almost confident, even as she looked into the eyes of the person she'd almost been. Ben wished he could say the same. Still, his discomfort was nothing compared to the indignation rolling off Jaina in the Force. Why did you bring us here? She demanded. Did you have us land out here to talk to us? Because I'd have much rather set down in a nice settlement. We have a lot of questions that need answering. I am sure you do. The image of Nin Yim folded his hands patiently over his waist. Min was struck by the long fingers, each digit deformed by biological instruments grafted onto flesh and bone. However, those instructions did not come from me. I understand that the Magister wishes to treat new arrivals with caution. A party is coming to meet you as we speak. I can feel them, Tahiri said. Voice soft but firm. I don't, Jaina said. Ben tried to put the strange thing in front of him out of his mind and reached out with the force. He felt nothing beyond the general sensation of plant and animal life in the forest around them. Not even Sekut's thought projection registered. Is you as involved, Tahiri said. Oh, Ben muttered. He'd almost forgotten, but Tahiri's experience with the U.S. involved, her captivity, and alteration surgeries, had left her with the ability to sense other U.S. and Vong and Vong formed life via a faint sense of telepathy, less like the force and more like the thought signal used by their Yamask war machines to communicate. He remembered that Jason had possessed those abilities too. Can we trust them? Jaina asked. Nin Yim's head nodded. Of course. We met some of U.S. and Vong already who weren't too friendly, Ben said. Are these different? Certainly. Second seemed faintly offended. The ones you encountered are a splinter faction. Wayward children. They're very deadly children, Jaina said. Second nodded gravely. I understand. And that is why I hope you will help bring them home to me. You'd welcome them? Tahiri asked, 
before Jaina could interject. I already did once. Nin Yam's head tilted back, like she was listening to something beneath the whistle of wind and the rustling of trees and grass. They're almost here, Tahiri said. And so I'll leave you now, the living world said. However, I would like to ask one brief question. Go ahead, Tahiri said. She had apparently become the speaker for the expedition. My projection of the late Nin Yim didn't distress you, did it? Tahiri shook her head. No, it was actually a little nice. And yet my projection of Jason Solo did. Silence fell over the group. Ben said, Jason's dead. I know. Nin Yim's face looked at him. There was something doubly alien in those eyes. I felt his passing in the force and that of your mother. Ben stiffened. He remembered that Zanima Sekid had gone missing before Jason began his downfall, before he had killed Mara J. Skywalker. Do you know how they died? Ben asked. No. I was hoping you could tell me, at a later time. Jaina blew out a long, long sigh. At a later time? The living world seemed to sense the darkness lingering over them. It nodded and said, I look forward to it. And then it was gone. Ben, Jaina, and Tahiri stood in the middle of the field, cold wind whipping tall grass around their waists, and none of them could think of anything to say. A short time or a while later, Ben saw figures coming from the far side of the clearing. They were approaching rapidly, and he realized that they were not just humanoid Yuas and Vong, as he'd been expecting, but Yuas and Vong mounted atop something else. He sensed Jaina and even Tahiri tense. He unclipped his lightsaber from his belt but did not ignite, not yet. As they got closer he realized they were riding three bipedal animals. They powered forward onto thick, bird-like legs that supported a fat, scaled body with a long tail and flat reptilian head that ran parallel to the grass. Two Yuas and Vong rode atop each creature. They moved fast and had the Jedi surrounded before they could do anything to defend themselves. For a long, long moment the three creatures eyed the Jedi hungrily, while the Yuas and Vong looked down impassively. Their faces bore the elaborate tattoos Ben had come to expect from the Yuas and Vong but none of their faces bore the elaborate deformations and implants he'd seen in Holos. Some had scarring, yes, but it seemed faint and artfully covered by the tattoos. Each of them seemed to have an amphistaff curled around his waist, and Ben certainly recognized those snake-like, armored, living weapons from the Holos. Tahiri broke the tense silence. Very O'Shea? Is that you? A U.S. Vong sitting on the creature directly in front of them leaned in close. He wore white face paint to go with his black tattoos, and Ben thought he saw signs of some elaborate scarring beneath the chalky color. He had no idea how to guess U.S. Vong ages, but this one looked a little older than the rest. Toron Crash. Vilar P. Tal Vorn Rina Quad. The U.S. Vong asked. Ben picked out the name at least. Kettlemar Vorush Nayat. Tahiri said. The words sounded strange and harsh on her tongue, but she did not look angry, happy almost. The U.S. Vong, very O'Shea apparently, made a weird sound that was someplace between a snort and a rattle. Ben realized that he must have been laughing. Kelash Morit Nayat, Rena Quad, Shea gave a come forward gesture. His mouth had no lips, but he opened his teeth a little apparently in some grotesque imitation of a human smile. Let's go, Tahiri said. You want us to get on those things? Ben gaped. The one Shay was writing was staring at him hard with a pair of black reptilian eyes, like it had found its next meal. The night is harmless, Tahiri insisted. They can carry up to three, so one on each. Where are they taking us? Jaina asked. She was eyeing the Nayat with the same suspicion Ben was. Tahiri looked at Vary O'Shea and asked, Spall Kreesh Veril Mach Forth. Wheelak. Cole Fleeth Morak Huth Magister Pellant. Did he just say Magister? Jaina asked. What's a Magister? Ben asked. Some kind of ruler. He didn't know why a planet with his own consciousness would need a ruler, but frankly he understood next to nothing about Zanima Second and some of the explanations he'd already gotten about it from Tahiri Jassen and his parents, nobody else really did either.
The Magister is the living authority on this planet, Tehiri explained. When I was here last, it was a pharaoh woman named Jabatha. Pharaohs are the natives, right? They colonized the planet less than two centuries ago. If anyone is really from second, well, the U.S. and Vong come closest. Oh, so they're sharing the world now. How's that working out? Tahiri glanced at Vary O'Shea, then back at Ben. I guess we'll find out. It didn't been long to decide that travel by Nyant was not his preferred method. The beasts threw you about when they ran, they smelled like sour milk for some reason, and he still wasn't convinced his mount didn't want to eat him. One thing he was impressed by was the fact that the animals were able to nimbly navigate around the dense forest of borer trees, and Ben did not get a single branch of low-hanging multicolored leaves in his face. It was as if the creatures, the forest itself, or both were somehow acting to keep him from accidental harm. Even though he could feel the borer trees in the forest and the nay not at all, they seemed to operate in perfect communion with one another. That should have made Ben feel better but it didn't. There were still far too many unknowns, and beyond them was one the one thing he did know that was worst of all. Vesterakai was out there somewhere, fighting with these wayward Vong, and while the idea you was and Vong Sith Alliance was terrifying, it wasn't half as terrifying as the idea of facing Vester again. He tried to push the Sith girl out of his thoughts, but he'd never been very good at that, even before she betrayed him and almost gotten his cousin Alana killed. This time, at least he got the distraction of a terrifying night right across forest and plain, and their eventual arrival in a town nestled in a small valley. He'd seen pictures of cities on Zanima second before, but now that he was actually in one he was impressed by the graceful domes of the buildings, the way the organic huts and towers rose seamlessly out of the earth. He was impressed, too, with the mix of beings milling about the buildings. There seemed to be equal numbers you was involved, and blue-skinned beings he took to be pharaohs. Everyone paused to watch as the new arrivals as their naiad mouth strode down the town's center lane. Young Yuas Hinvong with painted, unscarred faces stopped and stared slaw-jawed. Pharaohs peeked out of huts, almost timidly. A blue-skinned woman held a child in her arms, and as Ben passed the child held out one fat hand to wave. It was all Ben could do to wave back. Their mouse finally came to a half in front of one broad domed building at the end of the lane. A mixed party of pharaohs and Yuas and Vong were waiting for them, and Ben scanned for Jabatha. He didn't know what she looked like, but he was expecting some hunched, matronly old pharaoh. He didn't see any of those, but he was surprised to see a human woman on the young side of middle age, with curly blonde hair half tied at the back of her neck. She had her hands folded in front of her and a warm smile on her face. He dropped directly from the back of the naiad, using the force to cushion his fall. Tahiri and Jaina did the same, and his cousin went directly toward the blonde woman at the head of the group awaiting them. Danny, Jaina exclaimed. Are you? A smile formed on the woman's face. I'm the Magister here. It's been a very long time. It's good to see you, Jaina. And you, Tahiri? It's good to be back, the other blonde woman said. The pharaohs and Yuas and Vong clustered around this Danny woman looked surprised as she and Jaina walked right up to their magister and exchanged warm hugs. As Jaina stepped out of the embrace, she gestured back at Ben. I think you two met a long time ago. Danny, this is my cousin Ben. Ben, this is Danny Kui. She was a scientist who helped us during the war. Jaina didn't say which war and that put Ben off for a moment. For him, the war was the one that began with a mission to an illegal Adumari missile factory and ended with his mother dead and his cousin a fallen Sith Lord. But to Danny, and probably everyone else on Zanima second from here on out, the war was the one he'd been born during. The shock of time visibly shook Danny. The Magister put a hand over her open mouth, and her eyes went wide. When she finally composed herself, she said, Hello, Ben. I doubt you remember me. Yeah, Ben scratched his head awkwardly. It's been a while. Yes, it has. Danny took her hand away from her mouth. She looked the group over and said, You have no idea what it's like to see someone from my corner of the galaxy. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to all of you on Seka's behalf. Actually, Jaina said, We already got one when we landed. 
Danny's eyes went white again. A few of the pharaohs and you us and Vong started whispering among themselves. I see, Danny said eventually. She clearly wanted to say more, but this was not the place. She gestured to the building behind her. Please, let's have a seat and talk privately. I'm sure we all have stories to tell. After a moment of visible reluctance, the crowd parted to allow them access to the structure's round black porthole. Danny went in first, followed by Jaina and Tahiri, with Ben bringing up the rear. The crowd lingered outside the door, whispering again, but none tried to enter. The inside of the building was like nothing Ben had ever seen before. The ceiling was low and curved, befitting the shape of the exterior. Brown's pillars rose to support the roof at seemingly random locations and seemed to attach the floor and ceiling both by tree-like roots. Shelves protruded from the walls and were bound by objects wrapped in woven cloth or leather. Danny led them to a spot on the floor where they sat down on a carpet with intricately woven designs in red and orange that contrasted with the cool green-blue tone of the ceiling, walls, and floor. This has grown, Ben stated the obvious, because for him at least, it was like nothing in the known galaxy. Certainly not the endless artificiality of Coruscant or the old stone ruins of Asus. He wondered if the entire planet was like this. Danny nodded as she sat with her legs crossed, white hands folded in her lap. This entire village was created less than 10 standard years ago, she told him. Ben looked around and gave an impressed whistle. The curiously organic nature of the village made it seem as ageless as the valley and forests in which it was placed. I remember, Tahiri said. Before I left, we were planning to grow more cities and towns. This is one of them, Danny said. As you can see, we've settled it with a mixed pharaoh and U.S. Hanvong population. How is that working? Tahiri asked. To Ben and Jaina, she explained. When I left, the populations were still largely in separate cities, mostly on separate continents. Neither group was keen and mixing, and she stopped herself, shook her head. We can't get to all that later. There's more important things, aren't there? There are, Jaina nodded, then said pointedly to Danny. You were surprised when we said we spoke into second. Yes, Danny sighed. The woman, who until now had projected a certain ageless elegance, looked suddenly old. She said, Second has not spoken to me, or to my knowledge anyone on this planet, since True Honor left. True Honor, Jaina repeated. That's what the renegade U.S. Hanvong fleet calls itself. Danny nodded. Have you had contact with them? A bit, yeah. But most of that contact has actually been with another renegade fleet. We've been fighting them too. There's a mixed Imperial Alliance fleet out there, trying to find Zanum a second. Like yours, Danny said. Like ours, Jaina allowed. But they want to exterminate every last U.S. Hinvong in the galaxy, and I don't think they'll shed tears if Second goes out with them. If anything, this world is probably their primary target. The True Honor faction always said it would happen. Danny said gravely. And the true victory people are renegades said the Vong were going back on the warpath. Looks like they proved each other right. This true victory fleet, is it led by the Bothans? The commander is a Bothan, but it has all types. There's a lot of people who still hold a grudge because of what happened in the war. I know, Danny said. I was one of them, at least in the beginning. But we're making progress. We've made great strides in reforming the priest caste and elevating the extolled. You clearly didn't pacify the warriors, Ben said. Danny could have taken it as a harsh rebuke, but the woman nodded in acceptance. They've always been the most difficult to work with. It was mostly them who started the True Honor movement. Where did they get a fleet? Tahiri asked. After the treaty, their warships were flown into Coruscant's sun. They take a lot of time and energy to grow too. I know it's been 10 years since I was here, but I don't remember any warships being made then. The ships True Honor uses are not newly grown, Danny said. The circumstances are still unclear to us, but it seems they were ships abandoned by U.S. and Vong coming to Zanima and left in other systems throughout the galaxy. Someone gathered, repaired, and readied them for combat. Why weren't they destroyed? Ben asked. 
It's a big galaxy, Tahiri said. And it was a huge war. There's still abandoned ships from the Empire or the Clone Wars that are being found. It's no surprise there are lost U.S. and Vong ships too. It must have taken a lot of effort to find and repair all those ships, Ben spoke up. I thought all the U.S. and Vong were supposed to be on Zanima second. Yes, Danny said. They should have been. As I said, it's still something we don't fully understand. So let's win things back, Jaina said. This true honor movement, when did it leave Zanima second? Danny thought a moment. About three months ago. As I said, I haven't heard from second since then. I have been worried. To Ben, she looked more than worried. She looked like a woman trying very hard to cover deep, almost spiritual doubts about everything she'd been doing with her life, and he felt sorry for her. Instead of prying in this direction with a woman be barely new, Ben asked, why did Zanima II leave his old location five years ago? What happened? Danny swallowed. There was an incident. Zanima was attacked by some beings. Nothing we were familiar with. Can you describe them? Jaina asked. I can try. They used strange, crystal-like ships, and they attacked in swarms. They dove into our atmosphere and hit our towns and villages. Many died. They don't sound familiar, Tahiri said. How did you defeat them? Ben asked. He'd heard that Sekid had terrible defensive power, enough to wipe out an entire fleet if it so chose. We didn't, Danny said. Rather than fight and destroy them, Sekid elected to jump to hyperspace. However, the jump and the attack left us gravely damaged. All our long-range communication systems were down. Navigation was also wrecked. The previous Magister, Jabatha, was killed, as was the warrior's leader Nose Choka. It must have been horrible, Tahiri said. Been imagined scenes of devastation were playing with particular vividness in her mind. It was, Danny nodded. Worse than the physical damage was the spiritual damage. Many U.S. Hinvong felt betrayed by Second and the new teachings we tried to introduce. So they formed True Honor, Jaina said. The movement existed before, but it grew greatly after the disaster, Danny nodded. Nose Choka was a moderating influence on the warriors, and losing him hurt a lot. It created an opening for more extreme voices, especially from members of Domain Law. Even those who weren't tempted to return to the old ways were very worried. We waited for some Alliance team to come and find us. And we kept waiting, year after year. Nobody came. Some of us felt betrayed. She tried to keep the bitterness from her voice, but it was radiating off of her through the force. Ben could only imagine what it had been like for a human to be cut off from her own kind, left to guide an alien civilization without anyone to depend on. He barely knew Danny Kui, but his heart went out to her. As if to shirk off Ben's pity, Danny said, I'm sure we weren't easy to find. And I'm sure things have happened that kept you from finding us until now. You could say that again, Ben thought, but he didn't say anything. He didn't know where to begin. Have you heard anything about the Alliance? Jaina asked cautiously. Anything at all? Danny shook her head and looked down. I only know that your brother Jason is dead. And your aunt too. She looked up at Ben. Second felt them pass in the force. I'm so sorry. Ben's throat tightened. Nobody spoke. Cautiously, Danny asked, Can you explain what happened? Jaina shook her head. We can talk about it later. What matters now is that Uncle Luke sent us to save you and the U.S. involved. There's more to this than just renegades. The Sith are involved too. The Sith? Danny's jaw dropped. The Sith have returned. How? That's another long story, Jane aside. What we're dealing with now, well, we don't actually know much about these Sith. Master Skywalker encountered one a few years ago, and we've been trying to track them ever since. If True Honor had helped putting together a fleet, I bet it came from them. That's horrible. I had no idea things were that bad. Things could get a whole lot worse if we don't work together. We'd like to help you rebuild your engines, your navigation and transmitters, all of that. Can we bring more people down? When Danny looked hesitant, Jaina pressed, I remember the old rules. 
No warships. But we can bring down people, right? Danny nodded. I think that should be okay. Good. Jaina looked relieved, and Ben remembered that one of her Mando friends, if that was the word, was lying up in Celestial's hangar in a coma. She'd wanted to bring him down to see if Sekik could heal him. What about defense? Tahiri asked. If it were under attack by the Sith, would Sekik defend itself with force? Danny thought for a long time, but in the end all she could say was I don't know. I'm sorry, I just I don't know. It's okay, Jaina said. We brought a lot of ships with us. They can't help us defend. She didn't say that their flagship was badly damaged and that they'd already lost two gunships and a Star Destroyer fighting the Renegade True Victory fleet. A fight against either True Honor or a rematch with True Victory could prove very costly, and Ben was quietly hoping the two Renegade fleets finished each other off. It would save him another encounter with Vester too. That would be a relief, but he knew the universe wasn't that nice. If it's all right with you, Jaina told Danny, I'd like to talk to the fleet. Do you have any transmitters in this village? There is something, Danny said, and started to rise. Good. Jaina got to her feet, as did Ben and Tahiri. I'll call Jag and tell him to start sending down people. Jag. Danny's eyes lit with recognition. Do you mean Jagged Fell? Yep, Jaina nodded. Commander of Task Force Trinity, as we call it. Also, my husband. Husband? Danny's mouth broke into a white smile, but tears welled in her eyes. She stepped forward and clasped Jaina's arm. Oh, I'm so glad. How long? Just a couple years, Jaina said, a little awkwardly. It took a while to sort things out. Oh, I'm so glad. Danny squeezed Jaina's arm hard. I'm glad there's something left worth celebrating. With visible reluctance, Jaina's hard face cracked its own smile. It looked tired but true. Yeah, I guess there is. Chapter 2 Sial and Tilly's felt like she'd barely had time to breath. It had been only a few hours since her sister Mary had appeared before her, resurrected weeks after she'd resigned herself to the fact that her only sister was as lost to her as her fiancé Tim, who died at Bamora four long years ago. Sial had been unable to control all the feelings surging through her, and had ended up collapsed, and sobbing on her bed in unspeakable joy. But she was still an officer of the Galactic Alliance Navy, captain of the flagship Starless, which was even now undergoing repairs as it orbited Zanima II. The battle to rescue Myri and her commander Jagged Fell had been a costly one. Starless herself had taken heavy damage, and two gunship escorts, Viridian and Cerulean, had been destroyed with all hands. Starless had taken some revenge by destroying one of their cruisers, but the fact remained that Task Force Trinity had been weakened and dangerous enemies lurked nearby that they were not prepared to face. Still, they had reached their destination, and Mary was back from the dead. Sial had to keep a smile off her face as she went into the conference room to hear Commander Fell's briefing. Her first sight of Fell was immediately sobering. Her cousin wore the specially tailored uniform designed for his unique position, with an alliance shape, just black color, and imperial red blood stripes running down the flanks. That much hadn't changed. His face, however, was pale and gaunt, and a black eye patch clung to a strap over his left eye. The flesh on that side of his face seemed pink and tender. One of his hands was wrapped in back to patches, and his other arm swelled with more patches concealed by the cuff of his uniform. When Sayo walked into the room, he nodded to her but didn't say a thing. She went straight for her seat and was embarrassed to find that she was the last one at the conference table. The rest of Trinity senior commanders had already gathered. Next to Sayo was Sol Vernadette, captain of the largest remaining Imperial vessel, Vindicator. The previous flagship, Justifier, had been destroyed in a sneak attack by Admiral Dalla's renegades, and its captain, Philior, had been taken prisoner. Philior's fate was still a confused issue, and Sayol could see the uncertainty on the old captain's craggy face. Next to Vernadette was Mila Pavrik, commander of the fleet carrier Karuska Gem. Pavrik was tall Calibop, whose gold and red wings were arced behind her back, trailing feathers on the conference room's floor. 
Pavrik's black eyes blinked as she glanced at Sial, but her avian face was unreadable. Beside the Calibop was the Gamorrean. Vort Piggy Sabinering, commander of the Special Wraith Squadron unit to which Miri belonged, had been one of their father's pilots in wars previous. When he looked at Sial, she saw an expression on his wide green tusk face that, to most beings, would have been unreadable, but she could tell he was smiling. After the Gamorrean was the Bothan. Traz Creffy had been the most famous admiral of the U.S. Hanvong War, but political embarrassments and his siding with the separatists during the recent civil war had turned him into an odd figure, not Elias yet his most senior officer here. He was presently serving as a military advisor aboard Starless and had been a mentor to the leader of the renegade fleet, Brenner Refcha. Finally, there was Wines of Fell, the human captain of the Chiss vessel Celestial. Jag's sister, Winesa had abandoned the fleet once, only to reappear just in time to rescue Jagged and Myri as they escaped Dallas' clutches. The severe blonde woman didn't seem to pay Sial any attention at all. She and her brother were watching each other wordlessly, their expressions carefully guarded. When Sial sat down, Jagged said, Welcome, all of you. I'm glad you could be aboard on such short notice. Everyone nodded. Sial was worried having all the senior captains in one place, but apparently Fell thought the risk of another ambush was less than the risk of intership communicadians being intercepted. Jagged Fell kept his idea forward on all of them and none of them, as he summarized the situation. He reported that the task force's three Jedi had gone to the surface of Zonima II and made contact. The planet was allowing unarmed ships only to land. Fell gave a brief account of what had happened, and the equipment and supervision Zonima Second needed to repair its important infrastructure. Recovery teams would be prioritized during the first round of landings. When he opened to questions, Pavrick raised a wing. She said, I assume most of the recovery crews will come from Starless. Should I keep my starfighters flying patrol? Please, Jagged nodded. I'd also like to keep a recon flight in the air. Right now, Captain Anfam has Mondromeda's gravity wells online, effectively doubling the planet's mass shadow. If they try and sneak up on us, we should know they're coming and have time to prepare a defensive screen. Winesa raised a hand. After a tiny delay, Fell granted his sister a nod. The woman asked, which they are we speaking of, Commander? The renegade U.S. in Vong fleet or Dallas? Creffy cleared his throat. Urefja's main priority is to exterminate the U.S. Hinvong. He is a clear-minded tactical thinker. He knows that, while the fleet is dangerous, Zonima II is his ultimate target. Do you think he would attack the planet before clearing the fleet? Vort asked. A slim silver vocoder around his fat neck translated his muted Gamorrean squeals into mechanical basic. Bryn Admiral Urefja would want to know his back is secure. But if he thought he could score a quick hit and run attack on the planet, I believe he would take it. And what about Admiral Dalla? Winesa asked. What would she do? Captain Vernadus spoke up. Admiral Dalla specializes in doing the unexpected. We should remain vigilant. That's why we're on the lookout for an attack, Jagged Fell reminded them all. The question is whether we are ready for a real fight. Captain Antilles, how are repairs on Starless coming along? They're proceeding apace. Sial had talked to the repair crews on her comlink as she hurried to the meeting. We suffered decompressions and fires on several decks and lost a total of 18 crew. However, Starless was designed with backups in case of damage. Shields and weapons are at 90% normal capacity if it comes to a fight. Good. Fell glanced at his sister. In what condition is Celestial? 100%, Weinsa said. Sayal couldn't tell if she was bragging. Our preparedness may not matter, Pavrick said bluntly. We're not sitting over an ordinary planet. If we're attacked, either by the Vong or the Renegades, what will Second do? It was the billion credit question. All eyes went to Jagged Fell. The man shirked their gaze and said, Jaina is trying to ascertain that now. According to her, the planet did not fight when it was attacked five years ago. We're not sure if the situation has changed. You mentioned they were with the Magister, Creefy said. The Magister is an organizational figure. 
What about the planet itself? I've heard they can speak with it directly. So I've been told. Jagged nodded. According to Jaina, they talked briefly with the planet. Hopefully, they will do so again soon. From his tone, it was clear he didn't have the answers to their questions. Pavrick pressed, according to reports, the planet has been a potent offensive weapon in the past. It might be reluctant to attack U.S. involved ships, since those are his children, after a fashion. But what about non involved ships? If Dala and Irefja attack, will it defend? And if it doesn't care about killing them, will it care if we get in the way? I don't know, Fell said, betraying his frustration. As I said, Jaina is on the ground now. Hopefully she can establish better communications and discern the planet's intent. Creffy said, we had to trust to that planet during the battle to retake Coruscant. I admit I was skeptical, but it came through for us in the end. Do you trust it now? Wainsa asked. It was clear from her tone that she did not. Creffy thought for a moment, then nodded. I do. And frankly, our forces are depleted. If we are attacked, we may have to depend on Sekut's help. Vernet at side. There are too many unknowns for my liking. And mine? Wainsa looked at her brother. Their eyes locked and Sal thought some tension sparked between them. It was, surprisingly, Wainsa who looked away, as though she was ashamed. Jagged turned his attention to the other captains. I want to begin landing ships within the hour. Captain Vernadette, you're free to send one team of Imperial scientists down to the planet. The old captain nodded thanks. And what are the chis? Wainsa asked cautiously. Are we allowed to land? Jagged regarded his sister carefully. Sayal felt a pity for them both. The gulf between her and Mary had been wide for most of their lives. The gulf between the fell siblings thanks to Jag's full decade of exile from Chiss society was unimaginably bigger. I believe you have a patient in your infirmary who wishes to come down to the planet, he said. You may send two medical officers to accompany him. They'll be screened upon arrival. Weinson nodded wordlessly. All right, Fell said, Captains, you may return to your ships. I'd like the personnel from Starless to stay on for further briefing. It took less than a minute for Weinsa, Vernadette, and Pavrick to file out, leaving Sial, Vort, and Creffy to discuss issues with Jagged. They spent another ten minutes discussing deployment to the planet, specifically, which personnel and equipment to send down. With that done, Fell dismissed them. He looks awful, Vort said as they walked down the hall. The poor man's been through hell in the space of a day, Creffy said. I hope he gets some rest, though I doubt he will. We could all use it, Sayal said, feeling suddenly tired. She tried to remember the last time she'd had real sleep. It must have been two days ago, which was bad enough, but those two days had been full of deadly ambushes and desperate battles. Two days felt like forever. Weariness overtook her suddenly. Her vision swam as she stumbled forward. Vort reached out and grabbed her shoulder with a meaty hand, pulling her upright. Are you okay? he grunted. She could see the concern in his little bovine eyes. I just need some sleep. Sayal brushed bronze hair out of her face. Badly? If you wish, Captain, I could oversee the deployment of the first shuttle. Sayal shook her head. She was Captain, he was just an advisor. It was her responsibility. Sayal, Vort said, you need rest. We'll take care of it, Captain, Creffy said and she was surprised to see fatherly concern in the Bothan's violet eyes. Okay, Sayal exhaled. I'll hit the rack. Five hours. But if anything happens, we'll rouse you from well-earned slumber, Vort said. Now go get your beauty sleep, Captain. It was, truth be told, easy to take their advice. It might not have been the mark of a proper captain, but her whole body was screaming for rest. So she shuffled down the hall, up the turbo lift, down another hall, until she finally reached her quarters. She walked in to see two women sprawled over her bed, giggling. One had short hair streaked with silvers and pinks. The other was taller, with sandy blonde locks pulled up in a messy ponytail. They had a bottle open and the air reeked of turban brandy. Sis, Mary shot upright. Back so soon? Yes, 
Sayal sighed. And I'm very tired. The other woman froze like an EP in headlights. Then she flung her long legs off the bed, staggered, regained balance, and snapped a sloppy salute. Captain. Jasmine Tainer said. Um, you have very nice quarters, Captain. Mary snickered and drank some more brandy. My quarters are boring, Sayal admitted. She started to unzip her uniform. So, um, any news? Myrie asked, cross-legged on her sister's bed, brandy bottle between her hands. We are sending teams down to Zanum a second, Sayal said, including half of Wraith Squadron. Both young women looked suddenly sober. Sayal took off her uniform jacket, draped it over her desk chair, and sat down. I talked it over with Piggy. Myrie, you're staying on Starless. Her sister gave a small, satisfied nod. Jasmine, still on her feet, asked, What about me? You'll be going down to the planet, along with Gorset, Lat, Huhana, and Becerra. We thought you'd be the ones best suited to handle you as Hinval and second in biotech. Okay, Jasmine said, and that was it. It was Mary who said, That should be really interesting. Huh? Jazzy? That's a word for it. Jasmine nodded. Sayal noticed the lightsaber dangling from her belt for the first time. That's right, she was Force-sensitive. Daughter of an ex-wraith and Jedi, and sister of Jedi too, but an academy dropout herself. Sayal herself had no desire to visit this mysterious, living, Force-strong world. The thought of being surrounded by an invisible sentient being that could pry into your thoughts was beyond unsettling. Jasmine looked like she didn't know what to feel. So when do they roll out? Mary asked on her behalf. First shuttle leaves in one hour, but it's not the wraiths, Sayal said. She felt like she was beginning to melt into the chair. You've got four. Oh, Stang, Mary bounced off the bed and onto her feet next to Jasmine. Somehow she didn't spill anything, they must have downed most of the bottle already. Come on, we've got to get you ready. Yeah, Jasmine blinked like she was in a daze. Then she snapped another salute and said, Thank you, Captain, sir. Sayal stood up and waved them both to the door. Mary lunged forward and wrapped her sister in a one-armed hug as she held the brandy bottle in the other. Despite being the younger one, Mary was a few centimeters taller, and Sayal's chin bumped awkwardly against her sister's shoulder. Mary pulled back and snapped a mostly formal salute next to Jasmine. Then they scampered out and the door hissed shut behind them. Sayal stared at her bed, plush and tempting, and tried to find the strength to walk on over to the refresher for a shower. Then she decided that was too hard, shuffled over to the bed, and let herself fall into soft oblivion. Weinsa fell felt great relief as her shuttle slid into the safe berth of Celestial's hangar. She had felt tense the entire time she'd been aboard Starless and she was glad to be back where she belonged. There was something strange in that, she admitted to herself as she and her escorts made their way from the hangar to the bridge. On the Alliance flagship, so many of the crewmen had been humans like herself. She was, however, far more comfortable when surrounded by blue-skinned, red-eyed, stony-faced Chiss. It was easy to see why she'd been raised by Chiss, not humans. Still, Rare encounters like this reminded her of how strange her upbringing had been, and it threatened to drive her to distraction. Jagged in particular was a difficult problem. After his ten years of exile, she'd more or less given up on ever seeing him again. She forced herself to stop wondering what he looked like now, how he acted. The Jagged she'd been reunited with on this mission was at once so like the older brother she'd emulated growing up, and not like him at all. It was a difficult paradox, and Wyansa didn't like to dwell on those. Thankfully, everything aboard the Chiss destroyer was organized and disciplined, orderly as it should be. When she arrived on the bridge, she was immediately met by her first officer, who told her that Fleet Command had attempted to hail her just half an hour ago. Wyansa had sent a message to Chilla informing them that they'd arrived at Zanima second, but had had no direct conversation with her superiors since then. She was glad to change that. Wynsa quickly gave instructions to ship the wounded Mandalorian down to the planet, 
and to send two medics with the order to glean as much information as they could and relay it back to Celestial. It wouldn't take long to tell whether Jag's Jedi wife was telling them the truth about everything that was happening down on Zanima Second. Once that was accomplished, she excused herself to her personal chambers after the bridge and put in an encrypted return call to Chilla. As she waited for a reply, she wondered if her father had called her directly. The possible resurgence of the U.S. Hinvong threat had brought Sunter Fell out of retirement and back into the Ascendancy's complex military and political power structure. Perhaps inspired by his son's example, he started calling for more open engagement between the Chiss and the rest of the galaxy. Wisa had been surprised at first and remained a little skeptical of her father's policies. She'd gained plenty of first-hand experience in the complicated mess of intergovernmental coalitions. To her slight disappointment, the face that sprung up on her holo projector was not her father's. She looked at a chiss woman with blankly glowing eyes and long black hair framing either side of a thin face. Wisa snapped a salute. Commodore fell reporting, Admiral. At ease, Krishankar Yuruado nodded. Her father had helped make sure that the Admiral, informally called by her core name Shankir, was overseeing this operation from fleet headquarters. She had gained plenty of first-hand experience fighting the U.S. Hinvong on the last war, when she'd flown her brother's wing on missions at Hapes and Borlius. Like Jagged and Wainsa, she had been raised and trained as part of Syndic Mithranyuruado's household phalanx, and like them had joined the Chiss expansionary defense fleet after Thrawn's empire of the hand largely merged with the mainline government. The fact that the combined houses had agreed to give Wainsa and Shankar command of such a critical mission showed how much influence the former empire of the hand and the Fell family had recently gained in Chiss politics. Well, Shankar began, I understand you have discovered Zanima Second. Congratulations. Thank you, Air Admiral, though I admit it was Alliance operatives who traced the planet's location. Then we should be thankful for our allies. I understand you saved your brother, as well. That is correct. And you've sent us a ship full of Mandalorians in desperate need of our bioengineering expertise. I apologize for the imposition, Admiral. Commander Fell made the promise to them, in exchange for his rescue from the enemy. There was no time to consult with you. I had to make the call to honor his decision on the spot. Shocker tilted her head slightly. There's no need to get defensive, Commodore. I'm glad they saved your brother. I remember him fondly. He is somewhat damaged from his captivity, but he should be all right. Admiral, have the Mandalorians arrived yet? Just before I called you, she nodded. We have Fett and his people, secure. Do you think you can develop a counter to the Nanavarath? That's for our scientists to determine. You and I have different priorities. Of course, Admiral. What is your determination of the situation on the planet? Shankar's voice grew serious. Wainsa thought a moment before replying. Before departing on Celestial to join the rest of Trinity Fleet, Shankar had given her the samples of Alpha Red and instructed her on the parameters for using the weapon. If they found Zanima Second had been overrun by U.S. Hinvong fanatics bent on more conquest, she was to use it. If the planet's living consciousness had become a threat to Chiss' interests, she was to use it. If they encountered an enemy fleet that was too powerful for them to overtake with convention arms, she was to use it. Ultimately, though, whether they crossed into any of those situations had been left to Wainsa to determine. The hostile fleet is a renegade, she began. The U.S. Hinvong still on Zanima Second are peaceful. The world itself seems to present no threat. Shanky raised a black eyebrow. Is this your first-hand estimation, or the Jedi's? I've sent one of our teams to the planet's surface. They corroborate everything the Jedi have said. It was hard to tell over the holo, but the Admiral looked a little relieved. What about the hostile fleet? We've only skirmished with them briefly. Alliance and Imperial Renegades have been causing more trouble. Yes, I've read your reports. Thoroughly. After a pause, Weinsa said, Admiral, we've lost several key capital ships already. Do you have a request, Commodore? Weinsa knew better than to expect reinforcements from the houses, especially when they'd only been willing to send one destroyer on this mission, but she had to ask. 
It could mean the difference between life and death for her, her crew, and her brother. You have our location, she said. It seems Zanamaseka's hyperdrive core is currently down, so we won't be moving soon. If the CEDF is willing to send any assistance, it would be appreciated. Shankir made a thoughtful, humming sound. Sending more ships into a combat situation outside our territory could be considered an act of preemptive hostilities. Preemptive strikes were considered dishonorable for most Chiss. Lainsa knew that. She also knew that, as a member of Mithronya Ruado's clan, the Admiral was especially conscious about not taking an offensive posture, so as not to fall into disfavor and exile like the Grand Admiral had. Sir, Lainsa said, in rescuing my brother, Celestial had a direct engagement with the U.S. Hinvong frigate. Damage was dealt on both sides. We're still conducting repairs and tending to causalities. Shankir did not look moved. I don't think that will be sufficient. Most of the CEDF leadership is proud of sitting out the last U.S. Hinvong war. If we stop the U.S. Hinvong here, at Zanima second, there won't be another one. We can make sure of that. I'm not unsympathetic to your point, Commodore. Believe me. I even, Shankir paused, considered her words. I would feel personally responsible if anything happened to you. Or Jagged. It took Weinsel a moment to realize her jaw had dropped open. She snapped it shut and asked, Will you at least relay this request to my father? I most definitely will. I suspect he'll be in his favor. Thank you, Mayor Admiral. Shankar tilted her chin upward. Is there anything else? At the moment, I don't think there is. Very well. We shall contact you again, Commodore. Yes, sir, Weinsa said, and snapped a salute. The holo winked to nothing, leaving her alone in her cabin. She stared at the dim projector, unmoving. The Admiral's admission of affection for her and Jagged had stunned her. Shankir had been a trusted ally of the Fell family, even when her brother's actions had cast them into dishonor, but like all Chiss, honest emotion was something she showed rarely. Weinsa certainly hadn't expected to receive it now. When she'd taken Celestial into the Red Nebula, she told herself and her crew that they'd been acting not out of sentiment, but to preserve Trinity Fleet. At the time, she'd almost believed it, but now, in the following calm, she had to admit that her motivations were personal. It was unbecoming an officer to risk her ship to save one man, even if that man was her brother, but she'd done it anyway. She should have felt ashamed of that, confessed it to Shankir, maybe asked to be relieved of duty because she'd lost her objectivity. She should have felt ashamed, but she didn't. It was a strange place to be in. It caused her mind and heart to tug in different directions, and she hated it. Wysa turned and stalked out of her cabin, determined to find another way to occupy her thoughts, something logical and straightforward. She was sure she'd find something. Chapter 3 There had always been an inside, and an outside. Katika to his family, the ones within it. Venku to those without. It had been easy to know who his friends were and who were Eridus, not enemies per se, but outsiders, and therefore potential enemies, never to be trusted. He had spent most of his life trying to force the tighter bond between those inside. Those outside could fend for themselves, be they imps, Vong, Jedi, or Boba Fett. But even on the inside, things hadn't been right. He would never forget the look on Cal Skorata's face any time the old Mando drill sergeant looked in his direction. Short, craggy, perpetually encased in battered gold chestplate and shoulder pads that made him look like a charging Ronto, Skorata had been a father and grandfather to sprawling family of Mandalorian warriors. Muriel and Jane still reserved the word Boer solely for him. They all loved him, and he'd love them back. But when he looked at the child Katika, you could see the pain inside, the pain that truly kept him from loving the child born of Jedi Knight and Clone Trooper. Kalbabur had used the pain as a barrier, and young Venku had tried so hard to break through that shield and know and love the man like the rest of his clan did. He didn't have that problem with the rest of them, and he couldn't understand what had turned Kalbabur against him. It had caused him great pain as a child. Then, one day when he was still a child to the rest of the galaxy, but a young warrior to his Mandas, 
the ex GD calling himself Gadab had taken Benku for a long walk through the woods outside Kuramorit. He'd explained everything. Venku had known that his parents were dead. He knew that his father was a clone. He could see his resemblance to Fai, Ordo, Jang, and the rest in the mirror. When he'd asked about his mother, the others had gone strangely evasive. Finally, Gadab took him out to tell him. When he learned that Atain had been a Jedi, young Venku's first thought had been, that makes sense. He'd already sensed there was something different about himself. He could sometimes sense the thoughts and feelings of the other boys and girls, and sometimes expected things before they happened. Gadab explained that his mother had been a Jedi, killed saving clones during Order 66. Then he explained that his father had been killed by a fellow clone, Niner, because he had exposed a secret operation to save fugitive Jedi and gotten brother clones killed. Venku's first response had been anger. Why did his father have to die to save a few Jedi? Why did he have to have Jedi powers? He spent his whole young life listening to other Mandas, Gadab included, bad talk the Jedi as arrogant, self-righteous, manipulative religious nut jobs. He said as much to Gadab. He remembered the ex-Jedi saying as much. With far more gravity than a normal ten-year-old, gravity he carried with him for the rest of his life, he'd asked, why did you kill my father to save a bunch of Jedi? Got up, still with a smooth face and rich blonde hair then, had shaken his head and said, Darman didn't just turn against the Jedi. He turned against us. He was Darmanda. Darmanda, no longer Mando, detached forever from the culture that had birthed him. Venku still didn't know what bitter prophecy had forced Cal Skarata to give that name to his father of all the clones he'd trained. Maybe, deep down, Cal Babur had possessed a touch of the Force too. How he would have hated that. Smiling sadly, Gadab had reached into his kit and taken out two shiny metal cylinders. Venku knew what they were. Gadab himself wore one around his belt, and a few other Mandas went around with lightsabers as trophies. These were Atangs, he'd said, and now they're yours. Then he placed the weapons in the boy's small hands. They were cold and heavy, but he felt like he'd always know them. He remembered the feel of cold metal against his palms. He remembered the way light fell through the trees and the way the leaves had rustled, a long time ago. Fifty long years gone. Venku opened his eyes and was surrounded by life. He was lying on the ground. Light fell through branches above him. They had shimmering rainbow leaves like nothing he had ever seen. He was out of his armor. A cold wind blew over his face and through his clothes. There were people around him. He made out Gadab first. Not the Gadab he'd just dreamed of, but the Gadab of more than a half century later, face wrinkled and sagging, hair brittle and gray, eyes so very old. Next to him, another ancient, one with a messy beard and long braided hair to camouflage a weathered version of the face that had once been behind five million white helmets on a thousand different worlds. Muriel Skirata. On his other side, the faces of youth. One was like a vision of the past, slightly bleached. Gentry Skurata had the face of his grandfather Ordo, but his eyes and skin were lighter. To his side, his sister Bess, her long dark hair tied in a ponytail while she leaned forward, blue eyes blazing with curiosity against her round, smooth featured face. It's all right. Gotta placed a hand on his shoulder. His motion was gentle, but the hand seemed to weigh 20 kilos. Where? Where are we? Venku croaked. His mouth was dry. It felt like his lips were split open. This is Zanima Second, Gadab said. The Vongi's world. Alarm spiked in his adult brain. The same? Gadab nodded. He was channeling calm through the force. What's the last thing you remember, Katika? Mariel asked. He tried to search his memory. He thought of white quarters. Stormtroopers in armor like his father's, but different. A small woman with long dark hair, hunched on the bunk of her private cell, shouting at him in twisted agony. Solo, Venku muttered. Jedi Solo. On, Chimera? You took a hit on the head busting her out, Mariel said. The machines couldn't wake you up. Neither could Bartica. Solo suggested I take you here, said Gata. 
She thought the force would be stronger here, that I could heal you. Venku tried to sit up, but his head swam with the slightest motion. His legs were weak and his arms weaker. He hadn't felt this broken, this helpless in his life, and for a mando nothing was worse than feeling helpless. Just rest, Gadab said. I can try and help you further. Where are the others? We lost a few busting solo and fell out of captivity, Mariel said. We lost Jaller, Kip, Londo, Far. Venku tried to count the loss. He's known all of their parents growing up. They were all inside people. And the rest. Went off with Fett to see the Chiss about an antidote, Mariel said. Time will Shabla tell if it works, but we could be going home. Home. The thought gave Venku a surge of joy. It had been four long and awful years since their emergency evacuation of Mandalore, after the Imperial Moths dumped a nano-killer into the planet's atmosphere targeting Jango Fett's genes. Since then, Clan Skarata had wandered the stars and Boba Fett, slowly growing into his role as Mandalor at last, had commanded his troops in absentia, relying on Gorn Bivine to act as his planet-side proxy. The Moth Strike had been a bitter blow not just to the Skaratas, but to the resurgent Mandalorian people. Venku had yearned for return, lusted for it, not just for his Mandoe but for himself as well. Now it might be in their grasp. But it might not too. The Chiss might fail. Zanima Second might get destroyed by crazed fanatics in an hour. Venku had no way of knowing, no way of doing anything. He couldn't even get up. Just rest for now. Babur, Bess said softly. Bardica will help you heal. Close your eyes. Calm yourself, the old ex-Jedi said. Stretch out and touch this world. Feel the life around you. Draw strength from it. It's just, just a force. Gadav shook his head. No, I think it's much more than that. Venku closed his eyes and tried to forget his million new worries. He regulated his breathing and tried to feel his own body in the force, organs, and blood vessels and bones the way Gadab had taught him. For Gadab, and thus for Venku, the force was not just a way to perform cheap tricks like opening a jar of calf with no hands. It wasn't just a way to screw with other beings' minds either. The force was an engineering tool you could use to examine and perfect the systems within you and without. Right now he was having trouble making sense of the mess inside him, so he turned his attention to his surroundings. Viku had always valued strict delineations, Mando versus Rudy eyes, us versus them. He was never comfortable reaching toward a unifying force. Frankly, he'd never gotten much out of it when he tried. But because there was nothing else he could do, he tried now. He was surprised by what he found. He could sense so much life. Trees, moss, grass, weeds, insects, tiny mammals scampering through the brush, and bird flitting through the trees. He sensed the rawness of the nature, the kind he felt in the forest outside Kiramord. He sensed something more too. This was raw and natural but it was not chaotic. It felt like the entire natural order of Zanima II, harsh and cruel as it often was, contained come deep inner equilibrium, some source of stability and purpose he could hardly fathom. Lost in himself and the mystery of Zanima Second, Venku slipped outside time. He had no idea how much passed, an hour or a day. When he opened his eyes the sun was slanting at a sharper angle through the trees. Gendry and Bess were gone. So were Mariel and Gadab. Sitting to one side, watching him with guarded curiosity, was a small woman in a green and brown camel jumpsuit, her dark hair tied at the back of her neck. A lightsaber dangled from her utility belt. Nice outfit, he grunted. Looks better than those fancy GDI robes. More practical. Hi yourself, Jaina Solo said. I heard you woke up. Venku tried to sit up this time. He tried to shuffle his legs and didn't have the strength for it, but he managed to prop himself up on his elbows, giving him a better view of Jaina and the forest in which he lay. You're welcome, by the way, she said. Are you feeling okay? Very weak, Venku said. I was, hit in the head. You were in a coma. I thought Gata might be able to heal you here. Looks like I was right. Thank you, he rasped. 
I just, I'm surprised by this place. Are you? Jaina said curiously. What did you expect from Zanima Second? Nothing. I'd heard the stories, but I never believed them. It feels different in the forest, doesn't it? Different from a normal forest. Unified, somehow. I've heard this world has thoughts of its own. Yeah, you could say that. Have you contacted this planetary mine? Just a little, Jaina said guardedly. It's permitted some shuttles to come down, including the medical one that brought you here. This planet's been alone and damaged for a long time, and we are trying to repair it. But, Dala and the Vong fleet. Still out there? Then we may have to fight. Second has complicated ideas about fighting, but I know I wouldn't mind having Formandos by my side. Venku had to smile at that, a very tired smile. I never thought I'd hear a Jedi say that. I'm not a typical Jedi, Jaina said. She leaned forward a little. And right now, we need all the help we can get. I can try to provide it. I owe you a debt. You saved my life. I saved yours. Let's call it even. Okay. We will. Jaina nodded. She seemed satisfied with that, but also distracted. Venku asked, what is it? The Jedi shook her head. I don't know. I was here a long time ago. Fifteen years. It feels like forever and no time at all. So much has changed for me and the galaxy, and second, and yet. Did you talk to Bardica about this place? I did, she nodded. He can feel something special here in the force. He admits it. The others three, they just think it's a barren wilderness, but God of knows different. And so do you. I feel uncomfortable here. So does Gadab. He spent a long life trying to push the Force away and forget what it was like to be a Jedi. Now the Force is here, and it's too strong to deny, and he doesn't know what to do. Yes, thought Venku. That sounded exactly right. He wanted to forget about this living world, this life-rich forest. He wanted to put on his armor and go back to being a Mando again. The kind of Mando he'd been all his life, a brave warrior who fought for and with the people he loved. He wasn't sure if Zanima II was going to let him be a Mando any longer. He felt like it was pulling him toward something else. Jaina sensed his discomfort. She said, God have stepped out to get food. He'll be back soon to help you heal. You can heal yourself too, if you drop into a trance. I never learned. I've touched the force here. I don't know how to use it to heal. That's fine. A smile formed on her face. Lay down, and I'll help you the best I can. Laying down was not something Amando did. Amando was always on his feet, always alert, always ready to fight. Right now it seemed like he didn't have any other options, so he lowered himself to the ground so he lay face up, crossed his hands on his abdomen, and closed his eyes. All right. He muttered words he never had before, teach me how to heal. The newcomers from the fleet didn't have to sit down in the middle of an empty field, chat with the living world, and ride on top of giant lizard things to get to civilization. Instead, they got to land at the prepared spaceport at the largest settlement in the middle distance. Ben was still reluctant to call it a city. Maybe it was the course of Candy and him. It was a village, maybe, or a town at best. It sat along a winding river, and its low dome-like organic buildings clung like natural growths to the undulating hills. On a clear day like this, the sun gleamed off their smooth surface, giving the town a luminous, slightly surreal feeling. The people of the town, or at least the ones who crowded around the hilltop landing field to get a good look at the arriving shuttles, were mostly blue-skinned pharaohs. Danny Kui had explained that the U.S. and Vong had mostly been settled in smaller camps littered across the planet. Many had been sent to the lower hemisphere to help rebuild the ecosystem of the damaged continents. The Shaper cast had proven quite helpful in this, she said, while the soldiers, laborers, and extolled, formerly known as Shane ones, had proven adept at farming, as long as they put aside their differences. Which, apparently, was not an easy thing. Ben and Tahiri stood on the far side of the landing field, watching another shuttle unload. Several had already sat down, 
including the one from the Chiss cruiser. This current one looked to be from Vindicator, the Imperial flagship. Its staff, dressed in typically drab Imperial olive gray uniforms, stepped out onto the planet's surface with mild hesitation. They craned their necks at the sky and scanned the shortcut grass of the landing field, like they were expecting something weird to pop up and surprise them. Ben didn't begrudge them. He felt pretty weird himself. I'm surprised Second allowed this many to land, Tahiri said. Like Ben, she had her arms crossed over his chest and was leaning against a waist high wood cut fence. They're not armed, Ben pointed out. Not the ships, but some of the people are. Those Mandas, for instance. Yeah, Ben grunted. There were only five of them. Two of them were old men and one was getting out of a coma. Still, he didn't like having them around. How do you know Second allowed them? Ben asked. I mean, Danny and Jaina just sort of agreed to take them in. The planet didn't say anything. You only land on this planet if Second lets you, Tahiri said with finality. We've only talked to Second once. Danny hasn't in months, Ben pointed out. Maybe something's wrong with it. There was a small crack in Tahiri's sure expression. The planet feels like it always has. Exactly like it has. I'm sure Sackett has a good reason for his silence. Ben wasn't sure if Tahiri believed that or not. He certainly didn't, but he saw no point in arguing about things they couldn't control. How's it looking? A voice asked from behind them. They turned in unison to see Jaina walking toward them across the short grass. The Imperials are unloading their people, Tahiri said. Did you check on the Mando? He's getting better, Jaina glanced at Ben. Are you hanging in there? Ben wasn't sure what she meant by that. Was he getting used to Zanima second? Was he over the fact that both she and his father had hidden the fact of Vestera's return, apparently because they wanted to coddle him like a child, even after all he'd been through? The answer to both questions was a resounding no, but he didn't want to get into that right now, so he simply muttered, I'm fine. Jaina nodded, like that was enough, and looked back at Tahiri. Are you waiting for something? One more arrival, the blonde woman said. Jaina frowned. The Chiss already came down, and the engineers from Starless. And the people from Wraith Squad Ron aren't due for a few hours. Not from the fleet, Tahiri said. Old friends. Tahiri tilted her head, considering. You could say that. Speaking of old friends, where's Danny? Meeting with some of the engineers. They're heading out to the hyperdrive soon. I was planning to go with them. Well, you are the mechanic. Yeah, but I've never tried to fix engines big enough to move an entire planet. Jaina put her hands on her hips. If anybody else wants to come, they're welcome. We're taking an airship, which should be interesting. We leave in four hours. Have fun, Ben said. Jaina hid the frown in her eyes and nodded. Sure. I should only be gone for a local day, or so. There's a come there you can reach me on if you need to. Is Danny staying here? Tahiri asked. Jaina nodded. Good. There's some things I want to talk to her about. Those things could have covered any myriad of topics, but somehow Ben knew what she meant. Someone had to tell Danny what had happened to Jason and Mara. She deserved to know, but it was no easy tale to tell. Thank you, Jaina said. She understood too. Jaina waved goodbye and walked across the landing field toward the edge of the settlement. Tahiri and Ben leaned on the fence in silence for a while even after she had gone. Wind blew, rustling his hair and filling his nose with the smell of damp grass. Finally, Tahiri asked, are you going to tell me what that was all about? I don't know what you mean. Ben, come on. Tahiri rolled her eyes. It's me. She had a point. They'd been running missions for over a year now, and had come to form an effective team. What's more, Ben had arrested Tahiri's fall to the dark side under Darth Kedis. Their trust was implicit, or had been. Ben sighed. During the battle, when we rescued Jaina, we were attacked by some U.S. Henvong ships. With Sith aboard. I know that, Tahiri said. Not just any Sith. Vestera was on board. I felt her. Oh. Yeah, 
Ben nodded. Oh, I'm sorry. I just, well, don't know what to say. Jaina knew. She fought Vester on Yavin 4. She told Dad and they agreed not to tell me. Because they didn't think I could handle it. He scowled and kicked the ground, leaving brown scuff marks in the turf. Tahiri blew out a breath. Well, now what? Ben blinked. Now what what? Now what? She repeated. You're mad because Jaina and your dad coddled you. You hate that, because you've been coddled in the past and you hated it then too. But what's done is done. Now what? What happens when Vestra comes back? Ben stared at the dirty cuts he'd made in the grass. Being mad at Jaina and dad meant he didn't have to think about that question. Maybe that was why he was still mad. I don't know, he admitted. Vester is a Sith. She's been one since she was a kid. Nothing good's going to come out of her. I thought it could. I trusted her. I? You loved her, Tahiri said simply. No, I didn't. Ben shook his head. I got suckered. I got stuck working with a pretty girl, and I let my hormones get me in over my head. Ben, she said firmly. I was younger than that when Anakin died. It wasn't just hormones for me. I don't think it was for you either. What difference does it make? Ben snapped. I got soft. I let her into my head. I told her Jedi secrets. It's my mess, and I have to clean it up. Do you mean kill her? That was it, the issue that had been dancing around in his mind since Vesta touched him in the Force. Longer, really. Probably since he realized she betrayed him. It could be necessary. I thought I could redeem her once, and I was wrong. Tahiri asked, was it necessary for Jaina to kill Jason? That wasn't Jason, Ben snapped. That was Kedis, a crazy Sith Lord who had to be taken down. You can't call him whatever you want. He was still her twin brother. Okay, whatever. But yes, Jaina had to do it. And your mother, did she have to try and kill Jason? Ben flinched. He looked at her with anger in his eyes. She met it with cool green dispassion. Killing what you love is never easy, Tahiri said softly. Your mom lost her life. Jaina lost, something neither of us can ever understand. Even your dad killed Lumaya, and he lost something of himself too. Once you do it, you can never get that something back. So what should I do? Try to redeem her again? I don't have an answer, Tahiri admitted. Yeah, Ben grunted and kicked the ground again. Me neither. Silence lingered between them again. Tahiri scanned the sky, still expectant. There was nothing but pale, crystal clear blue. It was so much more peaceful than the skies of Coruscant, but didn't help Ben feel calm inside. Eventually, Tahiri asked, What about that girl from Toast Station? Huh? You know, the one who stole your lightsaber. Want to redeem her? She's probably still out there, too. Jaina said she saw her in Chimera. No. No, 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 Ben shook his head. I've had enough of girls with daddy issues who hate Jedi. I'm not getting involved. Yeah, Tahiri nodded. Probably a good idea. Still, he admitted I would like my lightsaber back. She glanced at the silver cylinder hanging from his belt. Who does that belong to again? It was Mom's, he said softly. I haven't even turned it on yet. A part of him didn't want to either. It scared him. Before Tahiri could say anything, they heard the sound of an approaching aircraft. Both looked up in time to see a sleek vessel pass overhead. It was about the size of the other shuttles, but possessed two swept back wings protruding from a narrow hull. Its green hull was all gentle curves without a right angle to be seen. It was one of those second ships, clearly, though it looked different from the starships Ben had seen. It might have been an atmosphere only craft. Whatever it was, it had slowed down, extended four landing struts that looked like insect legs, and was setting down in an open space in the field. Tahiri hopped off the fence and bounded toward it. Ben, surprised by her eagerness, gave a mental shrug and followed, though at a slower pace. She reached the ship ahead of him and was standing at attention when the hatch on his bell and people began to descend the exit ramp. As he got closer, Ben saw several pharaohs, followed by a pair of Uzhen Vong, 
young, without any scars. They wore long robes and had turban-like headdresses piled on top of their hairless skulls. Following them was another Vong with the same type of outfit. He was thin, almost skeletal, and moved slowly, keeping one hand on the stairway's railing at all times. He must have been very old. When the old one reached the ground, Tahiri bounded forward. The two younger Vong looked a little alarmed, but the old one spread his arms wide as the small blonde woman collided with his chest. Ben was afraid she was going to knock him back, but he held his ground and wrapped his arms around her shoulders in fond embrace. The two young Yuas and Vong looked very confused. Ben knew the feeling. By the time Tahiri and this old Vong stepped apart, Ben was right at their side. He cleared his throat and said, Well, it's, um, nice to meet a friend of Tahiri. The old Vong looked at him for the first time. His dark eyes, set deep in his skull, were impossible to read. The teeth in his lipless mouth were needle-like and fearsome. Ben tried to think of another time he'd been this close to a U.S. Vong, failed, and felt very nervous. Tahiri brushed some hair out of her face and said, Ben, this is Horror, the high priest of the U.S. Vong. Horror, meet Ben Skywalker. The name was dimly familiar, and Ben's own was apparently familiar to Horror. The old priest nodded and extended a bony hand. Welcome back to Zanama Second, son of Skywalker. Ben reached out, took it. Hara had a tough grasp and he was glad to take his hand away. Let me guess, you last saw me when I was a baby. That is right, Hara nodded. How did you know? It's been a pattern lately. But, um, thank you. Is your father well? He's doing great, all things considered. Before getting a question about his mother, Ben gestured to the two younger U.S. and Vong. So, are these your, ah, fellow priests? These are my acolytes, Taylor and Version. Har said. Ben exchanged awkward nods with both of them. The old priest turned his attention back to Ben and to Hiri. So tell me, I have heard you have spoken to Second. Only briefly, Tahiri said. We haven't seen it since. At least, I don't think we have. Second is still mysterious, Harar nodded. Recent events have been very, trying for it. They've been hard for us all, Ben said. Of course, of course, Harar nodded. Come, let us find some place to sit down. As they stared for the hangars at the far side of the landing field, Tahiri offered Harar an arm. The old priest shook his head and held out his hand, the same one he'd just offered Ben. In a flash, Something whip like extended from his wrist and snapped into a straight line. Hara planted it on the floor like a cane and started hobbling toward the hangar. It took certain effort for Ben not to shudder. Tahiri just watched him with a bemused expression that said, Welcome to Zanima Second. She, at least, seemed to be enjoying herself. Tahiri walked on Hara's left, Ben on his right. The two acolytes trailed behind them, just out of hearing range. As they walked, Hara said, I have heard that Jaina Solo is also with you. She's about to set out for the hyperdrives, Tahiri said. We've got a team that should be able to fix them. Perhaps. In the end, they will only work if Second wills it, Hara said. He didn't seem particularly worried, and Ben wasn't sure if that was suspicious or if Vong High Priests just faced problems with a Jedi like Kam. When they weren't sacrificing thousands of beings to their bloody gods, of course. He wondered how many this bony old priest had sacrificed. He wondered how much blood was on the hand he'd just shaken. He wondered if redemption came easier to those not gifted or burdened with the Force. Now tell me, Rena Quad, Harar said, how did you find Zanima Second after we went missing for so long? Oh, it's not a big deal, Tahiri said cheerily. We already did it once after all. As their shuttle breached the cloud layer and banked low over the planet's surface, Jasmine Tainer leaned and so close her forehead trapped against the cool, transparent steel as she watched it all swell up below. The crooked rivers, the broad plains, the low rolling mountains covered an endless carpet of multicolored bora trees. Don't forget to breath, Drakal whispered in her ear. Jasmine jerked away from the window so fast she nearly knocked her head against one of his horns. I was breathing, she insisted. I'm totally breathing. I'm fine. 
Dracol and Shar were giving her knowing grins, and there was a tinkle in Hughana's dark eyes. She looked at the seat behind her and saw Scut, still staring out his own porthole, not paying attention to them at all. As the vector toward the only settlement Jesmine had seen so far, she dared reach out with the force a little. She could normally use it to get a vague sense of the moves of the people around her. Despite the strange and legendary nature of the world they were about to step foot on, Shar, Huhana, and Drickall all seemed to be calm, professional, focused on the tasks ahead of them. She couldn't read Scud at all, not his face, and not in the force, where the U.S. and Vong was as blank as ever. Once the shuttle set down on the flat, grassy landing field outside the town, the landing ramp swung down. The shuttle's passenger cabin was suddenly full of wind and natural light. As she unhooked her crash webbing, Jasmine took a breath of the cool, fresh air, the kind she hadn't breathed in what seemed like months. Then she followed Shar, Hughana, and Drickall down the ramp and onto Zanima's second surface. She didn't open herself to the force, not right away. She took in the broad field, dotted with living second in airships and shuttles from the fleet in orbit. She tilted her head back and watched the blue clouds streak dome of the sky as wind blew loose strands of dirty blonde hair in her face. Her mother had said that being on this planet, touching the force here, had been a beautiful experience, like she was surrendering herself to being one part of a graceful and beautiful whole, and trusting that whole and all of its pieces. Her brother had said that he'd actually felt his force powers amplify, that he'd been able to sense others more clearly. Jasmine closed her eyes, took a deep breath, and opened herself to the force. She could feel Shar and Huhana, Drickall, and the shuttle's crew, the local pharaoh techs, all moving around with methodical precision as they went about their business. She felt, too, stirrings of life in the forest beyond, but they felt very vague very distant. Without opening her eyes, she placed a hand on her lightsaber hilt, as though that might somehow bring her a closer connection to the world around her. Nothing changed. She opened her eyes and looked around. Yuhana was grunting at a scared-looking pharaoh tech while Shar interpreted. Drickall had shifted a big heavy bag of medical supplies onto his back. She looked behind her to see Scud, still standing tentatively on the edge of the landing ramp, both feet still firmly on metal. Their eyes met. He looked almost afraid. Come on, she said. It won't bite. Scud put one foot on the grass, too. He walked until he was right next to Jasmine. He looked up at the clear sky and took a deep breath. The edges of his lipless U.S. and Vong mouth bent, like a human smile, but he didn't say a word. Jasmine looked around. There weren't any other U.S. and Vong on the landing pad that she could see. She asked, do you feel something here? I do not know. Maybe. Scott's voice was airy distant. Maybe it is all in my head. But I have wanted to come here for so long, I have been afraid of it too. But deep down, I think I knew this had to happen eventually. Drickall was throwing his cargo onto the back of a cart hooked onto some bipedal, vaguely reptilian beast of burden U.S. and Vong biodeck, or just native wildlife, she had no idea. The pharaoh tech, finally getting Hugh Hunter's point, slunk off to do whatever she'd requested of him. What do you feel? Scott asked her. She blinked, tried to hold up a frown. I'm not sure. I need to spend more time here, I think. But your force, Scott said, is it talking to you? I don't know. I think, is talking. Talking to someone, but not her. Yes, that was how it felt. Like all the life in the far off forest were all tangled together into some elaborate network of harmonious force bow communicat ion, but she could only pick up tiny, far off hints of it. In that sense, the force was like it had always been. It was out there, she knew, but she couldn't grasp hold of it. She knew what it felt like to really touch the force, she felt it during the fight in the nebula when the whole universe had seemed to speak to her and direct her two critical torpedoes that broke Mary, and Tilly's escape pod free of its tractor beam and delivered her, to freedom. She'd been hoping to feel that sense of communion again here on Zanima II, but so far it felt shockingly normal. Scut, though mistook her entirely. He said, 
It's almost like I can hear some too. It's probably all in my head. I need to find the other U.S. involved. A cool breeze cut over the clearing. Jasmine shivered. I'm sure we can find you some. Hey. Shar waved from over by the laden down cart. Stop communing with the cosmos. We've got work to do. Jasmine felt relieved for the escape. She smiled and said, right away, boss. She started toward the rest of her team. After a moment's hesitation, Scott followed behind her. Chapter 4 The fleet hung in space above the disk of ice and meteor particles, so close that to cursory scans and the naked of their ships were just stray chunks of space material orbiting the silver and white gas giant known to their chart simply as VB-196A. From the viewport on bridge of the Star Destroyer Phoenix, it felt like you were standing in the middle of a broad plain of ice that curved gently into the distance, while the planet's equally cold glow emanated from the left side. To Miranda Fardreamer, the scene seemed colder and more lonely than a blank field of stars. She wished they'd move, but it didn't matter what she thought. She was currently assigned a brevet ensign rank in the tactical division, a replacement for an officer killed during the recent three-way brawl in the Red Nebula. Miranda was barely 19, and most of the officers on the bridge were older than her. Her unit commander was a wrinkled, gray-furred little bim who, she gathered, had lost his family during the U.S. and Vong invasion of his homeworld and had joined Brenner Refge's true victory fleet because he had nothing else to work toward save revenge. He looked more tired than driven, though. Everybody did nowadays. Miranda understood perfectly. In the beginning, she'd been contacted by a black furred bothan as she worked tables at a casino on Fonder and ran courier for black market goods on the side. The black furred bothan had wanted information on decommissioned ships, and since he paid well, she obliged without thought. That bothan had passed her on to another one for a job, this one with the grizzly brown pelt who'd taken her from Fonder to Jindine, then to Cothless, and finally to an uninhabited system in Bothan space where Bryn Irefja had assembled a fleet of renegade ships and crew with the intent on exterminating the U.S. and Vong in their hiding space in the unknown regions. For Miranda, who'd lost one parent to the U.S. and Vong and another to the infamous mad Jedi Jason Solo, revenge sounded like a pretty good idea. Revenge on the Vong, revenge on the Jedi, Revenge on the whole wretched system of a galaxy that had turned her life progressively to Pudu since just after she was born. Plus, it beat waiting tables and dealing with lecherous low lives on Fonder. When she started running missions for true victory, as Irefja called it, she'd known she was indulging unhealthy anger and that it might get her hurt or killed. To her own mild surprise, she hadn't cared. Being orphaned, Having to survive by herself in the underbelly of a great manufacturing world, she'd learned pragmatism. She's learned ruthlessness. She learned how to stifle her anger at the universe so she could get on with her day. But, it seemed, she hadn't learned how to get rid of it. So she'd done missions for true victory. She'd even killed a man for it. She fought Jedi, scrambled across the sun scorched wastes of her dead father's homeworld and journeyed out into the unknown depths of space and done battle with upright alliance forces, riotous Mandalorians, and devilly U.S. and Vong. Stolen a lightsaber too, which she was a little proud of, even though all she did was keep it in a drawer in her quarters. She tried to think of that lightsaber now, as she stood in in front of Brennan Refja in the Admiral's personal salon just after the bridge. She tried to draw some confidence from it. But Refja sat back in his chair, looking up at the teenage human standing straight before him. He looked distracted, even as he listened to her give her report from the time she'd spent as his envoy and agent aboard Dallas Star Destroyer. Now that the Mandalorians are gone, she said, it leaves a big hole in Dallas' capabilities. She still has some Imperial Commando teams, but if she plans on an infantry or special op, she's lost her best people. What kind of damage did the Mandos do to Chimera on the way out? Arefja asked. He sounded very tired. I'm not exactly sure, Miranda admitted. She tried to keep me from seeing the details, but she lost her captain. And replaced him with a defector from Jagged Fell's task force. I'm aware of that. What else? From what I would guess, sir, I'd say she's down at least one squadron of ties. An assault shuttle. 
and at least a dozen of her own commandos. Those Mandalorians are tough beings. And now they're our enemy, Miranda said under her breath. She didn't relish the thought of facing Fett's people again in battle. Arefja, though, picked up his head and looked at her with narrowed eyes. Afraid she'd misspoke, but unsure how, Miranda opened her mouth to apologize, but Arefja cut her off with a wave of a paw. It's very likely, he said, that Phil convinced Boba Fett that it's just allies could cook up a cure for Lessersen's Nanavirus. I see, sir. It explained Fett's sudden baffling switch in loyalties. Arefja sighed. Fett is not the type to stick around on good faith. I imagine he's taken his people to Chiss space. That eliminates two potential problems. Two, sir. Between losing the Mandalorians and losing Valor, she's lost her upper hand in this partnership. It's why you're back here after all. Miranda just nodded. Berefja leaned forward. Let me ask you one more thing, Ensign. What did you make of Dalla's crew, their loyalties? Are they driven by personal fealty to Dalla? Some imperial ideal? Or do they just want revenge on the Vong? Miranda had to think about that. Chimera's crew hadn't been especially willing to make small talk with the Refugee spies, but Miranda had been able to wrestle conversations from a few of them, mostly young males. I think it's a mix, sir. They all hate the Vong, of course. The older ones are more loyal to the old empire. The younger ones just want payback. And how many of the crew are, as you say, younger? How many older? Those were loose terms, on Phoenix itself. Maybe 60% had fought the U.S. and Vong themselves. The other 40 included those like Miranda, who'd lost others through them. Even among those who had, ages ranged widely, Captains Vatron and Auburn were old warhorses who battled the Empire, while Phoenix's new Captain Welby was a full generation younger. Do you mean how many fought the Vong themselves, sir? At least on Chimera, I'd say maybe 70% looked old enough to fight the Vong. I can't speak to the other ships. I understand Chimera's new captain is a non-human. How does Dalla's crew feel about that? I think a lot of them are surprised. But I don't think anyone's going to mutiny if that's what you're asking. Well, it does no harm to hope, he said without humor. All right, Ensign. That is all for now. You may report back to Captain Welby. Just hearing the name of Phoenix's new commanding officer made Miranda's breath catch because just the thought of the new captain made her think of the old captain, Elskar Loro, crumpling in front of a firing squad. Captain Loro had been a hard woman, made bitter and angry by a lifetime of loss. Miranda had fought a lot in common with the old crone. Both placed the weight of their suffering on the shoulders of the U.S. Hinvong and fought against them because they had nothing better to do. Miranda had thought that Loro understood that similarity. Yet in the end Loro had helped Phoenix's prized prisoners escape and fatally damaged one of their own ships in the process. And she'd gone out with a smile. Miranda didn't blame Arefja for the execution. At least, not logically. Loro had killed her own allies and let a crucial asset escape. For that, the only real punishment was death. So she didn't blame Arefja, she wondered if he did. She tried to keep the tremor out of her voice as she said, Sir, if you need me for any other duty, I'm eager to help. She tried not to feel foolish as the Bothan looked her over. She joined this fleet because she wanted to do something, to be worth something, even though she'd hated going over to Chimera, she consoled herself with the thought that this might win her some redemption in Irefja's eyes after her failure as Tatooine. But she wasn't getting forgiveness today. The Admiral simply nodded and said, Dismissed, Ensign. Miranda turned and marched out the command salon. She checked in with Florin Welby, a pale-haired woman barely into middle age, then went down into the crew pit and tried to busy herself with work. It didn't work, and when Arefja walked out onto the bridge she couldn't help but watch him out of the corner of her eye. As he talked quietly with Welby, his shoulders were hunched and he avoided the gaze of his crew, as if he was ashamed of everything that had happened the day before, botched battle, escape, execution, all of it. Before the escape, Miranda had spent a lot of time talking with one of the prisoners. She hadn't been too much older than Miranda, but she seemed younger. Softer, at least. Her parents weren't only alive, they were heroes. 
Mary Antilles had possessed friends, a job, a purpose. Miranda hated her for her softness and she envied her for it too. She was starting to envy Antilles and Laurel both for escaping while they could. Miranda had the feeling things were going to get a lot worse pretty soon. As if to confirm the feeling in her gut, the communications lieutenant raised her voice to tell Arefja, Admiral, we've got a communication from Chimera. Admiral Dollar requests that you report to your ready room to receive a private encrypted transmission. She does, does she? Arefja stopped pacing. One ear twitched. Very well. Put the line through. Yes, sir. Head still low, shoulders still hunched, Irefja walked down the aisle and off the bridge. Every crewman watched him, and they all tried to pretend they didn't. Miranda heard the crewman next to her, a leather-faced Ishitib, mutter, gotta run when the master calls. Do you have something important to say, Ensign? Their lieutenant said. The old bim was tiny but could sound imperious when she wanted. No, ma'am. The Ishitib shook his head. I didn't think so, the lieutenant sniffed. Back to work. Yes, ma'am? The Bim turned back to her console. Miranda glanced up to see Captain Welby staring down at them, lips tight and forehead wrinkled in a frown. Miranda felt scolded, even though she hadn't done anything wrong, and went back to monitoring her station. Her scanners showed the entire fleet laid outline a trail of breadcrumbs, orbiting above the planet's icy disk. Their Imperial allies were outnumbered and outgunned by at least two to one, but despite Arefja's recent words, it looked like Dala was still calling the shots. Maybe Arefja was afraid of offending her and losing the alliance, but right now Miranda thought it made him look weak, and she clearly wasn't alone. But of course, what did it matter what Miranda Fardimer thought? It hadn't mattered to anyone in the universe before, and it wouldn't matter to anyone again. Anyone except. Maybe, Myrie Antilles and Elskar Loro, but Miranda didn't expect to see either of them again. Not before she was dead, anyway. The way things were going, she might not have long to wait. Phil Iyer now stood on the bridge of legendary Chimera as her captain. Growing up as a non-human in the Empire, driven to succeed in his navy against all prejudices, commanding the Great Thrawn's flagship was something she fantasized about, but never believed could happen. Now it had, and she had no idea what to think. The situation was beyond surreal. Equally unbelievable was the woman she now followed off the bridge and into the private command salon. Admiral Dalla had been almost as legendary as Thrawn when she'd been growing up. For a long time, most people assumed she was dead. In many ways, she was completely unlike the Chis Grand Admiral. Whereas Thrawn was careful and plotting, Dalla fought like a cornered Nexu. Her unpredictability led to widely varied battle results, but she could always be counted on for the dramatic strike, the unexpected counter. One legendary admiral was an alien, the other was a woman, and since Philire was both, Thrawn and Dalla alike had been idols of her childhood. For the same reasons Philire had admired the admiral, so Dalla had clearly taken a liking to her, going so far as to capture her from her ship with the Trinity fleet and convince her to join the Renegades. Unlike Dala or the true victory people, Philior had no burning desire to fight the U.S. involved. What she did want, however, was a stronger galaxy, with a stronger empire, and right now Vitor Riage and Jagged Fell seemed intent on imitating all the worst mistakes of anarchy that called itself a galactic alliance. Dala's methods as chief of state of the alliance had proven ineffective against the Jedi and her own imperial allies. Her cornered next to approach had a much better chance of working for the Empire, and Phil Ior now found herself at Dalla's right hand, poised to remake the Empire and the entire galaxy. All they had to do first was perform a little genocide. No, Surreal didn't begin to cover it. Dalla led her into the tactical salon and keyed her encryption code into the holographic transmitter. Before turning in on she gestured for Phil Ior to join her. The Twi'lek straightened her uniform and stepped beside the tall, gray-haired admiral. A blue holographic image appeared before them. Phil Iyer was not an expert at reading Bothan facial expressions, but it appeared that Admiral Bryn Irefja was stressed. His fur looked more bristly than normal and his lips were curled back to reveal white canines. 
He might have been trying to imitate a human smile, or he might have been trying to look aggressive. Either way, it was disconcerting. Thank you for replying, Admiral Dalla said. What is the status of your ships? We've patched up the whole breaches on Phoenix, the Bothan explained. He sounded irritated, like he had someplace else to be. Darylin and Feli report complete repairs as well. What about the crew from Melon? Dalla asked, naming the Bothan cruiser that had been destroyed during the Nebula battle. Very few escaped before she was destroyed, Erefja said. However, her fighter complement has been reapportioned to Darylin and Feli to make up for the ones they lost. Very good, Dalla nodded. Captain Philire, would you please report on the status of Valor's remains? Valor had been destroyed when Erefja's own captain had fired upon it. The Bothan bristled at the mention of the name, but being a gentleman, he did not mention the damage Dallas on Mandalorians had done to the fleet. Philire cleared her throat. We managed to salvage everything we can from the ship. Supplies, fuel, important metals. We've distributed them evenly among our ships. I can send you a list of the salvage, in case one of your ships desperately needs something. I appreciate that. Please do. Aref just shifted his tired eyes to Dalla. Admiral, may I ask what you plan to do now? We can't hide and lick our wounds forever. Of course, Dalla nodded. I apologize for not telling you this before, Admiral, but Valor accomplished one important feat before her, death. And what is that? Valor as well as Chimera and Resolve, carried on board a certain missile designed to burrow into your coral. This missile is designed not to explode on impact. You harpoon the U.S. and Vong ship. Oref just fur rippled in incredulity or confusion. This missile contained a tracking device, Dalla said simply. Phylire tried to hide her surprise and wondered what other secrets Dalla had close to the chest. I was, unaware of such technology, Erefja was clearly annoyed. It was devised by my late Ali, Dalla said, referring to Moff Drickle Lesserson, who had been gunned down by the Mandalorians during the escape. While useful, Lesserson was also as slippery as a greased hut, and Phil Iyer was glad to see him gone. And this tracking device, do you have a read on it? Indeed I do, Dalla nodded, and Phil Iyer could only wonder where. Where was Dalla keeping all her secret tools and tricks so that even the captain of her flagship couldn't find them? Of course, this was an old ship with plenty of hidden rooms and passages, and Phil Ior had only been captain for less than 24 standard hours. Still, she felt a little humiliated. Well, Erefja bristled again. What do you intend to do about this? It's simple, Dalla said. We launch a stealth recon flight and shadow the fleet. We make measure of his capabilities and decide whether or not to attack. I see. Orefja was clearly unhappy with being kept in the dark, and Phil Iyer didn't blame him. However, Dalla said, I would be reluctant to attack at this time. I believe we could gain much by shadowing the fleet and learning his movement. More importantly, this fleet is not our main priority and should not be confused as such. What do you mean? Orefja ears flattened. What is our enemy, Admiral? Dal ignored his insouciance. My dear Admiral, you know what our true enemy is. We could not be rid of the Vong until we rid ourselves of Zanima II. Phylior had heard many things, mostly contradictory, about the so-called living world. Many agreed it was very capable of defending itself. If Dala had a secret plan to defeat it, Phylior couldn't guess it. You expect them to lead us to their homeworld. Erefja asked. It is possible, Dalla said simply. We must watch and observe. Tell me, Admiral, does your fleet have any of those reconnaissance Model X-Wings fighters? We have several, Erefja allowed. Then I'll give you the coordinates, Dalla smiled tightly. Please investigate and report back within five hours. Erefja nodded. Very well. Thank you, Admiral. Thank you, Dalla said and killed the transmission. She looked at Phil Iyer and smiled. Well, that went well, didn't it? We already have reconnaissance ships here, Phil Iyer said. But you wanted to involve him in process. Make him feel like a trusted part of this mission, and therefore keep him from doing anything rash. 
Very good. We must keep our allies happy, after all. And informed. Phylire tried to keep the bitterness out of her voice. Dala chuckled. Don't be offended, Captain. I have many resources and security is key right now. So she wasn't going to share her sources. Phylire tried not to be disappointed. It was the Admiral's prerogative, and she was certainly not obliged to share every bit of intelligence with her subordinates. As if for solace, Dala placed a hand on Phylire's shoulder. Don't look so glum, Captain. There is still a great deal of work to be done. Certainly there is plenty to keep you busy. Such as, Dala took a small data ship out of her pocket. First, transmit these coordinates to Phoenix, along with the list of salvage from Valor. Phil Iyer took the data ship in her red palm. Dala took out a second and said, this contains all the information we've gathered about Zanima second. Much is hearsay, but it also contains information from Alliance Intelligence and eyewitness accounts from the recapture of Karuskin. Phil Iyer pocketed the first data chip and took the second. It was physically identical but felt so much heavier. She asked, what should I do with this information, Admiral? Isn't it obvious? Dala grinned. I want you to come up with a battle plan. I want it ready for review in 15 hours. Can it be done? Yes, sir. Phil Iyer snapped a salute. Dala still held the data chip in her hand. I appreciate the enthusiasm, Captain. But first things first. Give Irefja what he needs. Yes, sir, Phil Iyer repeated. She lowered her hand and picked up the data chip on the way. I won't let you down, Admiral. The old woman nodded approvingly, as though she really believed Phil Iyer's words. It was enough to make Phil Iyer believe them too. Chapter 5 It was a strange thing to find yourself seeking shelter in the home of your enemies, but Godab had done it before. That had been the better part of a century ago, and he hadn't been Godab then. He'd been Barton Jusik, a Jedi, and even before he swapped the brown robes for a full suit of Besker, he hadn't considered Mandalorians the enemy, not really, despite the long-standing animosity between the two groups, or the fact that one of his very First combat missions in the Clone Wars had been against Mando mercenary Ghez Hokan and his separatist bosses. The U.S. Hinvong, though, had definitely been an enemy. They'd fallen on Mandalore with the same awful rapaciousness that they'd fallen on everywhere else. Godab had lost a lot of people he'd cared about to the Vongis, including beings he'd called sons. It was almost surreal to be on this living planet this world that sang with a harmonious force melody he couldn't stop hearing despite having largely walked away from the Force 60 years ago. It was utterly mind-bending to walk down the narrow lanes of this village and see so many U.S. and Vong faces, some scarred, some tattooed, some smooth and clear, and see no malice in them. It unsettled him too much. He didn't know what to make of it. So in the end, he did his best to hole up in the Demudek at the village as the Mandalorians had been given, and not interact with any of the locals. The others did too. There was admittedly something Mando-ish about living in a squat, fairly primitive hut on the edge of the forest. The broad dome structure, its shape and basic size, brought back surprising memories of the Kiramora Karae, the Skarada clan had taken refuge in at the end of the Clone Wars. It was such a strange comparison Kalbor's humble hut in this organic Vongi's growth that he was surprised it occurred to him. He was even more surprised when Muriel sidled up next to him and said, Feels like we went full Shabla circle a little, don't it? Gotham's brow wrinkled. What do you mean? You know what I mean. The two old men sat on a bench on the rim of the Demudek. In the middle of the broad round space was Venku, dressed in the thin white clothes he'd been shipped down from Celestial Inn, was doing stretches. Ordo's grandkids, in simple black jumpsuits, were doing simple push-ups. Gadab and Mario were the only ones wearing armor, and even they left their helmets in the shuttle that had taken them down to the planet, along with the handful of small arms that Jaina Solo had told them they'd be allowed to take. Said shuttle and equipment were now being carefully guarded by some Faron locals who very determined that no one used them unless there was a real emergency. Kira Moritz a long time gone, Gadab told the shaggy old clone. All of us watching out for Katika, though, Muriel grunted. Feels familiar. He supposed it did. 
Aside from Jang, who'd gone off to Chilla to make sure the Chiss and Boba Fett both kept their promise to develop a counter agent to lesser sins than Avaris, the only ones left alive who joined Skirata's refuge were in this humble hut. After Venku had sufficiently limbered up, Bess and Gendry started helping him with exercises. They hadn't been able to scrounge up much, but Gendry had found a couple chair arm cushions in the back of one of the shuttles, and right now he was holding them up, one flat against either forearm, for Venku to practice punching. Bess stood back and quietly critiqued her uncle's stance, telling him to pick up his heel more and keep his shoulders square, like he was an 80-year-old man learning how to throw jabs for the first time. Muriel was right. After so many years, all of them were quietly focused on Katika, protecting him from hurt, trying to raise him up to be the great Mando warrior everyone knew he could be. Of course, that was what Gadab had been doing almost all his life. Venku didn't seem embarrassed at being baby. He knew better than any of them what a miracle it was that he was alive and standing at all. The fact his broken, messed up body was coordinated enough to land a few right jabs was astounding, even to Gadab, and greater evidence than any that this planet really was special. They moved on to hooks when Jaina Solo showed up. The woman announced herself silent with the force, turning Gadab's attention away from the sparring to woman's shape half filling the Damudex entry portal. It seemed like she wanted to talk. He had half a mind to tell her to come over and sit down and watch the match but thought better of it. He picked his heavy old body off the bench and shuffled over to portal. What can I help you with, Dika? He asked quietly as Venku, Bess, and Gendry stayed focused on their sparring. Instead of answering his question, Jaina tilted her chin toward Venku. How's he doing? How does it look? He needs to keep his right heel up. Gotta snort it. He already knows, but it's impressive. I'll admit that. You're welcome. Jaina smiled a little. So, Dika, why are you here? I wanted to check on Venku, see how he was recovering. And the rest of us, too. America's not going to start any brawls with Von Gies. Don't worry. I can't keep him in line. He wasn't joking. The old Barf actually might try it. Your people are free to move around the village. You don't have to stay in the Demudek. It's better this way. I'm not a Jedi anymore. I don't have your skill for forgiveness. Fair enough, she said softly. I was wondering if you wanted something else to do, though. Gotta look back at the sparring ring. That depends on Katika. I know. But I thought I'd tell you first. Tell me what. I'm taking some Alliance and Imperial techs and flying out to the planet's hyperdrive core. We're going to look at the engines and see if we can't get them working again. Sounds like a good plan. You want us to come along? I would, yes. He raised a white eyebrow. Want to keep an eye on us, do you? Your people have useful skills, she said avoiding the question. He assumed that meant yes. I don't know about that. Venku's still all wobbly, body, and mind. Bess, she's a brawler, not a tech. Gendry, and Merica, well... Your name means engineer, she reminded him. I assume you know your way around a hyperdrive core. Never seen one big enough to move a planet. Don't you want to, though? He looked at her, saw honest curiosity in her dark eyes. He had to admit he did. Everything about this damned planet was mystifying and strange and threatened to wake an old boyish sense of wonder he'd put behind him decades ago. It was taking conscious effort to force his attention where it belonged, on the family he'd chosen instead of the nebulous force mysticism he'd been born and raised in. I'm a little old for adventures, he reminded her. She shrugged. But here you are. She had him there. His comfortable retirement had ended the moment the Imperials dropped that Nanavirus into Mandalore's atmosphere with the intent of killing all his family. In the end, it was his family's choice, so he blew a sharp whistle and drew everyone's attention. Venku, pale and slick with sweat, looked glad for the reprieve, and he joined Bess and Gendry as they walked toward the new arrival. As for Muriel, he stayed perched on his bench like a shaggy gray gargoyle, watching intently. We've just got an offer here from Master Solo, God have told them. She wants us to come and help fix the planet's hyperdrive cores. 
Bess face stayed stiff, but Gendry softened with curiosity. He asked Jaina, are they really big enough to move a planet? She smiled tightly. So I've been told. We can't see for ourselves soon. Hold up, Muriel called from the bench. This isn't your call, Jenica. I know. The young man looked at Venku. Everyone else did too. The man didn't shirk from their attention. He wiped some sweat off his forehead and asked Jaina, what do you think we can do there? Help us run tests, diagnostics. Maybe climb a little into the bowels of the engine cores. Anyone can do that. Gotta remind him. It's also some fresh air. Jaina looked at the Demudex, low dome ceiling. A change of scenery. A way to give your body and mind a little more exercise. She paused, then added, it's a way to learn more about this planet, too. Everyone watched Venku, waiting for his reply. God of Nukatika was surprised and awed by this place that had saved him, even more so than God of because, unlike the old ex-Jedi, he'd only been trained to use the Force in simple, straightforward, practical ways that would help his vote in combat situations. All this mystical communion with the cosmic stuff was something God of, quite deliberately, had never tried to pass on to Darman and Etain's son. For the first time, he was starting to doubt that decision. So, too, was Venku. He hid it from his face, but Gadab could feel it in the force. Hiding emotions was something else Gadab had never taught him. All right, we'll go, Venku said, then added, we owe you that much. Bess and Gendry's eyes went white at that simple phrase. They spent their whole lives knowing Kataka as the man who said Mandos should watch out for Mandos and nothing else. They didn't fight other people's wars, and they certainly didn't owe them anything either. Protect the Mandoade and nothing else. It had been Venku's rallying cry since Gadab had told a ten-year-old boy the story of his parents' lives and deaths. But Gadab wasn't surprised. He knew, already, that this planet was changing his Kataka. What it would change him into, he had no idea. At sixty years old, Venku Skirata was too old to pull the about face a teenage bard and Jusik had. In the end, though, it didn't matter. Gadab would watch over him, protect him, no matter the cost. That was what he owed Darman and Etain, even after all this time. No matter how much he tried, Ben couldn't get used to being around you as Hinvon. He spent a good two hours with Horror and his two acolytes explaining their mission so far, and it never stopped being unsettling. This whole world was rich with the Force. Even the buildings were alive. Yet horror was a void to him. It felt as though he and Tahiri were sitting in a room by themselves, talking to empty air. The total lack of the U.S. Hinvong in the Force was disturbing on an instinctual level. More than that, it reminded him of Jason, who more and more often would shroud himself so that others couldn't feel him in the Force. It was a skill he picked up in U.S. Hinvong captivity, adding yet another level of association between these strange, frightening beings and the equally strange and frightening thing his cousin had become. At the same time, it was intellectually confusing too. He'd heard the explanation that the U.S. and Vong had been stripped of the Force, or forcibly removed to plane different from the rest of the universe, so that their savagery could no longer pollute things with the dark side. Yet the Zanima Seket was a seed of the U.S. and Vong homeworld, an image of it before it had become horribly corrupted. The U.S. Hinvong were absent from the Force, and Zana Masekit was rich with it, and that meant they should have been incompatible, but from everything Ben could see, they were coexisting peacefully. After two hours of talking with horror, Ben excused himself. He wandered through the streets of the town, drawing stares from every pharaoh and U.S. Hinvong he passed. It made him self-conscious about being human, and about being a Jedi, and the latter especially was something he tried very hard to escape all his life. The town was not large, and he was able to slip off the main street, went past a few more dama-like buildings, and work his way into the surrounding forest. Ben hadn't grown up in a natural setting like Jaina, Tahiri, or Jason, but he didn't feel out of place here. Maybe that was second touching him through the forest, he didn't know. He wandered around the trunks of massive borer trees, bent low to examine leaves decaying to mulch on the forest floor, and had a minute long stare off with some beguiled furry mammal hanging off a branch over his head. 
it was a good way to take his mind off things. Ben wondered for a while, until he came to a pond surrounded by tall trees. He bent low, found a smooth rock, and tried to skip it across the water. Not being a nature boy, he failed miserably, but he picked up another one and tried again. This one dashed across the surface of the water twice before plunking into the depths, and he felt mildly accomplished. Hey, said a voice. Ben turned around to see a child peeking out from behind a tree trunk. He was a human with blonde hair and was dressed in a sand-colored tunic. Hey, mister, the kid said, you're not very good. Ben stared. Aside from Danny Kui and assorted new arrivals, he hadn't seen any humans since landing on Zanima second. Now one was harassing him on his stone-skipping skills. I've never really tried it before, Ben said lamely. You think you can do better? The boy shook his head. No, not yet. Ben crossed his arms over his chest. Well, I guess you're in no place to judge, are you? The boy smirked. What are you doing all the way out here? I just wanted to take a walk. What's wrong with that? Nothing. I like taking walks too. Ben frowned. Hey, do you have parents with you? You think I'm too young? No offense, but yeah, you're a little small to be wandering around in the woods by yourself. A mischievous grin appeared on the boy's face. I could say the same thing about you? Kid, I think I'm a little older than you. No, the boy said firmly, you're not. Then he turned and ran. Ben stared for a second, stunned, confused, wondering if he really wanted to charge through the forest after some bratty little kid. He didn't want the kid to get hurt, though, so with a sigh he set off in pursuit. Whoever he was, the kid was fast. Ben caught occasional flashes of gold hair and dappled sunlight as he plunged deeper into the forest. Brush was growing thicker, scraping at his ankles and calves. He lowered his head to dodge a low-hanging branch and lost sight of the boy. He tried to skid to a halt but found himself on a downward slope, into some valley where the vegetation grew even more dense. He lost balance, tipped forward, and nearly plunged head first into the ravine. Luckily, he was able to grab hold of a tree and keep himself from what could have been a painful, even fatal, fall. Ben stood on the edge, panting, and looking in all directions for some sign of the kid. Then it came to him, the realization he immediately kicked himself for not having sooner. It must have been Zanima second. Well, it could have been. That would have explained the part about being way older than Ben. He should have thought to reach out with the force and verify whether or not the kid was there at all. He felt a surge of frustration, both at himself and at the living world. He should have seen through the trickery. Yes, but what is the point? Why would an all-powerful sentient planet pretend to be a bratty kid and lead him down a wild might not chase through the forest, one that almost got him badly hurt? You're brave, a voice said from behind him. Ben took a deep breath and turned around. The bright-haired boy was sitting on a fallen log at the top of the slope looking smugly down at Ben. What was the point of that? He asked. I wanted to show you something. Like what? The child's face grew serious. It's down in that ravine. I think you will be very interested in seeing it. That's not very helpful, Ben said. It's really better if you see it yourself. Ben wanted to second a dozen things, most of all why he was playing these games instead of helping to put itself back together. There were thousands of people on his surface who depended on it, but all it wanted to do was have elusive, cryptic encounters with a couple of Jedi. Who are you supposed to be? Ben asked. The boy blinked. What do you mean? I mean, I'm glad you're not dressing yourself up as Jason, or you as Hen Vong. Who are you supposed to be? The child's face looked sad, and old beyond its years. A friend I miss very much but I've been trying to get in touch with him again. Yeah, well, good luck with that. Ben looked back at the ravine. The slope was steep, but if he went slowly, keeping hold of branches and using the force selectively, it would be doable. Still looking at the ravine, he said, I'll know it when I see it, hell. It's someone I was able to get in touch with. Ben thought he heard a smile in the boy's voice, but when he turned to look, he saw only an empty log and the forest beyond. Ben sighed and began his descent.
he went down with the size of his feet forward, giving him the best traction. He had to grab a branch once or twice to retain his balance, but in the end, he got to the base of the ravine. The bottom was very narrow. A stream trickles down the center and rocks, brush, and trees rose on every side. Ben felt something in the force, a dim compulsion, and tried to follow the path of stream. He didn't have to go far before he saw the water wind into the black belly of a cave. Ben had heard some stories about caves. The one on Dagobah his father had found came to mind. He touched his mother's lightsaber, thought about taking it off his belt and flicking his violet blade on, but then he remembered the rest of his father's story and took his palm away. He went into the cave with empty hands. He stepped a few meters into the entrance and waited for his eyes to adjust to the dark. The air smelled of rotting plants, mud, moss, and fungi. As his vision cleared, he realized that there was, in fact, not much farther he could go. The cave's roof collapsed just a few more meters ahead, and the stream dispersed into a shallow pool that seeped through rocks and trickled deeper into the earth. If this was what Second had wanted him to see, he was a little disappointed. He thought about taking up his mother's lightsaber, maybe hacking up the stone to see if there was anything beyond the end of the cave, but that might also bring a wild cliff down on his head. Or summon an evil phantom image of Jason, or something. Whatever the case, it was nothing Ben wanted. He was about to turn around when he felt a sudden chill run through his body. He froze, took a deep breath, and placed the palm of his hand just over the lightsaber's hilt. Then he turned around. His mother was standing in front of him smiling. He knew it was her, not second, knew it in his gut, even though she looked so much clearer than a force ghost, like she was really in the cave bedside him. She didn't look ten years too young, like Jason had. She looked like he had last seen her, the way she was frozen in mind and memory forever, beautiful but harsh, proud but understanding, so determined. And her smile, bittersweet and knowing, was too true to be a simulacrum. Goodness, she said, you keep growing so fast. His chest felt tight, and his eyes threatened tears. He sniffed them away and took a step closer. Mom, it's you. How? I don't really know. She shook her head. Long red hair spilled naturally off her shoulders. But that's not important, is it? The important thing is that you're here. Mom, you, Ben found his throat tighten. He croaked, I've missed you, Mom. I've missed you too, Mara took two steps closer. She looked so real to Ben, not like a force ghost, nor like the projection of her he'd seen in the lake of apparitions in the mall. He reached out to touch her, but when his fingers reached her shoulder they passed through empty air. His hand recoiled instantly. It's okay, Ben, she said. Really, it's all going to be okay. I don't know about that. Ben hugged himself. You know where we are, don't you? Is Zanima second, isn't it? Ben nodded. When you were here before, did you? Commune with the dead. No. But I guess second has learned a few tricks since then. I hope so, Ben said. He choked again and wiped the tears from his eyes. It's just good to see you, eh, Mom. I'm always watching out for you. You know that right. Ben nodded. Yeah. Yeah, I do. What's wrong? He laughed involuntarily. I don't know where to start. We're lost in the unknown regions. There's some crazy U.S. involved fleet after us, and some crazy alliance people who want to kill us too. And there's Admiral Dalla, and there's Sith too. His mother seemed unfazed. There's always something. But what is it really, Ben? He swallowed. Her name's Vestera. The serenity in his mother's face broke. Now she looked like she was going to cry. Oh, Ben. These are the kind of things I missed. Mom is not like that. He shook his head. Vester is a Sith. I thought, I thought I could bring her over to the light. But I was stupid. You loved her? Yeah, Ben admitted. I loved her. And it was a mistake. Love isn't a mistake, Ben. Tell that to Jason, he said bitterly. Mara considered her response for a long time. Finally, she asked, do you think you'll have to kill her? I tried to save her once. It didn't work. So you think she's irredeemable? He didn't know what to say. 
He'd asked himself that a billion times over, but he knew he was too mixed up inside to say for sure. Love and hate wart and clouded his judgment. He wished he could be rid of emotions, rid of the force, just a bland automaton who never had to worry about failure and hope and joy and loss. He was sick of them all. Ben, his mother said, when I went after Jason, I was angry. My love for you made me ready to kill, eager to kill. I went after him with the darkness in my heart. He was a Sith Lord, Ben said. You had to do it, just like Jaina had to kill him. He wasn't a Sith Lord then, Mara shook her head. Maybe if I thought things through, I could have saved him. I know I would have done things differently. I probably wouldn't have ended up dead. Maybe Jason wouldn't have become Kedis. Oh, Mom, don't. She held up a hand. It's okay, Ben. I'm at peace with what's happened to me. I really am. It's not right, he said. Mom, there's so much I wish I could fix. Me too, she smiled sadly. What? You can't undo the past. You just have to do your best to make the pain worth it. Don't embrace it like Jason did. Try to redeem it. Prevent it from happening again. I know it's going to be hard, but nothing worth doing is easy. So you're saying, I shouldn't kill Vestera. I'm saying if you do, you'll lose something important in yourself. I don't want you to hurt anymore, Ben. That brought him no clarity. It was what Tahiri had told him to. Then, what should I do? Well, your father likes to say that anyone can be redeemed. I don't know if I believe that, but it was always good to have your father telling me that. I always needed his sweetness and light to balance out the dark inside me. Dad, hasn't been sweetness and light since you died, Mom. He's gotten colder. He's still good, still on the light side, but... He's been hurt badly in ways that can never really heal. But he's strong, Ben, and so are you. I'm so proud of what you've become. He couldn't keep the tears away this time. Thanks, Mom. I just, I'm confused. I wish you were here. I am here, Ben, she said softly. I'm with you always. He tried to wipe the water from his face. Then, what should I do? His mother was silent for a long time. When his vision cleared, he saw her watching him carefully. Her expression was sad, tender. Ben, it took your father to save me from the dark. If anyone can save Vestra, it's you. Thanks, Mom. A smile came unbidden. He still had no certainty, no direction, but her confidence meant more than he could say. Go with the force, Ben. I know you'll do the right thing. His vision blurred again. When he blinked his eyes dry, his mother was gone, and he stood alone in a damp, dark cave. The only sound was the tinkle of water beneath his feet and the low whistling of wind against stone. His legs grew weak and he dropped to a crouch, buried his face in his hands, and wept freely. When his crying was done, when he'd let it all out, Ben walked without hesitation out of the cave. Chapter 6 Vesterakai was a Sith. That had been drilled into her since her birth. Sith had been her clan, her purpose, her direction, her meaning. Sith had been everything. Sith was still everything, even though she didn't know what the word meant anymore. The ones she was with now, these ones Sith, were unlike anything she'd met before. Certainly they were different from the lost tribe she'd grown up with. You could tell it just by looking. All the Darths on board Revenge, their ancient semi-organic racket and vessel, resurrected, and pulsing with dark side energy, all bore tattoos striped in red and black, marking their faces with fearsome elaborate patterns. To one of her lost tribe, which prided itself on physical beauty, such markings would have been horrifying. At least it made them fit in with the U.S. involved. Revenge floated in the midst of some two dozen organic cruisers of the renegade U.S. Hinvong fleet. Apparently, they called themselves True Honor and had forged a pact with the Sith. With the help of Darth Wirelock, Darth Nether, and the other Dark Lords, True Victory had recovered derelict U.S. Hinvong ships left over from the war. The ships had been reanimated through some fusing of U.S. Hinvong and Sith biological science, creating vessels even more fearsome than those that had ravaged the galaxy 15 years ago. Vestera was not certain of the specifics. All she knew was that this strange alliance went both ways. 
in exchange for helping the renegade U.S. Hinvong build a new fleet with which to terrorize the galaxy, the one Sith were receiving the U.S. Hinvong's help in healing their mysterious leader, Darth Krait. A party of U.S. Hinvong had just arrived on revenge, and Vestera was part of the honor guard of a dozen Sith warriors who greeted them. Her heritage made her revolt at the sight of the six scarred, tattooed warriors who marched in first. Their armor, rough and spiked, looked like downgraded imitations of whatever U.S. Hinvong creation had biologically bonded with Darth Krait the creation that at once threatened to consume him and also kept him alive after a battle with the force entity known as Abeleth. After the warriors came a single member of the Shaper cast. He was tall and dark, and his face curiously unmarked by scars, though a few black tattoos ran like tangled vines down his cheeks. On the top of his head he wore the tentacled headdress that marked members of his cast. Darth Vidius, the Deveronian who stood beside her for the honor guard was the closest thing she had to a mentor and the one Sith, and he had explained the U.S. Hinvong caste system to her already. He spoke with approval of the U.S. Hinvong's strict hierarchical governance. He talked about the harsh punishments they meted out to those who broke with established order, and how it helped them create such an effective war machine. He didn't say that he wished they could touch the Force and use the dark side, but he didn't have to. Even Vestera, who found the Vong's utter absence in the Force profoundly disturbing, had to admit they made fantastic warriors. The Shaper's party was led to the room where Darth Krait was being kept. The Dark Lord had emerged from his stasis chamber just days ago, breaking out of his coffin-like resting place like an undead monster out of stories. He looked Vestera dead in the eye and demanded her name. She felt frightened and humbled by unimaginable dark side power. But while Krait's power was great, his flesh was weak. The U.S. Hinvong Shaper was led into the chamber by Darth Wirelock, Krait's Chagrian second in command, and Dishan, a humanoid female who seemed to serve as Krait's physician and Revenge's chief scientist. While she did not bear the red and black markings of an anointed Sith Lord, she did have patterns of ink writhing across her tanned skin, marking her as a member of one Sith just the same. With Wirelock, Dishan, and the Shaper inside, that left ten Sith and six U.S. and Vong to stand on opposite sides of the anteroom, staring each other down. Their faces were alien, and they were impossible to read through the Force, but Vestera could still get a sense of what was going through the heads of these beings. Their attention kept shifting between the Sith and the unfamiliar room around them. They stood with their snake-like amphistaffs resting stiffly at their sides a posture temporarily relaxed but ready to spring to motion on short notice. She could tell they would die to defend their commander. Some things didn't change, whether you were one Sith, Lost Tribe, or you was involved. After the two sides had stood there for perhaps 15 minutes, neither showed outward relaxation, but Vestra could tell that her Sith companions were no longer as tense as they had been. She could feel Darth Vidius' force presence become strangely calm like he was settling into some kind of meditation, even though to outward appearance, he was standing alert and fixing his U.S. and Vong counterparts with an intimidating glower. Vestera didn't want to let her mind wander off the Vong. If it did, she knew she wouldn't slip into a peaceful state like Vidius. Her thoughts would be pulled, as if by strong gravitation, to Ben Skywalker. Earlier, she had stood on the bridge of one of the U.S. and Vong frigates and felt Ben on the ship below. As turbolacers and missiles lit up the space between their ships she had reached out with her mind to touch his. She knew he would be coming, and now he knew she was coming. It seemed an equal trade. And now, what was to become of them? As she stood on the bridge, Vestera had told herself that she was ready to kill Ben. A part of her still loved the Jedi boy, and probably always would, but the Sith grew stronger through pain. She could never have him, never be with him, their natures as Jedi and Sith was too ingrained in both. Against such an insurmountable fate, hope itself was painful. Hope was a slow, gnawing ache that would distract her until she removed it entirely. The only way to do that was to kill Ben, and while that pain would be horrible in comparison, at least she would end it. Killing Ben would be her necessary passage to a greater level of dark side power, the kind Vidius and Krait had access to. That was what she told herself during the battle, and that was what she told herself now.
though she was getting less and less certain it was true. She tried to hide her doubts from Vidius from everyone, but she knew when to be honest with herself. In the end, she knew that the truth would come out only when she and Ben had crossed blades. After almost an hour of waiting, the door to Crate's chamber slid open. Crate himself did not exit. Neither did Dishon. Wirelock followed the U.S. and Vong Shaper. Bowing sightly so his horns, one long, the other broken halfway down, didn't catch on the threshold. Villeth Dal is returning to his ship, Wirelock pronounced. Lord Crate will remain in his chamber for a time. As far as declarations went, it was very uninformative. She felt a ripple of annoyance from the Sith Lords, even Vidius. The tall shaper moved for the exit and his guards fell in after him. The Sith Lords began to follow, but as Vesta removed in Vidius's wake, Darth Wirelock called her name. Her heart almost stopped in her chest. Without breathing, without thinking, she turned and saw the Chagrian towering over her. His hands were clasped in front of him and his eyes burned red gold with portent. What is it? Lord Wirelock, she asked, surprised by how steady her voice was. Lord Crate wishes to see you, he said. Me? Vestera blinked. When Wirelock didn't elaborate, she snapped. Yes, of course. May I go in now? Wirelock nodded and gestured to the portal. Vestera walked right past him, paused at the entry long enough to take a deep breath, then walked through. She stepped into the same chamber where Darth Crate had first awoken. The crystalline lid to his coffin like sleeping chamber had been removed, and he sat in it now while Dishon stood to the side, apparently calibrating some readings from the coffin's control panel. Darth Crate's body was encased in some manner of living U.S. and Vong armor. Spikes jutted out from his broad shoulders and rough coral-like plates encased his torso, giving him the look of a menacing animal. His head itself was uncovered and bowed eyes closed in thought or rest. His face was an old man's face, leathery and lined, marked by black tattoos but otherwise normal. It added a strange element of humanity to his otherwise terrifying form. When Vestera got close enough, he opened his eyes, and any illusion of normality was dispelled. One eye blazed red, the other gleamed icy blue. The pupils were misshapen, and it felt to Vestera like she was staring into the eyes of the great tattooing dragon from which he took his name. Leave us, Lady Dishon, Crate said. His voice was low and rasping, not thunderous like wire locks, but somehow more terrifying for his understatement. The scientist gave a short nod and quietly stepped out of the room. The portal hissed slightly as it closed, leaving Vestera alone with the dragon. Before she could say anything, Crate touched her mind. For an awful moment she saw a galaxy in flames, slaughter on Asis, fire on Coruscant, oceans drifting with corpses. She felt the white agony of U.S. and Vong bio-machines tearing into her body, and the searing pain of a lightsaber cleaving off her right hand. She saw explosions blossom over a ring gas giant, heard a woman's desperate voice crackle over a comlink. She couldn't make out words, felt the hot light of twin suns on her back and the shifting of sand beneath her feet. For the tiniest fraction of a second, she saw a man in a vacuum suit, floating untethered in space, alone over a bright, burning star. Then the moment was over and she reeled, gasping, dazed. She had known powerful Sith Lords from her own tribe, but their power was nothing compared with what this being radiated. He had been born nearly a century ago, survived wars and horrible calamities, undergone torture and imprisonment by the U.S. and Vong all of which had acted as fire to forge an indomitable will. She had come to cling to the belief that through pain a Sith grew stronger. Until meeting Crate, she fostered the arrogant delusion that, in losing her tribe and her young love, she knew something about suffering. Now she realized she was just a child after all. Crate stared at her wordlessly. She didn't know for how long. She didn't dare move. She felt like an animal frozen before a predator hoping it would go away. Finally, Crate said, Tell me about Skywalker. Of course. The time she spent in the company of the Jedi Grandmaster and his son was probably the only reason Darth Vidius hadn't left her to die on Yavin 4. She didn't feel surprised or resentful. These one Sith sought to use her just as she sought to use them. 
whoever finished with the other first would callously discard them. It was, after all, the Sith way. Do not think that is the only reason I called you here, Crate said, as if he'd read her mind. Maybe he had. The one Sith are not the Sith of old. I have traveled the galaxy, seeking those with talent and inclination toward the dark side of the Force, so that I might add their unique skills toward our collective effort of exterminating the Jedi and bringing order to the galaxy. I have inclination, Vestra said. I have talent too. Perhaps, Crate allowed. Tell me about Luke Skywalker. Where to begin? He was old, yet young. Naive, but cunning. He lost his foster parents, his wife, both of his nephews, so many students, yet he pressed ever onward in his quest to make the Jedi Order strong. And unlike Vestor's father, his strength and vision did not prevent him from sharing a close bond with his child. Until I met you, as she said, I thought he was the most powerful Force user alive. Both eyes narrowed. Are you flattering me, Lady Kai? Or do you truly believe that I am stronger than he? I don't know, but you seem as strong in the dark side as he does in the light. And that dark side is stronger, isn't it? She didn't even know anymore. Maybe the light was better, but the light had never been within Vestra's reach. She was Sith, had always been Sith, and always would be. Trying to change had only brought her pain. My concern is not with Luke Skywalker, Crate said. Tell me about his son. Ben. Vestra could not hide her shock. What could Darth Crate want with Ben? Oh, Luke Skywalker's son was powerful, just like his father. But he was young, unpredictable, undisciplined in so many ways. He means something to you, Crate said simply. Yes. She couldn't lie, not to those dragon eyes. I, I thought I loved him. Then you loved him, Crate said simply. There is no shame in that. Love is pain, and pain makes one stronger. She could hear knowledge in his voice, deep and personal. She felt though the force the dim echo of touches, smiles, loss, rage. All she could do was nod. A Skywalker stalks my dreams, Crate said. Sometimes he is armored in black and kneels before me. Other times we are locked in deadly combat. When I saw first him he was in space above a battle-scarred world all alone as he drifted through the stars. Vestera couldn't image Ben Skywalker kneeling before a Sith Lord. Then she remembered that flash of vision, of a man floating not over a scarred planet, but a bright star, and wondered what the connection was. Are you sure it was Ben? She asked. It was not, Crate said with finality. This Skywalker was a fully grown man. I remember a head of messy blonde curls, and a sneering, angry face. That doesn't sound like Ben. Yet it was a Skywalker. I know it. Even if that Skywalker is yet to be. His eyes had gone distant for a moment, but then they refocused on her. Tell me, is Ben the last Skywalker? He's Luke Skywalker's only son, yes. There is also Jaina, the child of Leia Organa Solo. She is a Skywalker too. I do not fear the children of Organa Solo, Crate said dismissively. The rabid fumbling of Darth Kida sowed the seeds of discord we are about to exploit. No, it is the Skywalkers who must be dealt with. Lord Crate, Ben Skywalker is here. He's part of the Alliance fleet hunting us through the unknown regions. Not the renegade fleet, the other one that was sent to bring them down. Are you certain of this, Lady Kai? His gaze blazed gold and blue. Are you absolutely sure? Yes, Lord Crate. I would never mistake Ben for anyone else. Then you must find him, capture him, and bring him to me. Can you do that, Lady Kai? She couldn't look away from the dragon's eyes. She didn't know what his intent was to interrogate Ben, or torture him, or try to turn him to the dark side, but she knew Ben would never relent. One way or another, he would be forced past his breaking point by Crate and die. And Vestera would be responsible for all his suffering and death. The agony Vidius had put her through during the battle in the nebula should have cleansed her of all her doubts, but it hadn't. Now, finally, standing in front of Crate, she found they were all gone. Maybe it was some kind of clever dark side trick, but she truly felt a conviction growing inside her. 
when she faced Ben Skywalker again it would be painful. To capture him, deliver him to awful death at the hands of Crate would be agony. But it was necessary. Pain was the only way to achieve the kind of power needed to remake herself into this new kind of Sith. A Sith on course to remake a galaxy and chaos. And maybe when she had turned chaos to order, nothing could ever hurt her again. I will do it, my lord, she said. You can depend on it. Crate nodded in approval, like he saw everything, knew everything inside of her and was pleased. In the end, Ben Skywalker would be nothing but her sacrifice. Part 2. The Changelings A long time ago. Jagged Fell guides his clawcraft into the belly of Ralroost with the steady hand of a lifelong pilot. When his craft is fully settled, he shuts down the engines and repulsor slips, pops the vacuum seal on his cockpit, and eagerly pulls himself out to breathe the cool recycled air of Admiral Creefy's flagship. He spares a few brief words for Shankar and his other Chiss pilots, then makes a beeline across the busy deck. He can see her waiting in the entry to the hallway on the far side, a small woman in a dark green flight suit, brown hair down, and framing her face, just the way he likes it. When he reaches her, he doesn't stop. He takes her by the waist with both hands, pushes her into the shadows, and kisses her on the mouth. He's surprised by his own desire. A lifetime among the Chiss has made him an expert at stifling his emotions and focusing on his duty instead of his need. Now, after a long and dangerous away mission, he finds that all he needs is Jaina Solo. When he finally breaks away for oxygen, Jaina pushes him away. For a second he panics that he's gone too far, but then he hears her giggling. It's a silly, girlish laughter, the kind he's not used to hearing from her. When he takes a step back and looks in her brown eyes, he sees a new infectious joy. When he first met Jaina over Ither, he was surprised how young she seemed. He told her she wasn't grim enough. Then she'd lost both her brothers on the same day, and that loss had made her far too grim. But now here she's, smiling, eyes blazing with happy energy. She takes his hands in hers and says, Hey, fly boy, have a nice trip. You could say that. Jag allows a smile. Smiling still feels a little strange, like someone is tugging his face in weird directions. You seem chipper. Of course I'm chipper, Jaina squeezes his hands. Jason's back. Of course, Jack thinks. He knows her brother, captured by the U.S. Hinvong and Mirker, and left for dead, has in fact returned. He'd been so eager to see Jaina herself that he nearly forgot. I heard on Hollow Net, Jack says congratulations. Come on, Jaina tugs him down the hall, still holding both hands. He's here, on Ralroost. Well, that explains it. He works one hand free so she can stop walking backwards, then lets her drag him down the hallway. He's happy for Jaina, happier than he can say, but he feels a spike of sadness inside. When Jaina lost both siblings, a perverse part of him was almost glad, because it gave them something in common. Jag's brother Davin and his sister Sherris had both been almost ten years older than him, and they both died so long ago he could barely remember them. They died as warriors and brought honor to the Fell family name, but they lingered through his youth as haunting figures. He is not the last child of Suntir and Sial Fell. Chak has his own ship in the CEDF, and his younger brother Sam and sister Wynne are both training. Someday they will follow the family tradition and go into the military. He wonders which of the clan will be the next to follow Davin and Cheris. Sometimes he wonders if it will be him. But when Jaina pulls him through the door to Ralru's auxiliary pilot's ready room, he does his best to push the sadness and foreboding away. You can't be grim all the time. It's probably the best lesson he learned from Jaina, one for which he is eternally thankful. The ready room is empty except for two people sitting on the sofa in the far corner. Their bodies are angled toward each other, but their postures bespeak caution rather than intimacy. When Jag and Jaina enter, they both look up, startled out of an apparently personal conversation. Jag knows Tahiri Vila, the blonde girl, small and pretty except for the scars on her forehead, loved Jaina's younger brother Anakin, and has become something of an honorary member of the Solo family since his death. Despite the bonds she and Jaina share, 
Jack has always found Tahiri a little off-putting. Maybe it's because he is uncomfortable with grieving. Maybe it's because those scars, left by U.S. Hanvong shapers, hint at something more menacing behind her pretty face. Maybe it is because she does not speak plainly and seems suspicious of everything, including herself. He has never met the young man with the brown hair and trim beard before, but he can see Jaina in his eyes. Jason Solo rises to his feet and puts on a smile. So, Jason looks Jag up and down. I guess you're okay. Stop it. Jaina slaps him on the shoulder, giggling again. Jag, meet my brother Jason. Jason, meet Jag Fell. Nice to meet you, Jag extends a hand. He's never been good at meeting and greets and stumbles for something to say. You look good for a dead man. Thanks, Jason chuckles. You should have seen me a month ago. Jason sits back down next to Tahiri and Jaina and Jag plop onto the sofa facing them. Jaina sidles close and loops her arm around Jags in an open display of affection. He's not used to those, and he tries not to blush. Jag tries to keep his attention on Jason. He looks young and old at once, childlike but immensely serious. If Jane has come to possess a certain grimness, her brother has, perhaps in intensity. When Jason looks at him, Jag feels like he's being scrutinized somehow. So, Jag says, awkwardly keeping his gaze, I understand you were held captive by the U.S. and Vong for almost a year. Stang it, Jag. Jana shakes her head. He doesn't want to talk about that. I don't mind, Jason says, and Jag can't tell he's not being polite. It's like he actually doesn't mind talking about spending months being tortured by a race of ferocious genocidal aliens. Jag doesn't know what to make of that either. Let's talk about something else, Jana says. Jason, why haven't you gone off to Hapes yet? Tenoka would love to see you. Now it's Jason's turn to blush. He seems young and earnest again. I just haven't got around to it. Sorry. There's so much to do, with the war and all. Well, what about Danny Kui? Jag, you remember her from Borlius, right? Blonde, beautiful scientist. Very smart. She's on Mon Cal now, and she and Jason have been spending a lot of time together. Doing really serious stuff, like sunbathing and coral reefs, taking long walks along the esplanade at Hurricane City. It's not like that. Jason shakes his head. Jason, I know you can be pretty dense with these things, but trust your twin sister. It is like that. Tahiri laughs, but there's sadness in her eyes. She says, it's good to see you two together like this. It's almost like her expression wavers and her eyes gleam with tears. I'm sure he'd love to see you now. An awkward silence falls over the room. Jag tries to think if he's ever had a conversation like this with his surviving siblings, full of teasing and implications. With Wainsa sometimes, she's always been the most rebellious and rambunctious of the fell children, the one who refuses to be chained down by the strictures of Chis society. It's something he's always found alternately endearing and annoying about her. You're together again, Tahiri says firmly, blinking away her tears. There's nothing you can't do. I'd like to think so, Jason favors her with a soft smile. You're twins. Family, she says. There's nothing that can break that. Not all the Vong, Sith, or Madmen in the galaxy. Nothing. Chapter 7 Well, that settles it, Mary sighed. We're bored. Jagged fell still with his hands planted on his hips, scowling at the communications console. The auxiliary command room on Starless was a small space mostly used for emergency overrides and system checks. Now that space was crammed with people. He was on his feet, next to Trace Creefy. Mary Antilles and Thames Fodrick, the Wraith Squadron Communicatius expert, were crouched around the console from which, in theory, they should be able to start an ultra-encrypted type beam communication with Karuskin. Mary's sister Sial stood slightly apart. Her arms were crossed over her chest and a worried frown wrinkled her face. I don't understand, Sayal said. The console seems to be working. It is, Mary sighed. We've double and triple checked the systems. The signal is beamed via the Asfandia relay to Coruscant, correct? Creffy asked. 
when Thames nodded to Both and said, Well, perhaps we're simply sending it to the wrong place. We've double and triple checked our position against the star charts the Chiss have provided us, Jack said. The constellations are a perfect match. We know exactly where we are and where we are pointing the transmitter. We're just not getting a response. Could something have happened on Coruscant or Asfandia? Sayal asked gravely. Last we heard there was some civil unrest in the capital, but nothing that could have brought down the government, Thames shook his head. And according to Director Lauren, the system is rigged with an automated response at both stations. The only way to stop that would be to blow up one of the most secure buildings in the galaxy. It could be something simple, Myri offered. Some gases or weird interference that's not on our charts. Or it could be something wrong with Starless herself. She took some hurt during the fight in the nebula. We've been communicating regularly with Jaina on Zanima Second, Jagged said not to mention the other ships in the fleet. Short-range and long-range transmitters use different systems, Thames said. One could conk out without the other being affected. I'll authorize an EV team to check the communications arrays, Sial said. Very good, Jag nodded. I'll talk to Captain Pavrick and see if Karuska Jim has better luck. I suppose I can also contact Celestial and see if they have any idea what's blocking us. The others nodded but said nothing. Conversations with Wyansa had been tense lately, but he was hoping his sister would be amenable to this simple query. Thames ran a hand through his short hair, then raised it in the air. Okay, I've got a question. Why not jump out of the system and try a different location? Jagged fought a frown. The thought of separating the already beleaguered Trinity fleet was unappealing from a tactical standpoint. Leaving Jaina behind on the planet was even less so. We should double-check the communications arrays first. Sayal came to his rescue. We can make more informed decisions after that. Agreed. Creffy nodded and looked at Jag. What is the latest update from the planet? Our techs have just taken a preliminary review of the damaged hyperdrive system. I think Jaina's going to head out there and help. And the communications? Asked Thames. Short range is workable. Our people are also installing a long range beacon that will, hopefully, allow us to keep tabs on the planet for years to come. Sounds good to me, Mary sighed. Then we won't have to chase this criffing thing down every other decade. Indeed, Creffy grunted. Well, we should begin survey work. I'll get an EV crew ready. Sial looked at the two wraiths. I'll let you know when they're out. You can help provide diagnostics from this end. I, Captain, Mary tipped her sister an informal salute. Sayal nodded in reply, then walked out of the room, Creffy followed, and Jag followed him. When he got into the hallway, Sayal was already walking ahead at a clipped, determined pace. Jagged was still not used to how unlike the Antilli sisters were. Myrie, with her multicolored hair, casual demeanor, and party girl reputation, stood in stark contrast to Sayal's sober military reserve. It was a strange comparison to Jag's own sister. When he was young, he had been the determined, professional soldier, while Wen had exhibited a wild free spirit rarely seen in Chiss society. Jagged had never considered himself wild or free spirited, but twenty years later Wen seemed to see him that way, while she herself acted like the perfect Chiss naval officer. It didn't feel like their roles had been reversed, not exactly, but they had certainly changed. He thought, with a tinge of sadness, that things might have been different if Davin, Cheris, Jack, or Sim had survived. All of them, some of them, any of them, it didn't matter. Maybe then his family would seem less broken. You seem pensive, Creefy muttered. Jag realized he'd slowed his pace as he walked down the hall. Sorry, just feeling a little weak. Do you feel you've recovered from your ordeal on Phoenix? Creffy asked. As much as possible, I mean. Jag resisted the urge to touch the black patch strapped over his left eye. The patch still itched sometimes, and the strap pinched the skin of his forehead. His vision seemed strangely flat also, and he had to crane his head to the left more often. He would probably get used to it all eventually, just like his father had. He didn't know why the thought made him uneasy. 
I'm managing, Jack said at last. Thankfully, Creffy was walking on his right side. I'm still hoping to get a prosthetic once this is all over. Of course, Creffy said. The old Bothan looked like he wanted to say more, then trailed off. Are you all right? Jack asked. He didn't know how to approach Creffy. Fifteen years ago he'd served under the Bothan, looked up to him as an exemplary commander. Now his tactical mind still seemed sharp, but time had worn away the charisma and vigor that had made him such a good admiral. He was half hoping Creefy would brush aside his query, just as he had Creffy's. Instead, as they drew closer to the turbolift, the ex-admiral said, May we talk in private, Commander? Of course, Jag nodded. When the elevator arrived, he punched in the deck where his ready room was located. The two of them rode to their destination in awkward silence. Jag's ready room was about a quarter of the size of his office as Imperial Head of State, but he liked it more. The desk, the shelf of data pads, and the soft back chair were plain and informal. He pulled two chairs in front of the desk, sat down in one, and beckoned Creefy to do the same. The Bothan settled down in the chair opposite Jag. His violet eyes seemed to scour the room, resting on everything but Jag himself. May I ask what's bothering you, Admiral? I'm no Admiral, the Bothan shook his head. Still, said Jag, what is it? Creffy finally faced Jag, but his vision still hovered somewhere above the human shoulder. He asked, when you were captive aboard Phoenix, did you talk with Brenner Refcha? Ah, of course. The entire reason Creffy had joined them on this quest into the unknown regions was because his former protege was leading the renegade fleet. I did speak to him, though he wasn't in the room when Boba Fett did this to me. Jag pointed to his eye patch. That's more than I've done in, oh, at least four years, Creffy leaned forward. Tell me, how did he seem? Jagged though about that. Berevja had come to him and asked him to join the renegade fleet. It was the kind of obvious offer made to any prisoner, the carrot before the stick. When Jag refused, as they both knew he would, the stick came out. The threats of torture delivered not with malice or sadistic zest, but with the tone of reluctance. At first Jag had thought it feigned, but as he replayed the scene in memory, he began to suspect that Erefja had, in fact, been saddened and squeamish at the thought of torture. He seemed trapped, Jack said. Creffy ears twitched. I don't understand. No, not trapped. He seemed like he was scared. Like he was on a wild land speeder that was veering out of control and he was clinging on as hard as he could, because as dangerous as the ride is, falling off would be even worse. The edges of Creffy mouth drooped in a bothing frown. Bren isn't just alone for the ride. He is the ride. It's his land speeder. You have an experienced Nazi Dalla, Jack said dryly. But I think there was more than that. Can you tell me about Arefja, as you knew him? I've known him for some time, Creefy said guardedly. He was the finest officer I had during the war. Intelligent, dutiful, loyal. Everything we trained them to be at the academy. Was he with you on Ralrus? Early on, yes. He was with us at Ither. Though by the time you rejoined us, Commander, he had his own ship and was fighting the U.S. in Vong on the mid and outer rim. He saw many horrible things there. We all saw horrible things during the war. From what I saw of him, he still seemed like a model officer. That's why I had a hard time figuring out why he, of all the beings in the galaxy, went off to exterminate the Vong. We checked into his record. His family was on Batho the whole time, and they weren't harmed. Was there something specific that happened in the outer rim? Creffy looked down at his paws and gave a long, heavy sigh. Commander, what I am about to tell you is very personal. I would prefer if it doesn't leave this room. All right. Jack stiffened. Go on. Bren was not just my finest officer. He was almost my family. Your family? The Creffys are an illustrious clan, the old Bothan said. Many seek to marry into it in the hopes of basking in the favors our good name provides. But Bryn wasn't like that. He was very much in love with Evan. My sister? Jag searched his memory. I'm sorry. I didn't realize you had a sister. Of course not. You were on the far side of the galaxy when she died on Karuskin. 
Oh, I'm sorry, Admiral. I'm no Admiral, Creefy shook his head. But I was, of course, when I introduced Evan to my fine subordinate. Things progressed quickly. They became both very much in love. You're saying something changed in him after the fall of Karuskin. Something changed in all of us, Creffy said firmly. His violet eyes flicked up to hold Jags. When the Bothan government declared Arkray, total war against the U.S. involved, I was overjoyed. I wanted to make them pay for what they'd done to Karuskin, to Evan, even to my cousin. The combined clan's declaration was beautiful, because it lifted any cloak of moral responsibility and unleashed the inner predator within our race. I remember, Jack said evenly. For most of the time he spent aboard Rao Roost, Creffy had been an exuberant force, urging his men and women to hurt the U.S. Hinvong through any means possible. It had definitely helped overall morale, but inside Jag had shared the moral qualms his Jedi friends had expressed more openly. Creffy exhaled. The responsibilities of command and the quandary of putting an end to the war with minimal bloodshed forced me to temper the bloodlust I once had. Other Bothans, Bryn among them, continued to cultivate the race hatred of Arkray within their hearts. Not just Bothans, Jagged said. Hate is a hard thing to let go of. Not just hate, Creffy's eyes flared again. One of your sister, Commander Fell. One of the secrets she has locked away in Celestial's laboratory. Do you think those chismetics down on Zonima Second brought the Alpha Red Agent with them? She's given me assurance that she will not use it without consulting me first. And do you trust your sister? I also told her I would shoot her down if she tried. Answer my question. Do you trust her? His jaw clamped shut. He knew the answer, but it hurt too much to say it. Creffy shook his head. Evan and I were quite different, but we trusted one another. Those two Antilles girls, they trust each other. And love each other very deeply, I think. Jag didn't know if he loved Weinsa. He had once, when he'd been the strict one, and she'd been the keeper of his free spirit. Now the situation was reversed, or something close, and he did not like the parts of his past that seemed to have flowered in his sister. He said, we were not raised in a society that places value on love. Nor was I, Creffy nodded. But we do not have to be what our people expect us to be. We make our own choices. You and me, and Bryn. I know, Jagged exhaled a long, painful breath he hadn't known he was holding. What about a Arefja? When the time comes, when you and he meet again, what choice do you think he will make? I don't know, Creffy said sadly. But I am prepared to do whatever I have to for the sake of my mission. Jag nodded in wordless agreement. That was something he shared with Creefy, and with his sister too. She stood on the grassy hilltop bare feet on soft, damp earth, and wondered if she belonged here. Tahiri Villa had called a lot of places home. Tadwine, Yavin 4, Asis, even Coruscant, though the busy city world had never felt like a place where she belonged. She'd spent five years on Zanima II, helping Danny Kui and Hara bring peace to a shattered society while she helped men together her shattered self. Looking back, things had all started going downhill when she left Zanima II. Ever since she'd left, she'd been overcome by the desire to get back. Not just to the planet, but back further still, to those brief moments of youth when she'd had Anakin at her side and she capable of taking on the U.S. and Vong and the entire galaxy, so long as they were together. That overwhelming need to get back had pulled her ever deeper into desperation and darkness and made her do things the Tahiri whom Anakin had loved would never have condoned. Now she was here again. So much had changed, both on the planet and inside herself, but it still felt so very peaceful to stand on the crest of the hill overlooking the middle distance, admiring the endless rolling hills draped in borer trees, the gleam of distant lakes, the lazy passing, a fat white clouds across a vast blue sky. It was almost enough to make her forget the things she'd done since she last stood here. Almost. Jaina had left that morning for the hyperdrives, taking with her Mando buddies and most of Wraith Squadron. That left Tahiri in town with Danny, Horror, and most troubling of all, Ben Skywalker. Ben himself wasn't troubled, not anymore. That was what troubled Tahiri. 
He'd explained to her and Jaina both the encounter he'd had in the forest, first with Zanima's second materialized as a child, and then with his deceased mother. He'd been certain, dead certain, that the image of Mara Jade had been a real force specter, not another projection of seconds. Somehow she must have been summoned by the living planet itself. And that was worrying on many levels. If Sekhet had summoned the ghost of Mara J. Skywalker, perhaps pulling on some tether of their previous meeting, who else would follow? Jason Solo, the enigmatic Vergeer. Was it possible, however unlikely, that the planet might summon the ghost of Anakin Solo? The very thought had made Tahiri's chest tighten. She'd gone for a long walk to sort out her thoughts, but as she stared at the forests and hills, cool breeze sting in her face, she was no closer to an answer. She didn't know what she'd prefer, seeing Anakin or not seeing him. He'd been the bright center of her life, and everything since his death, even the five years of healing on Zanima II, had been poisoned by his bittersweet memory. Their brief time as lovers, between the fall of Yavin IV and the mission to Mirker, had been the peak of her life, and everything else was just a long downhill walk, constantly looking over her shoulder at the heights she'd climbed down from. How could she face Anakin, after all the things she'd done? How could she tell him what Jason Solo had turned into, let alone what horrible things Tahiri had done to help Anakin's brother? How could she explain that she had killed and tortured and betrayed the people who loved her, all because of her awful desperate need just to spend a little more time with the boy she'd loved half a life ago? Anakin would probably forgive her. Anakin could forgive everything. He was greater even than Ben Skywalker in his capacity for understanding, love, and forgiveness. Tahiri did not have that capability. Regret, like the memory of Anakin, was just something she had to live with now. The soft earth was still a comfort beneath her bare feet. When she'd first come to Yavin Fort to train as a Jedi, she'd insisted on going everywhere barefoot, even the messy jungle. It was something she'd never experienced on Tatooine, and every step brought new sensation, discovery. Growing older, she'd slowly weaned herself off the practice, and after joining herself with Nan Yim's implanted memories, she'd given it up entirely. But over time, she started going barefoot again. She hadn't thought much about it at first, but looking back she realized it must have been an unconscious attempt to get back just a bit of what she'd lost from her youth, a minor, benign version of the same urge that had dragged her down Darth Kedis's wake. Realizing that, she tried to get back in the habit of wearing boots again, but right here, right now, on this grassy hilltop, it felt wrong not to touch this world any way she could. She was pondering the beautiful scene when she heard someone call her name behind her. She turned and looked down the hill toward the town. A tall blonde woman, hair bound at the nape of her neck, was walking toward her, followed by a U.S. Hinvong dressed not in the organic fibers or light armor common to his people, but a synthetic gray jumpsuit. Picking up her boots with one hand, Tahiri stepped off the hilltop and walked down the slope. A large cloud passed overhead, obscuring the sun. There you are, Jasmine Tainer said. I heard you were still in town. It's good to see you again, both of you, Tahiri said, and she meant it. On board Starless, she spent time with both Jasmine and the human raised U.S. Hinvong, Scud. She found herself identifying with Jasmine's wandering life, Jedi dropout, Antarian ranger, bounty hunter, wraith operative, and with Scud's conflicted human U.S. Hinvong nature, and was glad to have both of them here. Besides, they were a distraction from worrying about the dead. I thought most of your people went with Jaina, she said. They did. Jasmine put her hands on her hips, nudging the lightsaber attached to her belt. It's just us. Shar wanted me to watch the comm system while Scut got acquainted. Tahiri looked at the U.S. and Vaughn. She had half a guess as to what he was feeling now, like he was at once coming home and wandering into something more alien than he could possibly imagine. She asked, well, how is it? Scut's face? Gray and smooth, bereft of the tattoos and scars typical of his people, seemed even more childlike as he looked around the hillside. Finally, his eyes settled on Tahiri, and he said, I should have come a long time ago. She smiled and crossed her arms over her chest. Well, you're here now. 
What do you think? I think, I have so much to learn. I have spent some time on one of their demudex, with some of their shapers. They have been working to stabilize the biosphere after the damage from the last jump. The things they've discovered, comparing second in biology to U.S. involved life, it is fascinating. I'm surprised more scientists did not come here before. The U.S. involved like their privacy, Tahiri reminded him. So does second. Yes, I understand. Scott looked a little sullen. They are unsure what to do with me. I am like them, but not like them at all. And they seem strange to me as well. That's only natural, Tahiri said softly. But they are part of you. Even the things that seem strange are ugly. Denying that can only hurt you. Believe me. I do. And I think I am getting used to it slowly. Well, relax, Jasmine Grand. You've only been here less than a day. Who knows how much time we will have. Scott looked up at the clouds drifting overhead like he was trying to see the stars and the fleets beyond. Come on, Tahiri said as a strong breeze chilled her. Let's go back to the town. They agreed, and after Tahiri put her boots on, they walked down the hill through the long blowing grass until they were amidst the clusters of low-domed buildings. They had been grown with no discernible pattern. The streets were winding and haphazard, usually unpaved. It was unlike Karuskin in every way and that was enough to make Tahiri feel better. When they returned to Danny Key's building, they found the Magister sitting down on the floor, talking quietly to Horror and Ben. The red-haired young man looked up and asked, Where'd you find her? Up on a hill, taken in the view, Jasmine replied. Did you need me for something? Tahiri asked, looking from Danny to Horror. The old U.S. Vong priest bobbed his head. Perhaps. We were speaking with your young friend, Scut, about Shaper's matters. The Magister is very knowledgeable, Scut nodded. Well, I was a scientist in a past life, Danny laughed softly. I thought you were an astrophysicist, Ben said. I was, Danny said. Her smile wilted. Then I had to, adapt. The Magister was the first of your galaxy to encounter the Praetorite Vong, Horror said grimly. At least, the only one of that initial group to survive. The fact that she has found it in her heart to forgive us, to stay with us. Danny reached out and placed a palm on his gray brittle hand. It's all right. I'm happy with what happened. Tahiri wasn't sure about that. Danny betrayed palpable irritation at having been ignored by Second, and clearly blamed herself in part for the departure of the True Honor faction. Despite all that, the smile on her face was genuine. There was no place in the galaxy Danny Kui would rather be than Zanima Second. Tahiri took a seat on the carpet. Ben and Danny scooted slightly to make room for Scut and Jasmine. So, Tahiri asked, What did you need me for? A possibility has occurred to us. Horror fixed her with his dark, deep set eyes. I trust Jana Solo and your technicians from the Alliance to fix the hyperdrive machinery. However, that may not be enough. Tahiri raised an eyebrow. What do you mean? This world is part natural, part mechanical, Scut said. Everything stays in balance. It works despite those differences. Those hyperdrives might not work unless the natural and the biological are working in sync. Haven't your shapers already looked at the hyperdrive? They have, said Harar, and they are at the site now. However, just as our working mechanics were not enough, so our shapers might need additional help. Tahiri stared at Scott. The U.S. Hinvong was a brilliant amateur biologist, but he only had a day's experience with Zanima Second. Sensing her thoughts, Scott shook his head. Not me. She suggested we find someone else. Someone hard to get to. Tahiri's jaw dropped. She stared at horror. You can't be serious. Not her. Horror nodded. She is our most brilliant shaper. She's a war criminal, Tahiri said harshly. As the last master shaper during the U.S. Hinvong War, Kila Quad had created horrible monstrosities that claimed thousands of alliance lives, most notably the horrible armored slayer soldiers who had defended Shimmer's palace. Beneath her obvious revulsion, Tahiri held a still deeper resentment to Kila Quad. 
It had been her relative, Mezhin Quad, who had captured Tahiri on Yavin 4 all those years ago, cut into her brain, and filled it with the memories of so-called Rena Quad. Tahiri had thanked her by cutting her head from her shoulders. Kila Quad was a great help to us immediately after the war, Har reminded her. She helped grow new towns like the one we are in now. For a couple years, then she went crazy and wandered off into the mountains. Do we even know where she is? We have reports, Danny spoke up. It seems that she hadn't left her Demudek in the Blue Mountains in over ten years. Sith spawn. Tahiri shook her head. Traipsing through the forest to try and recruit a mad shaper, one who had already brought so much pain to the galaxy, was not what she expected to be doing today. Honestly, I'd have thought she'd have joined True Honor. Not her, Har said. It was her successor as Master Shaper, Vilith Dao. Tahiri remembered him. Tall, proud, intelligent. He'd also kept to himself, and Tahiri had never gotten a good read on him. Do you know if he had any contact with Ki Laquad before he left with True Honor? She asked. None that we could see, Danny said, then added, I admit we could have kept better watch on him, though. What's past is past, Har consoled. Right now we have to look to the future. And the future involves Ki Laquad. Ask Tahiri, still skeptical. It well might, said Har. Our situation is dire. I believe it is worth trying. Tahiri looked to Danny for appeal, but the Magister nodded in agreement. Okay, Tahiri sighed. She looked at Scott. Pack your kit, then. I guess we're going on a trip. We will send the guy with you, said Harar. Be my guest. Tahiri rose to her feet, as did Scott and Jasmine. As Ben stood up, he asked, Where do I fit in in all this? You should stay in town, Ben, Tahiri said, and glanced at Jasmine. You too. Watch over the comm system. Help Danny and Hara with whatever they need. Keep in touch with Jaina. Sounds good, Jasmine nodded. She clearly had no desire to go trekking through the Blue Mountains. As the four of them started for the door, Danny said, Tahiri, could you wait a moment? Tahiri had a feeling this conversation was also going to be awkward, but she said, sure. Go on ahead, guys. Scud, I'll meet you at the comm center. Scud nodded and left. Jasmine followed, then Ben. Tahiri watched his face for some hint of the coming conversation, but he seemed to know nothing. When they were gone, she sat back down on the carpet with Danny and Har. Well, she asked, placing her hands on her knees. We have heard from Ben that he saw his mother in the forest, Danny said evenly. He said that second appeared as a child and guided him to her. If that's what Ben says, I believe him. Danny nodded, though she looked unhappy that second had, again, appeared to manifest itself to someone other than her. She said, Tahiri, what happened to Mara Jade? What happened to Jason Solo? There was the obvious question, the one she knew was coming but prayed she wouldn't have to answer. But now Danny and Hara were staring at her, expectant, needing. She had no right to hide this information from them. She trusted them with her life. She could certainly trust them with the truth, even an awful one. Please, said Harar. Tell us how such great Jedi could fall. Tahiri closed her eyes, exhaled. Then she told them everything. She told them about how Jason had changed after his five-year journey to discover new things about the Force. She spoke of the Swarm War, and how he'd tricked his fellow Jedi into a preemptive attack on the Chiss. Then came the Corellian Crisis and the Second Civil War. She talked about how Jason had trained Ben in the Galactic Alliance Guard, taking him on secret police raids. She said that Jason sought to bring peace to the galaxy by apprenticing himself to a Sith named Lumia, and that when Mara Jade found out she went after Jason to kill him. Jason had, in turn, killed his aunt and become Darth Kedis. Then she told how them Kedis had taken control of the Alliance, turning it into an instrument of terror just like his grandfather had, until he was hunted down and killed by his own sister. The one bright light in all of this was Jason's daughter Alana, born from his hidden lover and childhood friend Tenoka. Tahiri did not talk about her own role in this, 
how her desire to see Anakin and her longtime friendship with Jason had turned her into a Sith which who murdered old men and helped less prisoners. She could only say so much. When she was done, Danny Kui was weeping silently. Hera's eyes were black marbles in his ashen face. Now you understand, she told them. Her eyes and throat were dry. Jaina doesn't talk about him, ever. Ben, Ben strong, but he's lost so much. I had no idea, Danny croaked. I wish, I wish I could have seen him one last time. I wish I could have told him. Tahiri only nodded. The pain of words left unsaid had haunted her half her life. It all makes sense now, a soft voice said behind them. All three heads spun to see a teenage girl with three scars on her forehead perched on one of the shelves jutting from the Demutic wall. Tahiri stared. It was her, and yet not. Fifteen years ago, when she first come here, she had been battered but unbroken, confused but seeking clarity, hopeful despite all she'd lost. She'd been smooth-skinned and bright-eyed and barefooted. Staring at the image before her was like seeing the clock turn back on half her life. Second, Danny's voice broke. She sounded like she was about to cry again. You're back. You're really? The image of young Tahiri held up a hand. It's all right, Danny. Really. I haven't forgotten you. Something rattled in Tahiri's chest. It felt so strange to hear your own voice. What I thought Danny stuttered, you just went away, and I thought you were angry. Or, I'm sad, the living world said. There's so much in this universe to be sad about. So much hatred. Pain. Loss. None of it is fair. But we have to keep moving, or we'll be stuck in the past forever. Second, Tahiri said, then froze. She wanted to know why the living world had chosen her image to appear as. The image of her past self, still unbroken by Darth Kedis, filled her with awful, aching nostalgia to go back to what was. Standing before her now was the image of everything she'd longed to return to for the past 15 years, everything she'd gone dark in the hope of getting back. How did you bring forth the ghost of Mara J. Skywalker? Horror asked behind her. You can't see her. Tahiri jerked in shock. Second projected images through the Force. Hara could not touch the Force and should not have been able to see this projection. In the past, whenever Second had wished to speak to the U.S. Hanvong, it had spoken directly through the mouths of Danny or the old magister, Jabatha. Tahiri watched her younger self chuckle and hop off the shelf. The shelf creaked with the alleviation of weight and two bare feet slapped softly on the floor. That's impossible, Tahiri gaped. How did he? I've been discovering new things about myself lately, her simulacrum said. I've learned to touch the force in new ways, even manipulate matter so my children can better see me. So, if I touched you? What about Mara J. Skywalker? Hara asked. That is something else I've been learning. The girl's face smiled ambiguously. The line between life and death is never absolute, not with the Force. Could you Tahiri's words caught? She couldn't say it, couldn't ask it. She felt as pathetic, needy, and helpless as she had before Darth Kedis. She was like a spice addict dreaming of a fix. Just the thought, the hope of touching Anakin's spirit threatened to ruin her again. Her own face smiled knowingly. It's all right, Tahiri. And Danny, and horror. I haven't forgotten about you. But there's so much happening. Danny said. There's a fleet out there trying to kill us. And true honor they. It doesn't matter, Second said firmly. What I'm doing is more important. More important. Spat Danny. There are hundreds of thousands of beings on this planet. Beings who trust you, need you, worship you. I haven't forgotten them, the young Tahiri said. But recent trauma has. Awaken things in me. I can see things now. Beyond life and death. Past and present. Good and evil. I wonder if this is how Jason felt when he saved the galaxy from Anami. A strange, sad smile appeared on the girl's face. A dragon is coming. He won't fall easily. I have to be prepared. A dragon. Danny said. What dragon? Second. I don't understand. Don't worry, Magister. The world said, you will. 
and then the girl was gone. Like she'd never been there at all. An awful silence fell over the room. Danny choked back more tears. Horror lowered his head and looked very, very tired. And Tahiri did not know what to feel. Confusion, hope, desire, despair, and a painful nostalgia all warred within her. She'd come to second thinking it might be a place of refuge from all her regrets, all she'd done in the past five years. Instead it had brought her face to face with them all. Chapter 8 Well, that settles it, Mary sighed. We're bored. Jagged fell stood with his hands planted on his hips, scowling at the communications console. The auxiliary command room on Starless was a small space, mostly used for emergency overrides and system checks. Now that space was crammed with people. He was on his feet, next to Trace Creefy. Mary Antilles and Thames Fodrick, the Wraith Squadron Communicatius expert, were crouched around the console from which, in theory, they should be able to start an ultra-encrypted type beam communication with Karuskin. Mary's sister Sial stood slightly apart. Her arms were crossed over her chest and a worried frown wrinkled her face. I don't understand, Sial said. The console seems to be working. It is, Mary sighed. We've double and triple checked the systems. The signal is beamed via the Asfandia relay to Coruscant, correct? Creffy asked. When Thames nodded, the bot and said, Well, perhaps we're simply sending it to the wrong place. We've double and triple checked our position against the star charts the Chiss have provided us, Jack said. The constellations are a perfect match. We know exactly where we are and where we're pointing the transmitter. We're just not getting a response. Could something have happened on Coruscant or Asfandia? Sayal asked gravely. Last we heard there was some civil unrest in the capital, but nothing that could have brought down the government, Thames shook his head. And according to Director Lauren, the system is rigged with an automated response at both stations. The only way to stop that would be to blow up one of the most secure buildings in the galaxy. It could be something simple, Myrie offered. Some gases or weird interference that's not on our charts. Or it could be something wrong with Starless herself. She took some hurt during the fight in the nebula. We've been communicating regularly with Jaina on Zanima Second, Jagged said, not to mention the other ships in the fleet. Short-range and long-range transmitters use different systems, Thames said. One could conk out without the other being affected. I'll authorize an EV team to check the communications arrays. Sial said. Very good, Jag nodded. I'll talk to Captain Pavrick and see if Karuska Jim has better luck. I suppose I can also contact Celestial and see if they have any idea what's blocking us. The others nodded but said nothing. Conversations with Wyansa had been tense lately, but he was hoping his sister would be amenable to this simple query. Thames ran a hand through his short hair, then raised it in the air. Okay. I've got a question. Why not jump out of the system and try a different location? Jagged fought a frown. The thought of separating the already beleaguered Trinity fleet was unappealing from a tactical standpoint. Leaving Jaina behind on the planet was even less so. We should double check the communications arrays first. Sayal came to his rescue. We can make more informed decisions after that. Agreed. Creffy nodded and looked at Jag. What is the latest update from the planet? Our techs have just taken a preliminary review of the damaged hyperdrive system. I think Jane is going to head out there and help. And the communications? Asked Thames. Short range is workable. Our people are also installing a long range beacon that will, hopefully, allow us to keep tabs on the planet for years to come. Sounds good to me, Mary sighed. Then we won't have to chase this criffing thing down every other decade. Indeed, Creffy grunted. Well, we should begin survey work. I'll get an EV crew ready. Sayal looked at the two wraiths. I'll let you know when they're out. You can help provide diagnostics from this end. I, Captain, Mary tipped her sister an informal salute. Sayal nodded in reply, then walked out of the room. Creffy followed, and Jag followed him. When he got into the hallway, Sayal was already walking ahead at a clip determined pace. Jagged was still not used to how unlike the Antilles sisters were. Myrie, with her multicolored hair, 
casual demeanor, and party girl reputation stood in stark contrast to Sayal's sober military reserve. It was a strange comparison to Jag's own sister. When he was young, he had been the determined, professional soldier, while Wen had exhibited a wild free spirit rarely seen in Chis society. Jagged had never considered himself wild or free-spirited, but twenty years later Wen seemed to see him that way, while she herself acted like the perfect Chis naval officer. It didn't feel like their roles had been reversed, not exactly, but they had certainly changed. He thought, with a tinge of sadness, that things might have been different if Davin, Cheris, Jack, or Sim had survived. All of them, some of them, any of them, it didn't matter. Maybe then his family would seem less broken. You seem pensive, Creefy muttered. Jag realized he'd slowed his pace as he walked down the hall. Sorry, just feeling a little weak. Do you feel you've recovered from your ordeal on Phoenix? Creffy asked. As much as possible, I mean. Jag resisted the urge to touch the black patch strapped over his left eye. The patch still itched sometimes, and the strap pinched the skin of his forehead. His vision seemed strangely flat also, and he had to crane his head to the left more often. He would probably get used to it all eventually, just like his father had. He didn't know why the thought made him uneasy. I'm managing, Jag said at last. Thankfully, Creffy was walking on his right side. I'm still hoping to get a prosthetic once this is all over. Of course, Creffy said. The old Bothan looked like he wanted to say more, then trailed off. Are you all right? Jack asked. He didn't know how to approach Creffy. Fifteen years ago he'd served under the Bothan, looked up to him as an exemplary commander. Now his tactical mind still seemed sharp, but time had worn away the charisma and vigor that had made him such a good admiral. He was half hoping Creefy would brush aside his query, just as he had Creffy's. Instead, as they drew closer to the turbolift, the ex-admiral said, May we talk in private, Commander? Of course, Jag nodded. When the elevator arrived, he punched in the deck where his ready room was located. The two of them rode to their destination in awkward silence. Jag's ready room was about a quarter of the size of his office as Imperial Head of State, but he liked it more. The desk, the shelf of data pads, and the soft back chair were plain and informal. He pulled two chairs in front of the desk, sat down in one, and beckoned Creefy to do the same. The Bothan settled down in the chair opposite Jag. His violet eyes seemed to scour the room, resting on everything but Jag himself. May I ask what's bothering you, Admiral? I'm no Admiral, the Bothan shook his head. Still, said Jag, what is it? Creffy finally faced Jag, but his vision still hovered somewhere above the human shoulder. He asked, when you were captive aboard Phoenix, did you talk with Bren or Refcha? Ah, of course. The entire reason Creffy had joined them on this quest into the unknown regions was because his former protege was leading the renegade fleet. I did speak to him, though he wasn't in the room when Boba Fett did this to me. Jag pointed to his eye patch. That's more than I've done in, oh. At least four years, Creffy leaned forward. Tell me, how did he seem? Jagged though about that. Berevja had come to him and asked him to join the renegade fleet. It was the kind of obvious offer made to any prisoner, the carrot before the stick. When Jag refused, as they both knew he would, the stick came out. The threats of torture delivered not with malice or sadistic zest, but with the tone of reluctance. At first Jag had thought it feigned. But as he replayed the scene in memory, he began to suspect that Erefcha had, in fact, been saddened and squeamish at the thought of torture. He seemed trapped, Jack said. Creffy ears twitched. I don't understand. No, not trapped. He seemed like he was scared. Like he was on a wild land speeder that was veering out of control and he was clinging on as hard as he could, because as dangerous as the ride is, falling off would be even worse. The edges of Creffy's mouth drooped in a Bothan frown. Bren isn't just along for the ride. He is the ride. It's his land speeder. You have an experienced Nadasi Dalla, Jack said dryly. But I think there was more than that. Can you tell me about Arefja, as you knew him? I've known him for some time, Creffy said guardedly. 
He was the finest officer I had during the war. Intelligent, dutiful, loyal. Everything we trained them to be at the academy. Was he with you on Ralroost? Early on, yes. He was with us at Ither. Though by the time you rejoined us, Commander, he had his own ship and was fighting the U.S. and Vong on the mid and outer rim. He saw many horrible things there. We all saw horrible things during the war. From what I saw of him, he still seemed like a model officer. That's why I had a hard time figuring out why he, of all the beings in the galaxy, went off to exterminate the Vong. We checked into his record. His family was on Batho the whole time, and they weren't harmed. Was there something specific that happened in the outer rim? Creffy looked down at his paws and gave a long, heavy sigh. Commander, what I am about to tell you is very personal. I would prefer if it doesn't leave this room. All right. Jack stiffened. Go on. Bren was not just my finest officer. He was almost my family. Your family? The Creffys are an illustrious clan, the old Bothan said. Many seek to marry into it in the hopes of basking in the favors our good name provides. But Bryn wasn't like that. He was very much in love with Evan. My sister? Jack searched his memory. I'm sorry, I didn't realize you had a sister. Of course not. You were on the far side of the galaxy when she died on Karuskin. Oh, I'm sorry, Admiral. I'm no Admiral, Creefy shook his head. But I was, of course, when I introduced Evan to my fine subordinate. Things progressed quickly. They became both very much in love. You're saying something changed in him after the fall of Karuskin. Something changed in all of us, Creffy said firmly. His violet eyes flicked up to hold Jags. When the Bothan government declared Arkray, total war against the U.S. and Vong, I was overjoyed. I wanted to make them pay for what they'd done to Karuskin, to Evan, even to my cousin. The combined clan's declaration was beautiful, because it lifted any cloak of moral responsibility and unleashed the inner predator within our race. I remember, Jack said evenly. For most of time he spent aboard Ralroost, Creffy had been an exuberant force, urging his men and women to hurt the U.S. and Vong through any means possible. It had definitely helped overall morale, but inside Jag had shared the moral qualms his Jedi friends had expressed more openly. Creffy exhaled. The responsibilities of command, and the quandary of putting an end to the war with minimal bloodshed, forced me to temper the bloodlust I once had. Other Bothans, Bryn among them, continued to cultivate the race hatred of Arkray within their hearts. Not just Bothans, Jagged said. Hate is a hard thing to let go of. Not just hate, Creffy's eyes flared again. One of your sister, Commander Fell. One of the secrets she has locked away in Celestial's laboratory. Do you think those chismetics down on Zonima Second brought the Alpha Red Agent with them? She's given me assurance that she will not use it without consulting me first. And do you trust your sister? I also told her I would shoot her down if she tried. Answer my question. Do you trust her? His jaw clamped shut. He knew the answer, but it hurt too much to say it. Creffy shook his head. Evan and I were quite different, but we trusted one another. Those two Antilles girls, they trust each other. And love each other very deeply, I think. Jag didn't know if he loved Winson. He had once, when he'd been the strict one, and she'd been the keeper of his free spirit. Now the situation was reversed or something close, and he did not like the parts of his past that seemed to have flowered in his sister. He said, we were not raised in a society that places value on love. Nor was I, Creffy nodded. But we do not have to be what our people expect us to be. We make our own choices. You and me, and Bren. I know Jagged exhaled a long, painful breath he hadn't known he was holding. What about a refuge? When the time comes, when you and he meet again, what choice do you think he will make? I don't know, Creffy said sadly, but I am prepared to do whatever I have to for the sake of my mission. Jag nodded in wordless agreement. That was something he shared with Creffy, and with his sister too. She stood on the grassy hilltop, bare feet on soft damp earth, and wondered if she belonged here. Tahiri Villa had called a lot of places home. Tatooine, Yavin 4, Asis, 
even Coruscant, though the busy city world had never felt like a place where she belonged. She'd spent five years on Zanima II, helping Danny Kui and Hara bring peace to a shattered society while she helped men together her shattered self. Looking back, things had all started going downhill when she left Zanima II. Ever since she'd left, she'd been overcome by the desire to get back. Not just to the planet, but back further still, to those brief moments of youth when she'd had Anakin at her side and she capable of taking on the U.S. involved and the entire galaxy, so long as they were together. That overwhelming need to get back had pulled her ever deeper into desperation and darkness and made her do things the Tahiri whom Anakin had loved would never have condoned. Now she was here again. So much had changed, both on the planet and inside herself, but it still felt so very peaceful to stand on the crest of the hill overlooking the middle distance, admiring the endless rolling hills draped in borer trees, the gleam of distant lakes, the lazy passing, a fat white clouds across a vast blue sky. It was almost enough to make her forget the things she'd done since she last stood here. Almost. Jaina had left that morning for the hyperdrives, taken with her Mando buddies and most of Wraith Squadron. That left Tahiri in town with Danny, Horror, and most troubling of all, Ben Skywalker. Ben himself wasn't troubled, not anymore. That was what troubled Tahiri. He'd explained to her and Jaina both the encounter he'd had in the forest, first with Zanima second materialized as a child, and then with his deceased mother. He'd been certain, dead certain, that the image of Mara Jade had been a real for Spectre not another projection of seconds. Somehow she must have been summoned by the living planet itself. And that was worrying on many levels. If Second had summoned the ghost of Mara J. Skywalker, perhaps pulling on some tether of their previous meeting, who else would follow? Jason Solo, the enigmatic Vergeer. Was it possible, however unlikely, that the planet might summon the ghost of Anakin Solo? The very thought had made Tahiri's chest tighten. She'd gone for a long walk to sort out her thoughts, but as she stared at the forests and hills, cool breeze sting in her face, she was no closer to an answer. She didn't know what she'd prefer, seeing Anakin or not seeing him. He'd been the bright center of her life, and everything since his death, even the five years of healing on Zanima II, had been poisoned by his bittersweet memory. Their brief time as lovers, between the fall of Yavin 4 and the mission to Mirker, had been the peak of her life, and everything else was just a long downhill walk, constantly looking over her shoulder at the heights she'd climbed down from. How could she face Anakin, after all the things she'd done? How could she tell him what Jason Solo had turned into, let alone what horrible things Tahiri had done to help Anakin's brother? How could she explain that she had killed and tortured and betrayed the people who loved her, all because of her awful desperate need just to spend a little more time with the boy she'd loved half a life ago. Anakin would probably forgive her. Anakin could forgive everything. He was greater even than Ben Skywalker in his capacity for understanding, love, and forgiveness. Tahiri did not have that capability. Regret, like the memory of Anakin, was just something she had to live with now. The soft earth was still a comfort beneath her bare feet. When she'd first come to Yavin 4 to train as a Jedi, She'd insisted on going everywhere barefoot, even the messy jungle. It was something she'd never experienced on Tatooine, and every step brought new sensation, discovery. Growing older, she'd slowly weaned herself off the practice, and after joining herself with Nan Yim's implanted memories, she'd given it up entirely. But over time, she started going barefoot again. She hadn't thought much about it at first, but looking back she realized it must have been an unconscious attempt to get back just a bit of what she'd lost from her youth, a minor, benign version of the same urge that had dragged her down Darth Kedis' wake. Realizing that, she tried to get back in the habit of wearing boots again, but right here, right now, on this grassy hilltop, it felt wrong not to touch this world any way she could. She was pondering the beautiful scene when she heard someone call her name behind her. She turned and looked down the hill toward the town. A tall blonde woman, hair bound at the nape of her neck, was walking toward her, followed by a U.S. Hinvong dressed not in the organic fibers or light armor common to his people, but a synthetic gray jumpsuit. Picking up her boots with one hand, 
Tahiri stepped off the hilltop and walked down the slope. A large cloud passed overhead, obscuring the sun. There you are, Jasmine Tainer said. I heard you were still in town. It's good to see you again, both of you, Tahiri said, and she meant it. On board Starless, she spent time with both Jasmine and the human raised you as Hinvong, Scud. She found herself identifying with Jasmine's wandering life, Jedi dropout, Antarian ranger, bounty hunter, wraith operative, and with Scud's conflicted human you as Hinvong nature, and was glad to have both of them here. Besides, they were a distraction from worrying about the dead. I thought most of your people went with Jaina, she said. They did, Jasmine put her hands on her hips, nudging the lightsaber attached to her belt. It's just us. Shar wanted me to watch the comm system while Scut got acquainted. Tahiri looked at the U.S. and Vaughn. She had half a guess as to what he was feeling now, like he was at once coming home and wandering into something more alien than he could possibly imagine. She asked, well, how is it? Scut's face, gray and smooth, bereft of the tattoos and scars typical of his people, seemed even more childlike as he looked around the hillside. Finally, his eyes settled on Tahiri, and he said, I should have come a long time ago. She smiled and crossed her arms over her chest. Well, you're here now. What do you think? I think, I have so much to learn. I have spent some time on one of their demudex, with some of their shapers. They have been working to stabilize the biosphere after the damage from the last jump. The things they've discovered, comparing second in biology to U.S. involved life, it is fascinating. I'm surprised more scientists did not come here before. The U.S. involved like their privacy, Tahiri reminded him. So does second. Yes, I understand. Scut looked a little sullen. They are unsure what to do with me. I am like them, but not like them at all. And they seem strange to me as well. That's only natural, Tahiri said softly. But they are part of you. Even the things that seem strange are ugly. Denying that can only hurt you. Believe me. I do. And I think I am getting used to it slowly. Well, relax, Jessamine Grand. You've only been here less than a day. Who knows how much time we will have. Scott looked up at the clouds drifting overhead, like he was trying to see the stars and the fleets beyond. Come on, Tahiri said as a strong breeze chilled her. Let's go back to the town. They agreed, and after Tahiri put her boots on, they walked down the hill through the long blowing grass until they were amidst the clusters of low-domed buildings. They had been grown with no discernible pattern. The streets were winding and haphazard, usually unpaved. It was unlike Karuskin in every way, and that was enough to make Tahiri feel better. When they returned to Danny Key's building, they found the Magister sitting down on the floor, talking quietly to Horror and Ben. The red-haired young man looked up and asked, Where'd you find her? Up on a hill, taken in the view, Jasmine replied. Did you need me for something? Tahiri asked looking from Danny to horror. The old U.S. Vong priest bobbed his head. Perhaps. We were speaking with your young friend, Scut, about Shaper's matters. The Magister is very knowledgeable, Scut nodded. Well, I was a scientist in a past life, Danny laughed softly. I thought you were an astrophysicist, Ben said. I was, Danny said. Her smile wilted. Then I had to, adapt. The Magister was the first of your galaxy to encounter the Praetorite Vong, Hara said grimly. At least, the only one of that initial group to survive. The fact that she has found it in her heart to forgive us, to stay with us. Danny reached out and placed a palm on his gray brittle hand. It's all right. I'm happy with what happened. Tahiri wasn't sure about that. Danny betrayed palpable irritation at having been ignored by Second and clearly blamed herself in part for the departure of the True Honor faction. Despite all that, the smile on her face was genuine. There was no place in the galaxy Danny Kui would rather be than Zanam a second. Tahiri took a seat on the carpet. Ben and Danny scooted slightly to make room for Scut and Jasmine. So, Tahiri asked, What did you need me for? A possibility has occurred to us. Horror fixed her with his dark, 
deep set eyes. I trust Jaina Solo and your technicians from the Alliance to fix the hyperdrive machinery. However, that may not be enough. Tahiri raised an eyebrow. What do you mean? This world is part natural, part mechanical, Scut said. Everything stays in balance. It works despite those differences. Those hyperdrives might not work unless the natural and the biological are working in sync. Haven't your shapers already looked at the hyperdrive? They have, said Harar, and they are at the site now. However, just as our working mechanics were not enough, so our shapers might need additional help. Tahiri stared at Scut. The U.S. Hinvong was a brilliant amateur biologist, but he only had a day's experience with Zanam a second. Sensing her thoughts, Scut shook his head. Not me. She suggested we find someone else. Someone hard to get to. Tahiri's jaw dropped. She stared at horror. You can't be serious. Not her. Horror nodded. She is our most brilliant shaper. She's a war criminal, Tahiri said harshly. As the last master shaper during the U.S. Hinvong War, Kila Quad had created horrible monstrosities that claimed thousands of Alliance lives, most notably the horrible armored slayer soldiers who had defended Shimmer's palace. Beneath her obvious revulsion, Tahiri held a still deeper resentment to Kila Quad. It had been her relative, Mezhin Quad, who had captured Tahiri on Yavin 4 all those years ago, cut into her brain, and filled it with the memories of so-called Rena Quad. Tahiri had thanked her by cutting her head from her shoulders. Kila Quad was a great help to us immediately after the war, Hara reminded her. She helped grow new towns like the one we are in now. For a couple years, then she went crazy and wandered off into the mountains. Do we even know where she is? We have reports, Danny spoke up. It seems that she hadn't left her Demudek in the Blue Mountains in over ten years. Sith Spawn. Tahiri shook her head. Traipsing through the forest to try and recruit a mad shaper, one who had already brought so much pain to the galaxy, was not what she expected to be doing today. Honestly, I'd have thought she'd have joined True Honor. Not her, Har said. It was her successor as Master Shaper, Vilith Dal. Tahiri remembered him. Tall, proud, intelligent. He'd also kept to himself, and Tahiri had never gotten a good read on him. Do you know if he had any contact with Key Laquad before he left with True Honor? She asked. None that we could see, Danny said, then added, I admit we could have kept better watch on him, though. What's past is past, Hara consoled. Right now we have to look to the future. And the future involves Key Laquad. Asked Tahiri, still skeptical. It well might, said Hara. Our situation is dire. I believe it is worth trying. Tahiri looked to Danny for appeal, but the Magister nodded in agreement. Okay, Tahiri sighed. She looked at Scut. Pack your kit, then. I guess we're going on a trip. We will send a guy with you, said Harar. Be my guest. Tahiri rose to her feet, as did Scut and Jasmine. As Ben stood up, he asked, Where do I fit in in all this? You should stay in town, Ben, Tahiri said, and glanced at Jasmine. You too. Watch over the comm system. Help Danny and Hara with whatever they need. Keep in touch with Jaina. Sounds good, Jasmine nodded. She clearly had no desire to go trekking through the Blue Mountains. As the four of them started for the door, Danny said, Tahiri, could you wait a moment? Tahiri had a feeling this conversation was also going to be awkward, but she said, sure. Go on ahead, guys. Scud. I'll meet you at the comm center. Scut nodded and left. Jasmine followed, then Ben. Tahiri watched his face for some hint of the coming conversation, but he seemed to know nothing. When they were gone, she sat back down on the carpet with Danny and Har. Well? She asked, placing her hands on her knees. We have heard from Ben that he saw his mother in the forest, Danny said evenly. He said that second appeared as a child and guided him to her. If that's what Ben says, I believe him. Danny nodded, though she looked unhappy that second had, again, appeared to manifest itself to someone other than her. She said, Tahiri, what happened to Mara Jade? What happened to Jason Solo? 
There was the obvious question, the one she knew was coming but prayed she wouldn't have to answer. But now Danny and Hara were staring at her, expectant, needing. She had no right to hide this information from them. She trusted them with her life. She could certainly trust them with the truth, even an awful one. Please, said Harar. Tell us how such great Jedi could fall. Tahiri closed her eyes, exhaled. Then she told them everything. She told them about how Jason had changed after his five-year journey to discover new things about the Force. She spoke of the Swarm War, and how he'd tricked his fellow Jedi into a preemptive attack on the Chiss. Then came the Corellian Crisis and the Second Civil War. She talked about how Jason had trained Ben in the Galactic Alliance Guard, taking him on secret police raids. She said that Jason sought to bring peace to the galaxy by apprenticing himself to a Sith named Lumia, and that when Mara Jade found out she went after Jason to kill him. Jason had, in turn, killed his aunt and become Darth Kedis. Then she told how them Kedis had taken control of the Alliance, turning it into an instrument of terror just like his grandfather had, until he was hunted down and killed by his own sister. The one bright light in all of this was Jason's daughter Alana, born from his hidden lover and childhood friend Tenoka. Tahiri did not talk about her own role in this, how her desire to see Anakin and her longtime friendship with Jason had turned her into a Sith which who murdered old men and helped less prisoners. She could only say so much. When she was done, Danny Kui was weeping silently. Hera's eyes were black marbles in his ashen face. Now you understand, she told them. Her eyes and throat were dry. Jaina doesn't talk about him, ever. Ben, Ben's strong, but he's lost so much. I had no idea, Danny croaked. I wish, I wish I could have seen him one last time. I wish I could have told him. Tahiri only nodded. The pain of words left unsaid had haunted her half her life. It all makes sense now, a soft voice said behind them. All three heads spun to see a teenage girl with three scars on her forehead perched on one of the shelves jutting from the Demutic wall. Tahiri stared. It was her, and yet not. Fifteen years ago, when she first come here, she had been battered but unbroken, confused but seeking clarity, hopeful despite all she'd lost. She'd been smooth-skinned and bright-eyed and barefooted. Staring at the image before her was like seeing the clock turn back on half her life. Second, Danny's voice broke. She sounded like she was about to cry again. You're back. You're really? The image of young Tahiri held up a hand. It's all right, Danny. Really. I haven't forgotten you. Something rattled in Tahiri's chest. It felt so strange to hear your own voice. What I thought Danny stuttered, you just went away, and I thought you were angry. Or, I'm sad, the living world said. There's so much in this universe to be sad about. So much hatred. Pain. Loss. None of it is fair. But we have to keep moving, or we'll be stuck in the past forever. Second, Tahiri said, then froze. She wanted to know why the living world had chosen her image to appear as. The image of her past self, still unbroken by Darth Kedis, filled her with awful, aching nostalgia to go back to what was. Standing before her now was the image of everything she'd longed to return to for the past 15 years, everything she'd gone dark in the hope of getting back. How did you bring forth the ghost of Mara J. Skywalker? Hara asked behind her. You can't see her? Tahiri jerked in shock. Second projected images through the Force. Hara could not touch the Force and should not have been able to see this projection. In the past, whenever Second had wished to speak to the U.S. and Vong, it had spoken directly through the mouths of Danny or the old magister, Jabatha. Tahiri watched her younger self chuckle and hop off the shelf. The shelf creaked with the alleviation of weight, and two bare feet slapped softly on the floor. That's impossible, Tahiri gaped. How did he? I've been discovering new things about myself lately, her simulacrum said. I've learned to touch the force in new ways, even manipulate matter so my children can better see me. So, if I touched you? What about Mara J. Skywalker? Hara asked. That is something else I've been learning. The girl's face smiled ambiguously. 
The line between life and death is never absolute, not with the Force. Could you Tahiri's words caught? She couldn't say it, couldn't ask it. She felt as pathetic, needy, and helpless as she had before Darth Kedis. She was like a spice addict dreaming of a fix. Just the thought, the hope of touching Anakin's spirit threatened to ruin her again. Her own face smiled knowingly. It's all right, Tahiri. And Danny, and horror. I haven't forgotten about you. But there's so much happening, Danny said. There's a fleet out there trying to kill us. And true honor, they. It doesn't matter, Second said firmly. What I'm doing is more important. More important, spat Danny. There are hundreds of thousands of beings on this planet. Beings who trust you, need you, worship you. I haven't forgotten them, the young Tahiri said. But recent trauma has awakened things in me. I can't see things now. Beyond life and death, past and present, good and evil. I wonder if this is how Jason felt when he saved the galaxy from Anami. A strange, sad smile appeared on the girl's face. A dragon is coming. He won't fall easily. I have to be prepared. A dragon, Danny said. What dragon? Second, I don't understand. Don't worry, Magister, the world said. You will. And then the girl was gone. Like she'd never been there at all. An awful silence fell over the room. Danny choked back more tears. Horror lowered his head and looked very, very tired. And Tahiri did not know what to feel. Confusion, hope, desire, despair, and a painful nostalgia all warred within her. She'd come to second thinking it might be a place of refuge from all her regrets, all she'd done in the past five years. Instead it had brought her face to face with them all. Chapter 9 For some time after joining the True Honor movement, Master Shaper Villeth Dow had been uncertain as to whether this was the correct path for him. It was hardly a choice that could be unmade, and he had no intention of slinking back to Zanima second and begging forgiveness though his fellow U.S. and Vong had gone so weak on the forest world they might actually take him back. It was, however, very plain that he was unlike the other True Honor members. For one, most of them were warriors. It was no surprise that they made up the bulk of a dissident movement aimed at taking the U.S. and Vong away from the peaceful, sedentary, agricultural lives imposed on them by the Jedi on Zanima II. There were no shamed ones though they called themselves Exto now. None of the other cast paid much attention to their pretensions of equality. Some of the intended cast had joined, yes, but there were surprisingly few priests among them. High Priest Hara had done a thorough job of filling the religious hierarchy with priests who shared his vision of a peaceful life on their prison planet, this strange mocking seat of U.S. Hunter. There were a few shapers who had joined the warriors in the True Honor movement, and only one Master Shaper who had actually taken part in the way against the Jedi 15 years ago. That Shaper was Villeth Dal. To be fair, Villeth Dal had not been a Master Shaper then. He had been an apprentice for most of the conflict and had been elevated to the full rank of Shaper on the heels of his mentor, Kilaquad, during the last stages of the fighting. As a young scientist, he had been thrilled to assist her in developing the Slayers, the elite bioengineered warriors who had valiantly defending U.S. Hunter against the Jedi invasion. All of his life he had been driven not by the warrior's bloodlust, the priest's fanaticism, or the intendant's ambition. He'd been driven by curiosity, nothing more and nothing less. Master Quad had once told him he was the ideal shaper. In the beginning, after their forced relocation to Zanima II, he had assisted his master in exploring the mysteries of this world so like U.S. Hunter of old yet so utterly different. He'd been thrilled by this discovery, but had grown frustrated as the years went on. They could analyze every plant they found, map every genome, take apart every animal, and they still came no closer to discovering what made Zanima second special. They had been forced to conclude that the mysterious power the Jedi worshipped, which the U.S. and Vong were unable to touch, must have been the key. Master Quad had despaired and made herself an anchorite in the wilderness. But Villeth Dow was a born shaper, and his curiosity was never sated. So in the end he'd joined True Honor, this ragged angry movement of brutish, blood-hungry warriors, not for revenge against the Jedi, 
but because it offered him a chance to do something new. It was all about the company they kept. Villeth Dow now stood in the laboratory of the Sith vessel with their scientist Dishon, examining their leader's latest medical evaluation. It was beginning to feel like a second home. The first time he'd come aboard this Sith vessel, which they called Revenge, much to the warrior's approval, he'd been dazed and fascinated. He had been aboard infidel ships before, and they were nothing like this. Darth Wirelock had called it Rakuten, after the ancient race that had grown it thousands of years ago. Its winding hallways, faintly luminous with the pulsing of veins and capillaries beneath his skin, recalled the insides of U.S. Hinvong ships but were also utterly different. Dishon said that this living ship existed in the dark side of the Force and was powered by it in some way. Villeth Dow had always been skeptical of the Force. He'd seen Jedi do tricks, but otherwise they seemed the same as any other being native to this galaxy. The Jedi he and Master Quad had dissected had looked the same inside as all the other humanoids they cut apart. Empirically, he could admit that the Jedi, and now the Sith, drew on some ethereal power to perform their tricks, but he was still eminently skeptical of some all-embracing energy that, if channeled properly, could both bring a planet to life and power an ancient warship. Like many shapers, he felt the same skepticism toward the U.S. Hanvong gods, though it was a belief they rarely voiced aloud, even to each other. After spending months with Dishon aboard Revenge, he'd come to respect her knowledge and even accept some limits to his understanding. The hours spent with her, alone, had justified the decision to join True Honor. Together, they had combined their different scientific lineages and solved problems for mutual benefit. Dishon had helped him develop bias that rejuvenated the many old U.S. and Vong warships the Sith had scoured from the far corners of the galaxy. He, in turn, worked with her to modify the Vondu and Crab armor that had been grafted onto her master, Darth Krait, during his time as a U.S. and Vong prisoner 50 years ago. Working with Krait had been a revelation. The Vondu and Crab armor had formed a symbiosis unlike anything he'd ever seen. The living armor and the living human were at once feeding off one another yet also locked in mortal combat. The sheer willpower of Darth Krait, and perhaps his force magic too, had kept the armor from completely taking control of his mind and body, while the armor, and grafting itself to his skin and organs, had prolonged his beyond that of a normal human. It was also helping to heal him from whatever grievous injury he had sustained. Dishon had withheld the details. If either Krait or his armor overpowered the other, both would perish. The difference was that Krait was a sentient being who understood limits whereas the armor sought only to consume. Now, after filling the void in Krait's body left by his wound, the armor seemed that it was finally, at last, getting the upper hand. Dishon and Villeth Dow both understood. They'd been trying different treatments for months, but nothing could advance the armor's parasitic advance into Krait's body. They had explained the situation to Krait as well, but not to any of the other Sith or U.S. involved. The three of them had agreed to keep it a secret for now, lest the knowledge get out and sow discord in their fragile alliance. Working with the Sith was a joy and revelation, but Krait's illness had also brought him face to face with something he'd been in denial of all his life. He may have been a born shaper, but he was not a great shaper. He knew in his heart that Master Quat could have done what he could not. She could have restored the equilibrium and saved Crate. They reviewed the information from Crate's most recent examination. Dishon was scanning through the data on a holographic projector. If any of the True Honor Warriors saw this, they call Villeth Dal a blasphemer, but he didn't care. Dishon's mechanical tools were just as valid as his Casa and Villeth, sometimes Moreso. What mattered was the ends not the means to get there. However, what they saw now was not encouraging, not at all. If this was the end they were heading for, they were doomed. How long do you think? Villeth Dal asked. The tentacles in his headdress writhed, betraying his agitation though his face was stony and cold. A week, perhaps, Dishon said as he looked at the readout. After that he will fall into his last sleep. A healing coma will help him resist the armor's effects, but even though, it should overcome him in about a month. The parasite armor is designed to overtake his host, Villeth Dow said. However, 
It was designed for U.S. Hinvon life forms. There is no way your master will survive. It would kill him and the parasite both. He snorted and shook his head. We should have designed smarter biots, but our shapers followed the orthodoxy laid down by the priests and Shimra for too long. It's not your fault, Dishon said sternly. And there must still be a way to save him. Every problem has a solution. Every disease has a cure. Vilith Dow snarled, bearing sharp teeth. Many of my people would say disease is an affliction from the gods, from which there can be no appeal. A few of my people have whispered that Lord Crate has offended the force somehow, Dishon said with equal disdain. Vilith Dow tilted his head. Do you disbelieve in the force, Dishon? She shook her head. Oh no, I can't feel it. Use it, though not as well as the masters. I do not believe it has a will. I refuse to believe it controls our actions. We control our own. The true Sith doesn't whine about fate. She takes hold of what she wants and wrenches it from the stubborn claws of the universe. Vilith Dow chuckled. You would have made a fine you as Vong shaper. No, your fashion sense is beyond me. She gestured to his headdress. Still, this isn't the place for humor. We have to save Lord Crate and we're running out of time. I can't return to my ship, run further tests, he said, but that was a lie. He had no hint of anything else he could do for Crate except kidnap Keela Quad and bring her here. He froze. He could do that. Zanima Seket's engines were down. It had no place to go. Master Quad herself was almost certainly secluded on the exact same remote mountain she'd locked herself away on years ago. What? Dishon asked. Do you have an idea? Perhaps. Vilith Dow demurred. It is too soon to say. She was obviously unsatisfied but knew when not to press. Do you want to return to your ship now? Please, he gave a slight bow. When they stepped out of the lab they were met with their typical honor guard. A half dozen U.S. Hinvong warriors on one side of the hallway and an equal number of black robe tattooed Sith on the other. Even Vilith Dow, who was more or less used to it by now, had to admit they made a truly terrifying combination. He was marched back to the coffer dam that connected to his shuttle. Darth Wirelock was not there this time, so he got a farewell salute from the one with the two tall horns sticking out of his head. Then he entered the umbilical and went back to his ship, six warriors on his heels. He didn't speak to them once the whole way back to his flagship, Honor Regained. At some three kilometers long, Regained was the largest U.S. Hinvong vessel recovered by the Sith scouts. They found her floating all the way on the outer rim, seven parsecs outside the Belkin system. It had taken great effort, and almost a hundred implanted by its, to pump lifeblood into her systems. She had proven herself in combat several times already, though, and Vilith Dow was confident she would do so again when the time came. He hoped, however, that this would not be soon. After his shuttle linked to regained, he boarded the vessel and was greeted by his first officer, Vorin La. There were more than a few of the deceased War Master's domain here on regained. It seemed they felt they had something to prove. Vorin La himself was the picture of the fanatic amateur. At only 20 standard years old, he was tall and stringy, too young to have fought in the war, yet his face was a hideous mess of scars and tattoos, most of them inflicted in the past six months. Not one but two amphistaffs writhed around his waist. When he greeted Vilith Dow, he did not bow in deference to his elder, but said simply, Welcome aboard, with the condescension all too common among the warrior caste too young to have seen actual war. Thank you for receiving me, Vilith Dow said, with equal lack of enthusiasm. Please, take me to Mala. I have something important to discuss with him. The war master is on the bridge, Vorin La said. He is attending to critical. Nothing is more critical than this. Vilith Dow snapped. For a second, Vorin La looked frightened, but then he put on a sneered mask. If you truly insist, I can speak with him. But if he declines, do it, Vilith Dow said. Vorin La stared at the shaper for just long enough that he didn't appear weak in front of his subordinates. Then he took five steps down the hall, stroked the villip on his shoulder to life, and spoke with it in muffled tones. Vilith Dow waited patiently and did not strain to hear. 
he trusted in the conversation's outcome. Unlike his lieutenant, Mao La was not a fool. When the conversation was over, Warren Law walked back and, trying to hide his chagrin, said, The War Master will see you in his command parlor. Very good, Villet Dow nodded and started down the hall. His six soldiers followed behind him, leaving Vorin Law to watch their backs in consternation. When he arrived at the command parlor, he found Maul Law standing before the gym like lens of the viewport, watching stars and warships drift past slowly outside. The self proclaimed war master, a distant relative of Saving La himself, was tall and broad shouldered, though his face lacked the ritual scarring of so many of his cast. Instead, a myriad of red and blue tattoos writhed across his gray skin, climbing his bare arms, slipping under the black cloak he wore over his shoulders, and slipping up his neck and across his cheeks and forehead. Belek to you, Eminence, Villeth Dow said, snapping his wrists against his shoulders. Welcome back. Mala turned around and took a step toward the Shaper. He moved with a slight hobble. He had once lost a leg fighting the enemy at Elysia and the replacement had never grafted quite right. During the war, Savin La had lost a leg and nearly been killed by a corrupt replacement, put on by one of Villeth Dow's own domain. Mala, however, was not one to hold to blood feuds. He had welcomed Villeth Dow into true honor, as well he should have, because a fleet full of warrior cast thugs needed every good shaper they could get. What have you to report? Mala asked as he came within arm's length of the Shaper. Villeth Dow said, Unfortunately, the situation with Darth Crate is at an impasse. The Vonduan armor threatens to consume his body. He will probably slip into a coma within a week and die thereafter. Mala scowled. And what comes of our alliance then? Oh, I think we could slaughter the Sith if we had to, but it would be costly. Say, twenty of ours for every Dark Lord. Is that a joke? No, it is not, Villet Dow said gravely. However, I do have another idea. It is rather unorthodox, but if you agree to it, we must move quickly. Mala regarded him carefully. Just say what you wish, Shaper. I propose a return to Zanima second. Mala's eyes went wide. For what purpose? Healing Crane is beyond my abilities, Villet Dow admitted. However, I'm convinced my master could do it. Kila Quad. The old witch has been hiding in the mountains for years. Likely she has gone mad. Even mad she is the most brilliant member of our race alive. If she can't save Crate, it cannot be done. And how do you propose we get her? Fly into Zanima's orbit and ask politely. It will require a raid, Villa Dal admitted. I know where to find her, so I can lead. I suggest we send a wounded ship, begging to surrender, as a feint. They are fools, but they are not stupid. They will never accept it. They don't have to accept. They only have to hesitate long enough for us to get into orbit. Villet Dow let his eyes drift over Maul La's shoulder, to the drifting stars and warships. What of the beacon? The beacon still transmits, best we can tell, Maul La said. We have not dislodged the enemy missile from its place inside Heart of Flame. Yet they have not attacked. They would be fools too. Our combined fleet outnumbers theirs. This was true, though most of the vessels recovered and resurrected with biotes were undermanned, and their crew disproportionately made up of inexperienced young fanatics like Vorinla. Moreover, they lacked any of the Yamisk War coordinators that had been vital to battles of the last war. Villeth Dow did not know what kind of crew the renegade fleet possessed, but he would bet most of them were actual veterans of the war, not angry youths. Perhaps, he said, we should send Heart of Flame as our damaged ship. Maula's face showed surprise, then consideration. He said, we do not know what would happen if the renegades attack Zanima II. The world may yet cling to dreams of peace and refuse to defend itself. And what if it does not? Maula scowled. Like many in true honor, he clung to the belief that their military victories would draw more of their people away from Zanima II and out into the galaxy to make war once again. That was one reason that they had not attacked the living world thus far. 
There was also a strong reluctance on the part of many U.S. involved to harm their own kind, even the naive ones who sided with horror. Finally, they knew Second was perfectly capable of defeating a whole fleet if it summoned the willpower. All right, the Shaper shrugged. If it needs help, we can bring our fleet in and smash the enemies. We will become saviors of the entire U.S. and Vong race, and they will all flock to join us and take war to the stars again. Is that to your liking? It is, Ma Lai admitted. But such a feat would carry certain risks. Vilith Dao bore his teeth in another imitation of a humanoid smile. Come, War Master. Surely you know that without risk, there can be no reward. Chapter 10 The second and shuttle banked over the veins of the planet's hyperdrive engines. Three massive durasteel shafts, round and pointed at the tip, rose hundreds of meters in the air. They emerged from deep chasms of machinery that burrowed deep into the planet itself. The engines were a surreal sight not just for their scale, but for the way they emerged from nothing. There were no cities, no towns from miles in any direction, only low rolling hills covered in high grass. The man who had once been Bard and Jusik, and now called himself got up stared out the shuttle's porthole and all. Just when he thought this strange world couldn't surprise him anymore, it went and did it. We're coming in from landing, the pilot, a blue-skinned pharaoh, reported. Copy that? said Jaina Solo. The slim, dark-haired Jedi was seated in the co-pilot's seat, and she turned around to look at the people seated along the benches in the cargo hold. Everyone okay back there? Bright and shiny, goddess, said the white-haired man closest to the cockpit. He was on the far side of middle age, but he still had youthful eyes and a teasing smile. Next to him was a red-skinned Deveronian, and incongruously, a shaggy wookie female. Jaina just rolled her eyes, shifted her position, and looked at the people on the other bench. Are we good? Good as we'll ever be, Mariel Scarada said. Like Gadup, the old clone was entranced by the approaching hyperdrive veins. Gadup still wasn't sure why Jaina Solo had insisted they all come with her. To keep an eye on them, most likely. Gadup had lived as long as he had by not being trusting, so he didn't hold it against her. Muriel had been an expert slicer in his youth, and he was still good at cryptography, but he knew nothing about fixing engines, normal or supersized. Gendry was a pilot and might know something. Bess was more of a run and gun type, not a tinkerer. And then there was Venku, Katika, sitting stiffly on the bench, looking straight ahead through the forward cockpit viewport. He'd regained basic locomotion since arriving on Zanima second, but his movements were stiff. He did not speak much, like he was lost in his own thoughts. As for Gadab, his Mandalorian name might have meant engineer, but he had no idea how to fix a set of hyperdrive engines like this. From the air they looked like typical engines on an immense scale, but he knew the technology required to move an entire planet past lightspeed must be astoundingly complex. In the end, he found he didn't mind coming along for the ride. He wanted to see more of this world. In small, good ways, it reminded him of Mandalore. It had broad open spaces, mountains, forests, lakes. Even its town and city seemed humble, unspoiled by the pretensions of civilization. It was less industrialized than Mandalore, but as he'd gotten older Gadab had cared less for machines and more for unspoiled nature. The shuttle circled around the landing site located between the three massive veins. When it finally settled in his berth, the hatch on the roof of the cargo hold opened and a pair of pharaohs lowered a ladder for them to climb out of. Gadab would have greatly preferred a landing ramp, but apparently Second liked to tax the strength of old men. Gadab wasn't that broke down, so he pulled himself up rung upon rung until he stood on the sleek green hood of the shuttle. Sleek silver veins rose to dizzying heights on either side, and he craned his neck back to get a good view of the three massive constructions stabbing toward a slightly overcast sky. Incredible, the white-haired man said as he came out of the hatch. Hey goddess, how long ago were these things built? Sometime during the Old Republic, Jaina's muffled voice came from the hold. The big Wookiee popped out of the hold next, followed by Solo herself. Must be a pain to maintain, the human whistled. Probably a magnet for lightning strikes, high wind gusts. 
the Wookiee grown something. Yuhan is right, Shar, the Deveronian said. They've got a really sleek, aerodynamic design. Still, there's got to be some heavy wind. Godup turned his attention to his fellow Mandas. Per Jaina's request, they were allowed to wear their armor but no helmets, and their faces all looked small and naked as they squinted up at the hyperdrive veins. Well, best grunted, now I've seen everything. Muriel nodded. Wind kicked the braids of his long gray hair, making them flail over his shoulders. You can say that again? Jaina Solo stood with her hands on her hips and looked around the group. Okay, here's the plan. Shar, Huhana, I want you to check with the work crews in the south vein. Drickall, Mariel, best check with the command center by the west vein. See how their diagnostics have been working. Gendry, Godup, and Venku, check out the north vein. And what are you up to? Shar asked. I'm doing a little bit of everything. Must be hard to be a goddess. Jane aside, it always is. Come on, all of you, get to work. They descended the stairs one by one and walked across the landing deck. The command station, God of Saul, was a low durasteel bunker right next to the landing pad. As Muriel, Vess, and the younger human made a line for that, God of slowed his pace and sidled along Jane Solo. How are you holding up? She asked him. Better than I thought I would. And Venku. The same? He's recovering better than Fi did from a similar injury. But that was a long time ago. Tell me, why does he call you goddess? Jaina sighed yet again. A long story. Back during the U.S. and Vong War, Shar helped me run. Well, I guess you call it a PSYOPs program. We were trying to convince the U.S. and Vong that I was their trickster goddess Yunharla. And why would the Vongis believe that? Because Yunharla had a twin brother. Twins are very rare among the U.S. and Vong. They're considered sacred. She looked like she was going to say more, but snapped her mouth shut. I see, got up said simply, then changed tack, do you really think we can help you? You already have engineering crews from the fleet here. I'm mostly interested in what you and Venku can do, she said plainly. Because we possess the force. That's right. This is a piece of machinery. An extraordinary one, but still a machine. It's part of a living world, Jenna said. Living things and machinery aren't opposed here. They coexist in strange ways. I'm already aware of that. He sighed. All right. I will help with the inspection. That's all I ask, Jenna said. Then got up turned to follow Venku and Gendry toward the entrance to the north shaft, while Jaina headed to the command bunker. A platform attached to the rim of the massive shaft took them deeper into the planet's engine. There was no cover except a simple metal bar along the edge, and wind whirled around the vein and buffeted the walls of the shaft. It took all of Gata and Venku's strength just to hold onto the railing. The further down they went, the thicker the smooth metal vein gradually became. The open space of the shaft grew narrower, and the overcast sky more distant, giving Gata a feeling of claustrophobia. The idea that these engine shafts could fill with destructive thrust energy at any moment was more than a little disquieting. The engineering teams already working in the shaft did not seem to care much about the new arrivals. Godab asked the chief some perfunctory questions about the machinery, and the chief gave distracted answers. Gendry paced the walkways rimming the shaft at regular intervals and observed the crew as they calibrated parts of the machinery. Venku stayed by the lift, staring up at the distant sky, apparently lost in his own thoughts. Gadab did learn some things about the engines. They were, in many ways, supersized versions of typical starship engines, but with key differences. They possessed elaborate shock absorbers so as not to tear the planetary crust apart every time they were fired. The power core, three miles deep beneath the planet's surface, was especially well armored. Every system contained layers upon layers of redundancy. Modifications had been made again and again over almost a century, patching together technology from the Old Republic, Galactic Alliance, Pharaohs, even some U.S. involved. It was an engineer's joy and nightmare both. Most importantly, the chief said, they only worked when Second wanted them to work. And that was what bothered Gadab about this, about Zanima Second as a whole. 
The planet was a living being, with the consciousness that manifested itself within the Force. It was also a planet filled with artificial things, from cities to landing pads to giant hyperdrive engines. Somehow, they were all unified into one system, even if nobody living on said planet knew exactly how that system worked. Gotham had always been good at compartmentalization. It had made him a good engineer and a good doctor. It had also helped him switch from Jedi Knight to Mandalorian, swapping out one ancient order for another, even though so many of their values and rituals were diametrically opposed. When he used the Force, he used it like a tool, to heal or sometimes to harm. He knew some Jedi spoke like they were in touch with some unifying facet of the cosmos, but he'd only felt that elation once, a very long time ago, and only with the aid of another being vastly more powerful than himself. He'd almost entirely forgotten the sensation. When he was young, training under Arligan Z, he'd never come close to that feeling. When Jedi got all mystical, it was usually prelude to some righteous campaign against the evil dark side wielding Sith that ended with billions dead. He was self-aware enough to know that the Mandos had their mystical, clannish side too. On one level, he'd been hypocritical to swap out Jedi for Mandalorian in a fit of moral pique regarding the Republic's treatment of clone soldiers. The Mandalorians could be brutal, especially to outsiders. In the end what had made him turn Mando wasn't moral outrage. He needed a place to belong, a clan to call his own, and he hadn't gotten that from Z and the Jedi. He got that from Cal Skirata's Mando, loving clones, so he followed their path instead. It was as simple and amoral as that. As he watched the engineers work, he decided what, above all, fascinated the frightened him about Zanima Second. In this living world he found a refutation of the mechanical, compartmentalized life he'd built for himself. It spoke of lofty, mystic things, the kind maybe he could have known if only he hadn't turned his back on Jedi tradition in a burst of adolescent anger and reduced the Force to a simple tool for performing useful tricks. Gadab didn't feel sorry for himself. He made his choice a long time ago. What he wondered was whether his resentment toward the Jedi, his suspicion of the Force itself, had stolen something from Venku, something that was, from a certain point of view, his birthright. After an hour or so in the shaft, he felt he had nothing more to do or say, so he took the lift back up. Venku and Gendry stayed behind, watching the Alliance and Pharaoh Tech's work. The overcast clouds had faded and sun broke through a filmy layer to shine brightly on the surface of the planet. Gadab walked across the landing field to the edge and stared out across the fields. Tall grass rippled and shimmered across the low rolling hills. There were no forests or mountains to break the view, no artificial things of any kind. The bright fields seemed to go on forever beneath the brilliant sky. Nice, isn't it? Jaina Solo said beside him. Gotta jerked and stared at her. He hadn't heard her sneak up behind him, hadn't been track of time as he watched the grass. He was getting soft in his old age, or possibly senile. There's nothing for me down there, he said. It's interesting. But the techs know what they're doing. Maybe Jaina shrugged. According to the diagnostics they've been running, the engines still aren't drawing power from the main core. They've checked and double-checked all the equipment, so it should work. It only works if the planet wants to. Gotta shook his head. You've got a machine with a mind of his own. Something like that, Jaina said. Pretty frustrating, huh? This is why I gave up on all that cryptic mystic Jedi Isaac a long time ago. Gotta mutter. Meaning what exactly? I'm an engineer. A doctor. A soldier. I like things that are reliable. Predictable. The force isn't like that. I know. That's why I don't like to use it. Jaina looked out at the grass. Wind blew at their backs, sending streamers of hair flying past her face. When it changed direction, she tucked strands behind her ears and said, Ben met his mother today. Gotta stared for a moment, confused. Then he understood. Ben Skywalker, the Grandmaster's son, and heir apparent. Ben Skywalker, whose mother had been murdered by Jason Solo. You mean he saw her ghost? That's right, Jaina nodded. In the forest. Second appeared as a small boy and led him to her. And what did she say? I don't know. 
Ben wouldn't tell. I figure it's between him and Mara. The idea of life after death was another of those mystic force things Gata didn't like to think about. It was complicated and disturbing on many levels, hopeful and sad at once. After Atain died during Order 66, Cal Skarada had asked him whether her spirit might survive in the force. Gata, or Barden as he still called himself then, had answered truthfully. Yes, he believed part of Atain might survive. He'd been afraid Skarada might be offended by that, might see life to death as another privilege claimed by hated saber jockeys. But instead, Cowboy had looked relieved. Thankful, even. Gadab still hoped Atain might survive, in some fashion, after death. He knew Vanku still craved to speak with her, to feel his mother's presence, though he'd never admit it aloud. A part of Gadab, deep down, hoped that he might survive too. Another part hated the very thought. His clan, his brothers and sisters and his adopted children and grandchildren, his late wife, they were not Jedi. Only Venku and his children had any Jedi genes. The rest of them would go to join the Mandaean when they died. But that was just a vague concept of continued Mando culture. Not true, Blue Ghost, life to death. He wanted to see Atain after he died, but also didn't want to exist without all those he'd known and loved. He felt torn, and when he was stuck on a problem with no solution, he normally tried his best to ignore it. Jaina watched him for a while. And when he didn't say anything, she continued. Ben says he could talk to Mara because she'd been on second before. Because it had met her, the planet was able to retrieve her from wherever she was. That's the way I understand it, at least. Gadab didn't know what he'd do if he faced Atane's blue ghost. Likely she wouldn't even recognize him. Death had trapped her forever as a young woman, small but brave enough to defy the Jedi Order for love of a man most of the galaxy didn't even consider human, while time had marched on four Barden Jusik and turned him into a scarred, gray, ugly old man who'd far outlived his time. Jaina hugged herself, shivered in the cold wind. I'm worried. I'm afraid I might see him. Ah, of course. Wrapped up in grief from a lifetime ago, Gadab hadn't even thought about Jaina, and the brother she had killed. You can't know, can you? Gadab said. That's the problem with the damned force. It just does what it wants. Yeah, Jaina choked. Pretty much. Things are usually simpler without it, he said. Water gleamed in her eyes. Gadab turned his gaze to the grass, still rippling and shining in the wind. Jaina didn't say anything for a long time, and neither did he. He felt very powerless here, and very small. After a while, Jaina asked, Did you love her? Venku's mother, I mean. Gadab looked at her, surprised. Of course she'd consider his pain. She was the selfless Jedi, not him. I did, he admitted. Not romantically. I don't think so anyway. I was a kid, and I wouldn't have understood romantic love even without the Jedi brainwashing. But like a sister, maybe. And Venku's father, did you love him? Darman was a brother to me. If you met Darman again, what would you say to him? I've never thought about that, God have grunted truthfully. Attain he thought about, but Darman no. That life, is agony and failure and tragic ending, was one of those things he'd compartmentalized. Unlike with Attain, the Force couldn't dangle any taunt and lure in front of him. Darman was gone forever, and there was no point in looking back. Still, he felt he had to ask, Have you thought about what you say your brother? No, Jaina said firmly, forbidding discussion. God of knew she was telling the truth. Even a Jedi learned to compartmentalize if she had to. For a moment, as she looked at the U.S. Henvong intendant standing before her in her personal demudek, Magister Danny Kui felt a surge of her old revulsion for his race. Just quickly as it came, it was gone, but it still startled her. The sudden intrusion of Jaina Solo and Tahiri Vila into her life again, and the awful revelation of Jason's final fate, had shaken her deeply and brought long buried emotions to the fore. But once it was gone, she assessed the being in front of her. Very O'Shea was a far cry from the grotesque Praetorite Vong warriors who'd held her captive on Helska 4 all those years ago, her first introduction to their face.
He'd been a young soldier when the leader of Domain Shea had died in disgrace at Ither, and he spent most of the ensuing war at the rear lines, far from chances of glory, left to consort with the battered worker caste who made up the bulk of U.S. involved society. The experience had opened his mind. Once the war ended, he'd thrown himself into the recreation of U.S. Hinvong society on Zanima II and become one of Danny's most trusted adjutants. The self-inflicted scars of his youth were buried now, barely visible beneath his white face paint. Vary O'Shea bent his head forward slightly, inquisitive. Is something troubling you, Magister? I'm all right, she shook her head. She was sitting on an organic chair sack, looking up at the intendant as he stood before her in a respectful pose. She took a breath and said, I just want to reiterate how important this mission is, and how important it is that we bring back Kila Quad. She might be the only one who can convince the hyperdrives to work. Do you think Rena Quad will be able to convince her? He sounded skeptical. I can't say for sure, she admitted, but we have to try. Vare O'Shea thought a moment, then asked, if Kila Quad refuses to come with us, should we take her by force? Wordlessly, Danny nodded. I shall bring some warriors, then. She shook her head. We don't want to scare her. You know some extol who would be good in a fight, don't you? Vare O'Shea nodded. He'd long ago shed his caste prejudice. Good. Take them? I'm sure Rena Quad can also help if you need it. She is small but quite durable. When Danny had last seen Tahiri, the woman hadn't seemed durable at all. The telling of all Jason's crimes had racked her almost as much as it had Danny, and the sudden appearance of Second, as Tahiri's teenage self of all things, seemed to have hurt her in a place she hadn't dared bear to Danny and Har. It was why Danny was giving instructions to Vary O'Shea now instead of the Jedi woman. It was far easier emotionally. Not for the first time. It made Danny wonder if Second had developed a cruel streak. She forced a smile and said, Good hunting, Vary O'Shea. He snapped his arms in a cross over his chest, wrist to shoulders, and bowed slightly. We won't fail you, Emma Chester. She watched him go. To her surprise, that smile lingered on her face. It had been a long, long road from Helska 4 to Zanima Second, and when she dwelled on it, she found it hard to believe. The first human to encounter the U.S. Hinvong invasion force and survive was now their leader. Such an impossibility was enough to give her hope, and hope was what she needed right now. Shortly after Vary O'Shea left, Hara ducked his head beneath the threshold and stepped into her demudek, trailing white robes behind him. The sight of the old priest also gave her hope, it always had. Without Hara's help she could have never managed to reform U.S. Hinvong society as much as she had. He'd been particularly helpful in disassembling a hierarchy of fanatic priests who clung to the old bloodletting ways under the guidance of former high priest Jacket. Danny was not by nature a spiteful person, but when the old bastard had died six years after the war's end, she'd been glad of it. They'll be off soon, she told Hara as the old priest folded his bony legs beneath him and sat on the chair sack opposite hers. I know, he said placing his hands on his kneecaps as they jutted out beneath his robes. I just spoke with Rena Quad. How is she holding up? Danny asked. She is trying to put her mind on the future. Horror examined her face. Are you, Danny Quee? Danny laughed, a dry, sad, incredulous laugh. She shook her head and said, How can I? Ken is not the issue. You must do it, for all our sakes. If these true victory people find us, then? I know, I know. She blew a little sigh and looked the priest in the eye. Doesn't it matter to you, though, what happened to Jason? Of course it matters. But it was a long time ago. We have to look to our story now, Danny Quee. This is finished. It's an awful way for a story to end. Jason was special. Important. Without him, we would not have liberated my people from the bondage they kept themselves in. I know. But it's more than that, Har. Jason, he had a destiny. Everyone knew it. She and the priest had had their share of theological discussions over the years. They'd long since reconciled Danny's belief in the force guiding beings to Har's idea of the gods controlling fates. 
Perhaps his destiny was to defeat Anami and guide our people to Zanuma. Horror spread his long-fingered hands. If so, he accomplished what his force meant for him to do. But what happened after that? I still don't understand how the Jason we knew, the who had that destiny, saved your people, could become what Tahiri said he did. She looked at her lap and couldn't bring herself to say any more. From the moment she'd met Jason on Helska 4, she'd known the boy was special. Over the war's five years she'd watched him grow from a troubled boy to a confident, strong man who had a connection with the force that no other being did, not even Master Skywalker. A part of her had come to love the man he'd become. She didn't know exactly when it happened, maybe when they were on the mission to find Zanima second together, but probably before that, when he'd returned from the dead and they spent lazy days together on Mon Calamari's endless oceans. By then, the boy had definitely become a man. Those memories had given her bittersweet nostalgia, even after Sekhet had told her of Jason's death. Now that she knew the truth of it all, it was painful just to conjure his image in her head. Jedi can be redeemed, she said. Darth Vader was. Kite Durin, and others. But Jason, it just seemed so unfair that after everything Jason was, he'd die a monster. But after everything he did, I don't know how he could be redeemed. She stared at her lap for a long time, at her clenched pale hands, before horror said, Danny Kui, do you know how many beings I killed? Her head snapped up. The old priest was looking at her calmly. He said, I don't. I sacrificed many thousands from your galaxy to the gods, because I believed all the bloodthirsty dogma that had been passed down by our people for generations. But that's different, Danny said. They'd never out and out talked about this before, not in all their years on Zanima together, and she couldn't believe has bringing it up now. What you did, you were taught to do. It was part of the culture, passed down for generations. He shook his head. Culture is no excuse. Otherwise, why try to reform it as we have? Danny Kui, I sacrificed too many to the gods. I did it out of piety, not malice. I remember once talking theology with the H. Kick priest before sending him off to the immolation pits. When you look at me, Danny Kui, do you see that priest's face? And the faces of all those thousands I killed for Yunyamka? You know I don't. Why? His tone was blunt, almost cruel. It was a simple but biting question. Just allowing the U.S. and Vong to retreat to Zanima II had been an act of amnesty. Hara was hardly the only one on this world who'd killed innocents in the war. The only way for this new society of theirs to function was to look past old crimes and concentrate on the future. Which was, she supposed, what the old priest was trying to tell her. You've earned his forgiveness, she sniffed, through everything you've done for me. For your people. I'm glad to know that. He sounded genuinely relieved. But Jason? Jason didn't get that chance. Jaina had killed him before that. Danny didn't know if she'd be able to look the woman in the eye the next time they met, knowing what she did now. But it is possible, Hara said, that given the time, the opportunity, the second chance. There are no second chances. He's dead. That's the whole point. Her voice shook. Hara lowered his eyes. I am sorry. I did not mean to upset you. Oh, I know. She got up knelt down in front of him, and placed her palms on his long bony fingers. I appreciate everything you've done for me, horror, all this time. I couldn't have held his planet together without you. He met her eyes again. Then you should be cheered, Danny Kui. You friends have returned. I know. She squeezed his hands. And believe me, I am. Yet Jason's loss, his corruption and death had left a hole that not even Jaina and Tahiri's return could fill. She didn't know how those women had lived with that awful knowledge for the past four years. Despite all the trials she herself had been through, she found she didn't envy them at all. In the end, Tahiri led a party of six to find Kila Quad. Hara allowed them to take a second in ship from the town, though he warned her not to get too close to Quad's supposed hiding place in the Blue Mountains. That Master Shaper had, unsurprisingly, set traps to ensure her privacy against intruders from the air. When Tahiri asked if intruders from the ground would fare any better, the old priest had just shrugged. 
Unlike the second vessel she had recovered from the broken True Honor frigate, the mechanical components of this ship had not been removed and replaced with Davin basils and U.S. Hanvong bioformed interface masks. Instead, they retained sleek metallic consoles, holographic projectors, and other amenities familiar to pilots all over the galaxy. Tahiri and Scut took the helm, but to her surprise, the other U.S. Hanvong and the party showed no aversion to the mechanical devices. Two of them were extolled, and that might have had something to do with it. The former members of the shamed ones under caste had been quicker than the other to eschew the stricter tenets of traditional U.S. and Vong theology. She did not know Vletham or Nareth, but apparently the two of them spent much time exploring the Blue Mountain on foot. Both were tall and wiry of build. Nareth had been shamed because his body would not take to implants, leaving his appearance nearly as smooth and natural-looking as Scut's. Vletham, by contrast, had a hideous, crab-like claw grafted onto one shoulder, the result of a shaping gone wrong. Massive canines protruded from his jaw, giving him a fearsome appearance, though his eyes were tired and sad. Also with the group was the intendant Vary O'Shea and a female shaper named Kadra Val. Tahiri had worked with both of them in growing new villages in which the new U.S. and Vong population would live, and Kadra Val had cooperated with Kila Quad on several projects. She distinctly remembered Kadra Val's disgust at mechanical technology, but that was 15 years ago, and she seemed to have grown used to it since then. The same seemed true for the U.S. and Vong in general. As they flew through Zanima's lower atmosphere toward the misshrouded mountain range, the other U.S. and Vong had many questions for Scut. Vletham asked him what it was like growing up amidst humans and whether he had faced hatred from them. Kadra Val asked about the Neoglyph Masker technology he developed while Nareth asked whether he followed any of the traditional religion. Scud wasn't big on the old gods, but Nareth had a lot to say. He was a follower of a new god in the pantheon, the Ganner, who was popular with the warriors but also with some extol. Vletham, meanwhile, was a follower of the prophet Yusha, the great leader who gave hope to the shamed ones, and, he claimed, had been martyred during the retaking of U.S. Hunter. It was a strange conversation for Tahiri to listen to. When she left Zanima second, the cults to both Ganner Rissel and Yusha had been slowly growing. The Ganner she had known had been a brave Jedi, but also vain and something of a braggart. Still, she knew he had died heroically, fighting bravely against thousands of warriors, using Anakin's lightsaber no less, so she didn't begrudge him his posthumous honor. The worship of Yusha was more difficult because Tahiri was one of the few beings on Zanima II who knew that the prophet who had led the Shames One's insurrection against Shimra was actually Nam Adder, the scheming executor who had murdered Ninyim and Nirlin, killed Second itself. Nam Adder had, in fact, died at the end of the war, but Tahiri had to admit that, for his scheming selfish reasons, he had helped bring down a corrupt and bloodthirsty regime, setting the U.S. Hanvong on course for redemption. She was uncomfortable with the idea that a man she despised might have left a positive mark on the galaxy. Scud himself was busy trying to pilot this new ship, and he acted annoyed at the questioning. At the same time, Tahiri knew that a part of him was thrilled with the attention. She could feel it through her Vong sense. It was strange, operating on two layers of yourself. With one part of her, the part she called Tahiri, the part she'd acted as for the last decade. She could feel the forest draped mountains beneath her hum with the force. She could feel the life in this ship too. The other part of her, the Rena who'd lay dormant and sometimes almost forgotten since leaving Zanima II, she could sense the telepathic energy of these beings. It was not the force exactly. She could not pick up Vletham with her mind like she could the trees or bushes they were passing. She could, however, sense some of their emotions, their energy. Jason had described her Vong sense. His Vong sense, too, as being like the telepathic powers of a Yamisk war coordinator. Tahiri had not liked being compared to a Yamisk, and did not particularly like it now, but it was the best comparison she could muster. Yes, Vletham was saying, but how often do you wear your masker? All of the time? Some of it. Some of it, Scut said, keeping his eyes on the approaching mountains. Most of it, I guess. When you are in public, walking through the crowd, do you wear your masker? I do, 
he admitted. Always. Pretty much. Yes. Vletham shook his ugly head, like he was disappointed. Do you always feel the need to hide what you are? Not always. My squadmates, my comrades, are used to me like this, Scott said defensively. And a U.S. Hinvong is not all I am. Then are you a hybrid like Rina Quad? Kadra Val asked, tentacles writhing on her head. Scott blinked, momentarily confused. Then he realized who Rina was. No, I'm not like her. I'm not a hybrid. But my father is human. My comrades are human. Claudite. Wookiee. Gamorian. Gamorian. Kodra Val hissed. They are. Barely sentient. He's not an ordinary Gamorian, just like I'm not ordinary U.S. Hinvong, Scut insisted. In fact. Hush. Tahiri whistled. We're getting close. Vletham Nareth. Give me some help here. She slowed her ship's engines and felt the two extolled lean in over her shoulder. Nareth stuck a smooth gray hand out and pointed to the largest mountain in view. That one? She asked. No, Nareth said. Do you see the smaller peak rising from its southern foothill? I see it. Is that hers? Nareth nodded. She likely has traps for those who come by air. You shall have to land in the valley to the south and walk. We're walking, Tahiri said. All six of us, remember? You're here to show us those traps. Nareth nodded. As you, say, Rena Quad. Tahiri didn't object to that name. Here, surrounded by U.S. and Vong, it was as good a name as any. She set the shuttle down in the valley. It took them 15 minutes to pack their things and begin the long walk up the mountain. Tahiri and Scut were dressed in patterned camouflage jumpsuits and carried heavy packs on their backs, but the other U.S. and Vong wore only animal hide tunics and carried no cargo. An amphistaff unwound from Kodra Val's arm and turned into a walking stick. Another appeared in Vary O'Shea's hand. Vletham bent forward and used his deformed, claw-like hand to help him with the ascent. Then didn't talk much on the way up. The vegetation of the slope was a mix of boros, waist-high scrub, and blades of tall grass. The ground was left damp by the blue-tinted mist that gave the mountains their name, and Tahiri had to step carefully to keep from slipping. The air was chill, and she barely sweat through her jumpsuit. Second, as a whole, felt significantly cooler than she remembered. Danny had explained that, after the emergency jump, seconds normally hot, humid atmosphere had become drier and chillier. It had damaged the growth of the younger Boros and affected some of the natural fauna in the forest, but thankfully had not destroyed the ecosystem entirely. Maybe that was something Keela Quad could help with. Maybe Second itself would get around to fixing things once it stopped communing with the dead, or whatever its deal was. She was used to the living world being cryptic and shy, and her five years living on the planet, she'd only spoken to it less than a dozen times, during most of which it had been wearing Nin Yim's face. Those visions had always been forced projections. Whatever Second was doing now seemed to be assembling atoms and molecules with the Force and making visible to Force users and U.S. and Vong alike and the possibilities that were both terrifying and fascinating. What second was second, and there was nothing she could do about it. She just wanted to get to Kila Quad and see if she could bring the reclusive shaper off her mountain. After about an hour's walk uphill, Nair stopped the march and insisted they take a detour. He did not explain his reasons, but Tahiri saw no point in distrusting him. They circled around the waist of the mountain for another half hour, then began their ascent against. As they climbed higher up the mountain, the mist grew thinner. She could see further up tangled forests that rolled the slope. The air grew chiller, though the physical effort of climbing the mountain was enough to keep her warm. After another half hour, Vletham ordered them to halt. Do we have to go around again? Asked Scud. Vletham shook his head. No, but I sense something coming. As if on cue, they heard something snapping through the forest ahead. Tahiri put a hand on her lightsaber but did not ignite, not yet. Whatever it was grew closer. The sounds of tumbling brush were replaced by the cracking of branches and the creaking of tree trunks. 
she flipped her lightsaber on just in time to see a dark lanky shape appear in the branches overhead. A black, furry animal hung between two trees, with four vice-like clawed feet and a prehensile tail clinging to different branches. The creature stared at them but did not attack. What is it? Scut whispered. One of her scouts, Kodraval said. Like on the Alkaia from U.S. Hunter, but different. Tahiri reached out with her Vong sense to touch the creature's mind. She felt predatory hunger, yes, but also curiosity, and dim flickerings of sentience. This was not a stupid beast, hungry to tear flesh from their bones. She tried to broadcast feelings into his mind. She projected calm, trust. The creature blinked at big eyes, then turned around and scampered from branch to branch, back up to the place from which it came. What did you do? Scott asked her. I told it to play nice, Tahiri said. The Force? Kadra Val shook her head. Impossible. Not the Force. I was able to touch its mind. Fascinating, Vletham said. Can you also? Enough talk, Very O'Shea said sternly. We don't have a lot of time before sunset. Let's get going. Agreed, said Tahiri, and they resumed their climb. The received no more animal guests the rest of the trip. The scouts detected no more traps. They simply kept climbing until they found it, one lonely dome-shaped demudek, located in a small clearing jutting out of the slope. Through the trees, Tahiri could see the ridges and peaks of the other mountains in the range, half dissolved in blue mist. Come out, Kila Quad. She shouted in Yuas Hinvong. It is I, Rena Quad. Answer one of your own domain. Master Shaper. She waited, but nothing emerged from the Demudek. She plucked the lightsaber off her belt and moved forward cautiously. Very O'Shea's and Nareth's Amphistaff snapped to combat ready mode, their snake-like mouths facing forward, and followed Tahiri's lead while the others spread out to the clearing's edge. Tahiri reached out with her Vong sense, trying to locate a sentient being within the Demudek. She found nothing. She held her breath as she went through the threshold. The inside of the demudek was clearly being used. Fruit dangled from vines stretched beneath the ceiling. Shelves were full of shaper's casses and other tools. A murky stew cooled at the bottom of a pot suspended over burnt twigs. Rena Quad. Kadra Val shouted from outside. Tahiri ignited her lightsaber and dashed out of the demudek. Very O'Shea and Nareth right behind her. Vletham, Scut and Kadra Val stood in a loose semicircle around the hunched, cloaked figure at the edge of the clearing. Kilaquad, Tahiri called, still in U.S. Hinvong. It's you, isn't it? The figure reached up. Gnarled hands with long, bony fingers pulled back the cloak's hood, revealing thin face, unscarred but etched with many inky black tattoos, topped by a shaper's headdress of wilted tentacles. Age and isolation had not been kind of Kilaquad, indeed. She now bore a startling resemblance to her domain sister, Mies Quad. Tahiri fought down revulsion and took two steps closer, holding her lightsaber in front of her. Quad blinked red gold eyes and said, What do you want, Heretic Spawn? Don't you want to know how I got here? Tahiri asked, I haven't seen you in over a decade. Zana Masekit was lost among the stars, cut off from the Jedi and the Alliance. Yet here I am, and you're not the least surprised. I am surprised, but so what? Kila Quad shrugged. I am an old woman. I want no part of your wars. Villa Dow came to me, seeking my aid in some mad quest of his. I told him the same thing I tell you now. Leave me alone. Danny had assured Tahiri that Villa Dow had been tracked, and that he hadn't spoken to Kila Quad, but Tahiri trusted the twisted shaper more. She and Villa Dow both probably had bags of tricks shoulder deep. Master Quad, Kadra Val spoke up. Your people need you. Will you not serve them? Kila Quad snorted. That is what Villeth Dow said too. Scut, who had been looking back and forth confused while the others spoke Yuas Hinvong, called to Tahiri. Tell her the enemy is coming. Tell her they have Alpha Red. The other Yuas Hinvong knew basic, but none of them knew what Alpha Red was except for Kila Quad herself. The scientist glanced at Scut for the first time and took in his alliance jumpsuit and scarless face. What are you? 
she said in halting basic. It must have been years since she had attempted that tongue. My name is Vil Gorsett, but you can call me Scud, he said with dignity. You cannot speak our tongue, Kila Quad snapped. You are not from Zanima Second. I was raised by humans. I'm a member of Galactic Alliance Intelligence. Incredible. Kila Quad spat. Tahiri couldn't tell if she was shocked, disgusted, or intrigued. I do not speak our language well, Scud said, but I know about our people. They're not your people, infidel. You are a human in a U.S. Hinvong masker. Scud shook his head. No, but I've been a U.S. Hinvong and human masker plenty of times. It helps to blend in, given the work I do. She eyed him suspiciously, but Tahiri could sense the scientist's curiosity warring inside her. Kilaqua said, Where did you acquire a masker? I bred it, Scud said proudly. I did not have any U.S. Hinvong life to breed, but I developed it using other alien life. It operates just like a masker, but without the pain required to take it on and off. Pathetic, Kila Quad said you are soft as a human at heart. I am what I am, Scott shrugged. A little human, a little you as involved. But mostly I am a shaper. Oh, Tahiri thought, he was playing his cards well. You are not a shaper. Kila Quad's head wagged from one direction to another. I am a shaper. She, Kodra Val is a shaper. You are, a human, playing with toys. I came to learn from the best, Scut said. Kila Quad's jaw dropped open. It worked up and down but wouldn't close. Finally, she said, you are a strange creature. Probably, Scut said. How about a deal? I tell you about all my experiments, and you help us with what we want. You think your knowledge can add to mine in any way? I've been working in a completely different environment than you. It's likely I've learned some things you haven't. In the end, there's only one way to find out. Scowling, Kila Quad looked to Tahiri. Why did you come here? Herod expawned. What is it you want from me? We want you to help repair Sekka's hyperdrive engines. We have technicians working on them now, but the organic aspect is beyond them. There are other shapers. Kila Quad glanced at Kadra Val. Have you not examined it already? I have, Master. Kadra Val said. But my knowledge is small. Yours is far greater. Kila Quad wagged her head back and forth again. You flatter me, you all do. You peck at me like birds. You pry at me, you. I am offering you all I know, Scud pressed. Don't you want to learn something new after all this time? Yes, he knew exactly what cards to play. Kila Quad's wandering gaze fixed on Scud. Reluctantly, she nodded. Very well. Tell me everything you know, Vil Gorset. Fine, Scud said. Just come with us back to the ship. No. Kila Quad stamped her feet on the ground. Tell me what you can, and I will judge the reward you deserve. Tahiri sighed loudly. Master Shaper, we do not have the time to. Don't dare instruct me, Herod Spawn. Kila Quad shouted. You are nothing but Ms. Quad's mistake. Don't pretend you are anything else. It is all right, Scut said. Let's sit down and talk. Tahiri shot him a glance. Are you sure about this? No, he said. But it's the best chance we have of getting what we came for, isn't it? Besides, I would like to pick her mind about a number of things. He looked at the old shaper and favored her with a smile. Kila Quad flinched but did not rebuke him. She gestured to the Demudek. Come, let us sit and talk. If you wish, you can prepare food for the night. Over the next few hours, the sun went down over the misty blue mountains and the temperature dropped. The silver gleam of Zanima Sekut's planet filled the sky, forestalling true night. Kila Quad, Scud, and Kodra Val sat inside the Demudak for hours, talking shaper talk that Tahiri could only vaguely understand. Beneath the silver planet light, Tahiri opened up her and Scud's backpacks and began taking out the bedrolls. They had only brought one each, but the other U.S. and Vong seemed unfazed by the prospect of sleeping on the grass in the cold mountaintop, far away from anything that passed for civilization. Nerith and Vletham simply sat down on the grass and hunched their bodies in on themselves. 
Very O'Shea seemed more affected by the night's chill than the extolled, and he pulled his short cloak tight around his body. They will talk in here forever, he muttered. Let them talk, Tahiri said in U.S. Hanvong. We should have taken her back down the mountain. By force if we had to. That wouldn't have secured her cooperation, would it? The intendant shook his head. She is stringing him along, picking at him for information. She will not give us anything in return. I'm not so sure of that, Tahiri said. With her Vong sense, she could feel genuine excitement from all three parties inside the Demudek. After years in the wilderness, Kila Quad was bitter, broken down, and probably half mad, but she still had a scientist's mind. Tahiri suspected that, deep down, she wanted to help salvage the hyperdrives. She just needed a reason to come off her mountain. A few hours after sundown, when the planet formed a broad silver bow in the southern sky, Scut came out of the Demudek. Nareth and Vletham were both hunched in the grass, apparently sleeping, while Tahiri had allowed Vary O'Shea to use her bedroll while she kept watch. Scut stepped out onto the grass and stared at the half-night sky. Breath escaped from his open mouth in puffs of vapor. Tahiri sidled beside him and said, Anything good happened so far? I think so, he said. We've talked a little about my neoglyph maskers, and about the hyperdrive too. Mostly we've talked about other things. She explained all eight courtesies of Shaper knowledge, in far more detail than any of the resources in the Alliance give. And about the creatures she's been breeding, like the one we saw in the forest. Okay, Tahiri said. She didn't need Vong sense to tell how excited Scud was, but he needed to stay on track. Do you think she'll be ready to come down with us at dawn? I think, he said confidently. She's still irascible. Likely to bite our heads off if we press too hard, and I don't mean figuratively. But still, we've got her excited. She hasn't talked about shaping with anyone in years. Good. Tahiri crossed her arms over her chest. Because getting her off this mountain is what we came for. Everything else is secondary, do you understand? That includes your scientific curiosity. Of course, Scut nodded. Still, once this is all over, I think I need to spend more time on this world. Yeah, Tahiri said softly. Me too. He turned to look at her. You. I thought you'd have Jedi duties. I'm not exactly a Jedi, she admitted. Then what are you? That was the billion credit question, the one she'd been fumbling with half her life. Jedi, Sith, U.S. and Vong, Bounty Hunter, Tuscan. Tahiri, Rena, all of those names and titles seemed like ephemeral labels slapped onto her, whatever ever shifting thing she was. Kind of like Jason Solo, she thought with a chill. It doesn't matter what I am, she said softly, staring at the silver gas giant's faded arc. What matters is where I am, what I'm doing, who I'm doing it with, and I think I'd like to spend more time on Zanum a second. Okay, said Scott. So once we fix the hyperdrives, defeat Dala, get rid of Alpha Red, and save the Alliance from the True Honor Fleet, we can take time off and commune with nature. Sounds like a plan. I'm sure we'll have no problems with any of that. Tahiri sighed. Are you always this sarcastic? It's important to be realistic, he said more seriously. It's how we stay alive. To that, Tahiri had to agree. Jagged Phil sat behind the desk of his ready room, looking at the report on the communications array. Sial Antilles, seated across from him, had just given him a verbal rundown of the findings, but he skimmed through the technical details anyway. He was not an expert in communications technology, but he always wanted to be thorough. Working at our current pace, I'm hoping to have the long-range transceiver back online within seven hours, Sial was saying. All the other battle damage has been repaired, so we're essentially back to full fighting status. Jagged frowned. Why did we have to go EV to find damage on the comm? Shouldn't our onboard diagnostics have picked up this error? Sayal shook her head. There's a good chance there's an error in the communications firmware. When the transceiver was damaged, the console thought it kicked to backup systems, but that transceiver doesn't have backup systems. So the computer was, what? running subroutines through systems that didn't exist. Something like that, sir. 
Jagged groaned and placed the datapad on his desk. Well, that is lovely. Reminds me why I never wanted to be a slicer. Sayal nodded. Piloting was my forte too, sir. Jag regarded her. And look at us now, Captain. Piloting our desks. My father said he had to be dragged behind one of these kicking and screaming. I'm thinking maybe I should have kicked and screamed too. You're young to be commanding a ship, Jag commented. He hoped it sounded like a compliment. Garrick Lauren thought I was best for the mission, Sial said. I trust Lauren's judgment. He's a smart man. Jag stroked his beard. Did you want it though? Or would you have preferred to be flying a fighter wing? To be honest, sir, I was getting sick of flying. I wanted a change of pace. And now you want back in the cockpit. I suppose so, sir. Jack smiled. I know exactly how you feel, Captain. And for what it's worth, my father was a frontline man too. He always wanted to be leading the charge, give an example to his troops. Sayal nodded but didn't say anything. Jack was annoyed and couldn't quite say why. He wanted something from Sayal. Something besides the commander's subordinate routine. But what? She was his cousin, yes, but what did that mean to a man whose own sister was a stranger? He speaks very highly of your father, Jag ventured. I know they only served together for a short time, but he always told me Wedge Antilles was a fine pilot and a fine man. I was glad to find out both were true. Thank you, Sayal said. Her smile was honest and grateful, but she didn't volunteer any information. Maybe Wedge Antilles had never told his daughters about Baron Sunter Fell. Maybe he had, and it wasn't very good. Jag's father was not the friendliest man in the galaxy. Then, a little awkwardly, she asked, Is my aunt well? Of course, the other Sial, Antilles. The original. I believe so, yes. So Winsa has told me. I have, not actually seen my parents in almost ten years. Deep sadness showed in Sile's eyes, but she nodded dutifully. I see, sir. No, they weren't going to get past her today. Jag was disappointed, but not surprised. He didn't know what to make of his cousin, and she didn't know what to make of him. Instead, they both fell back on military formality that ran in their blood. Then he thought of Mary. Clearly it was thicker in some blood than others. How is your sister? Jag asked. Sial blinked. I think she's catching rack time now. I can't image what that must have felt like. Your sister coming back from the dead. Jack settled back in his chair, feeling heavy. He would give anything to Davin, Chak, Sam, or Cheris again. Sial posture relaxed too. Words can't describe. Sir, she said with an open smile. I'm hoping we can get the comm system fixed soon, so I can let our parents know. And how is your sister? Commander. Jack slumped a little more in his chair. Well, I suppose. I hope. I have some trouble understanding what she's thinking. I know the feeling, said Sayal. But she came back to the nebula to save you? I think that says a lot. Maybe she'd come back for him. Maybe she got in direct orders from Chilla. Jack had no idea. He wanted to believe the former, of course. But when he tried to take himself back 20 years, re-enter the mind of a dogmatic chess soldier who never met Jaina Solo, he could not be sure. His father had once told him that sometimes in life a man must choose between love and duty. Jag had chosen love, but when? It seemed like all the love had been burned out of her, leaving only duty. Exile does strange things, he muttered. It doesn't just separate you from the people you care about, it separates them from each other. You leave a big gap in people's lives, gaps you don't even think about most of the time, but they are there. And then, he shook his head. The sister I remember from before my exile, and the one I'm working with now might, as well be totally different beings, and I can't help but wonder whether I'm at fault somehow. Sayal cleared her throat. Sir, have you tried saying any of this to her? Jack sat upright, jerked out of his reverie. No, Captain. I suppose I haven't. Well, she's your sister, sir. She should be willing to hear you out, at least. Perhaps, Jag admitted. I think that. Suddenly a voice squawked over the room's comm system. 
Commander Fell, this is the bridge. Commander Fell. Report. Jag and Sayal barked in unison. Um, Commander, Captain. A ship had just dropped into our interdiction field, and is heading this way. A U.S. Vong ship. Both of them jumped out of their seats. Jag said, put the fleet on red alert. We're on our way. Jag was out in the hallway a second later, his cousin right behind him. Chapter 10 The last time Mary Antilles had been rocked out of bed by an alarm and scrambled to her fighter, it hadn't ended well. This time she had her sister and a whole fleet at her back, so maybe it would go better this time. Maybe. She was comforted by the fact that the Wraiths were not taking the lead on this expedition. Starless scrambled to full fighter squads in addition to the half dozen pilots in their stealth fighters, including Spade Squadron and A Wing Interceptors and Dagger Squadron and Ewings. The Spades jetted ahead of the other fighters, but even they lagged behind Nave Squadron's Ewings and a squadron of TIE Interceptors from Vindicator. The Imperial ships and the carrier Karuska Gem were closer to the approaching ship and launched their craft first. Myri flicked her comlink to an open channel and picked up the broadbeam transmissions from Nave Leader. U.S. Vong ship, please identify yourselves. I repeat if you can hear. Please give some indication. Carking good, that'll do. Trey's voice rattled in her ear. Open com, smiles, Vort reminded him. Trey shut up and let them listen. Nave Leader repeated his request for identification for about a minute before a now voice cracked over Mary's headset. We are heart of flame, seeking assistance, said a voice in guttural basic. Where did you come from, flame? We come from true honor. We have fled them. You see, our ship is damaged. Slow your approach, heart. Please, we request to land on Zanima. Heart, slow your approach and prepare to dock with one of our vessels. No! The voice snapped. Not with infidel. We will only land on Zanima. Heart, I repeat, slow down or we will open fire. Nave leader, Jagged Fell's voice filled Mary's ears, fire a shot over their bow. Copy, Starless. Firing warning shot. In the far distance, past the glow of Space Squadron's burning engines, Myrie saw the flash of a few lasers. Starless, she is not slowing. After a short pause, Fell said, aim for her engines. All squads, red alert. Mary saw a few more red darts up ahead as Nave Squadron's Ewings did their runs on the ship. As far as Mary's eyes and sensors could tell, the ship wasn't firing back. The Naves did one pass, then spun around for another while the A-Wings and Ties got closer to intercept range. Then there was a bright flash of light. Report. Fell barked. Starless, this is Nave lead. It just blew, wait. Wait. There's more ships. Mary's scanners blinked, recalibrated, and suddenly reported four ships charging toward the planet. Three U.S. Vong, the other, undetermined. All ships attack, Fell said. Keep them from reaching the planet. You heard him, Fort said. Wraiths, full speed ahead. Mary clicked confirmation and maximized speed. The four new ships were charging fast ahead, trailing hearts debris in their wake. These ones were coming in hot, firing madly, taking two of Space Squadron's and wings in their initial volley. As they got closer, Mary got a better look at all four of them. Three were the lumpy rock-like ships she expected of the U.S. involved, but the fourth was something else entirely. It looked like a giant eyeball, connected by pylons branching off either side that in turn fanned out to weapon-like sails. It was utterly bizarre and unlike anything she'd seen before. A full flight of dagger squad burst into flame, refocusing Mary's attention. The ships were almost upon them, and they were not slowing down. Wraiths, pulling tight on me, Vort Commander. We're going after the lead shuttle. Mary weaved her ship closer to Vort's, dropping into his lower aft next to Trey's fighter. All six stealth fighters pointed their matte black noses at the lead shuttle and charged. Torps, double fire. On my mark, said Vort. Mary dropped her sights on the shuttle. It noticed them and belched flame like projectiles from his forward cannon. Mark. 
Mary double tapped her trigger, sending a pair of torps speeding through space. The other wraiths fired too and pulled up in perfect formation. Explosions seemed to blossom all at once. There was a flash of fire and light right next to Mary, buffeting her craft, while up ahead their torpedoes slammed into the shuttle's forward diving basils, overwhelming them, cracking its Yorick coral hull and spilling it gus out into space. Even as debris and bodies were flushed out into the vacuum, the shuttle plunged towards Zonima second. Where smiles? Rand squawked. I can't see smiles. Fear effect. Thames snapped. I don't have him either. He was on my wing, Mary said, mouth suddenly dry. She checked her scanner, four stealths plus hers. No tray. Did he go EV? Vort asked, voice strangely calm. I got no signal, Thames said. That doesn't mean he's gone, Myrie insisted. Alert. Alert. A new voice screamed over her headset. New ships entering the system. Mary wheeled her ship away from the planet and checked her scanners. On the edge of the gravity well, ships were popping in one after another and approaching at best sublight speed. A glance at scanners told it all. Imperial class star destroyer. Nebula class star destroyer. Three Marauder Corvettes, two Lancer frigates, two Bothan assault cruisers, two Mon Cal ships, another Imp star. Oh, Miri rasped. Oh, Sith spawn. As they willed to face the coming onslaught, their old quarry charged onward to Zonima II. As Phil Iyer stood on Chimera's bridge, watching the battle unfold, she couldn't help but feel like her entire life had been leading to this moment. Her childish dreams of fighting for the Empire, her hard labors at the Academy, her early service, the assignment to Trinity, Justifier's blazing destruction, and her hard choice in Dallas holding cell, all of it had led her here. While Dalla hovered close to the tactical holo, commanding the larger fleet movements, Philair stayed in the crew pit near the navigation station. Lieutenant, she told the chief helmsman, take us closer to the Chiz vessel. Prepare a firing solution. Yes, ma'am. Contact the main flight bay. Tell them to launch squadrons 1, 3, 4, and 5. Keep the others on standby. Yes, ma'am. Phil Iyer held her breath as he relayed her orders without hesitation. She still could not believe she was here, commanding this legendary ship, giving orders and watching them be obeyed without hesitation. The deck rocked tipping her against the back of the helmsman's chair and dispelling her disbelief. This was not a dream come true, this was a deadly combat zone, and she had to get used to it. Damage team, report, she said. Negative. Just fire on our port shields. Source. Chis Clawcraft from Celestial. Three squads. Have squads four and five screen them. Call new order for assistance. Yes, ma'am. Phil Iyer moved down to the end of the crew pit, clambered up the ladder, and stepped onto the main deck near the tactical station. Good, Dalla said when she saw it. Don't be afraid to let your crew know you're willing to get in the pit with them. Thank you, she nodded. What's the status? The U.S. Hinvong ships have broken their fighter screen and are heading for the planet, Dalla said. But they don't matter. We can't take care of them once we kill the enemy fleet. Phylire scanned the tactical holo. Trinity had already lost several ships in previous engagements, and what she had left was formidable, but not as impressive as the combined renegade fleets. As she watched, the markers representing Phoenix, Philia, and Dayrilin were vectoring for Jagged Fell's flagship. Captain Pavrick's carrier Karuska Jim was spilling out an entire wing of fighters, but his actual batteries were no match for those of Nyathal and Lacenta closing in. Captain Omphalm's Mondromeda was being protected by Captain Theron's Liberty Star, but one star destroyer would not be enough to protect the interdictor from Revolutionary, Sunbeam, and two additional Karelian gunships. Closer to Chimera, Captain Vernadus Vindicator and his flanking anti star fighter frigates were tangling with the star destroyer Resolve and Dallas three Marauder class corvettes. Vernadette, an old human man, had shown no qualms with taking orders from a young Twilic woman, and Phil Iyer felt sad to think that he may soon be killed. She felt sad thinking of Jag Fell and the others too. 
she bore no ill will to the crew of Trinity Fleet. You can't hesitate, Dalla said, as if sensing her thoughts. These are people, Phil Iyer said, not Yuas and Vong. They are protecting the Vong, and that makes them the enemy. Dalla said firmly, Jagged Fell is a good man, but his misplaced idealism threatens the entire galaxy. The bridge shook as a turbolaser volley from Celestial scattered over their forward shields. Chimera returned his own fire, and the battle was on. We have to offer him the chance to surrender, she told Dalla. We will, the old woman nodded. But he won't take it. He's too honorable. I know, Phil Iyer said gravely. Something flashed on the tactical holo. The Trinity frigate Nova Burn crumpled under fire from Resolve and exploded. She could see his dying flare distantly through the forward viewport. Philior's mouth went dry. Captain Orville. Nearly 300 good men and women, humans and aliens, all of whom had trusted her just a few days ago. Chimera shuddered under another volley from Celestial. Dalla laid a firm hand on her shoulder and said, This is the way it has to be, Captain. Philair nodded and blinked a little moisture from her eye. Admiral, I think, I think we should recall resolve. Dalla glanced at the holo where the Star Destroyer was now exchanging direct fire with Captain Bernadette's ship in an equally matched brawl. Celestial is giving us a heavy slug in, Admiral. If we combine our fire and our starfighter screens, we should be able to take it out. Wysafel is a more important target than Bernadette. Dalla considered, then said, I'll give the order. Philair felt breath escape her lungs as Resolve left Vindicator to fend off the buzzing marauders and made a line for Chimera and Celestial. She was going to fight and kill people she'd worked with, she accepted that, but she didn't want to kill any more Imperials, especially good men like Vernadette. As for Jag and Fell's sister, well, they had never seemed close anyway. She glanced at the tactical holo. Another light winked out. In the far distance, Liberty Star smoldered, burned, and died. Philair was sure there'd be more of that to come. Jag's heart jumped in his throat as Captain Theron's holo image suddenly winked out. He turned away from the comm station, stalked past Starless's main tactical holo, and watched it with his own eyes. Revolutionary was an old Victory-class destroyer, and Sunbeam was just a Majestic-class cruiser, but together they had managed to overwhelm the larger Liberty Star. Revolutionary poured a volley of turbolaser fire that collapsed her shields while Kaywin bombers from Sunbeam lobbed torpedoes right into her bridge. The entire command tower had disintegrated, trailing smoke and debris as the rest of Liberty Star began to drift in space. Mondromeda waited helplessly while Sunbeam, Revolutionary, and the two gunships circled it like hungry vultures. Jag wanted to do something, anything to save Captain Omflam, but he had no ships to spare. There was nothing to do except watch him die. Commander, Traz Creffy called from the tactical station. Resolve has broken away from Vindicator. She's heading for Celestial. Suddenly it all vanished from his awareness. The clamor on the bridge, the three capital ships looming toward him, the firefight scattered around Zanima Sackett's orbit, the U.S. and Vong ships on the ground, the men and women dying by the hundreds. Everything was reduced to Wysafel. Jag hurried back to the communication station. Get me a channel to Commodore Fell. Now. Yes, Commander, the lieutenant said. Thirty seconds felt like forever until his sister's blurry blue holo image appeared where, just a minute ago, the late Captain Theron had been. Commodore, there's another Star Destroyer heading your way, he said. You have to disengage from Chimera and get out of there. Now. We've seen it and are taking appropriate measures, Wynn said. Her voice was controlled but her image was rent by bursts of static. Every time it disappeared Jag's heart stopped beating, afraid that what had just happened to Theron would happen to his sister. Commodore, he insisted, pull back and help defend Jim. That's an order. Wines's image blurred, and static crackled over her words. When she came back, she said, Room for maneuverability? If we try to flee, we'll expose our aft. Just do it. Jagged shouted so loud the whole bridge could hear. Fall back. Fall back now. We'll comply, Wynn said curtly. Celestial out. 
Jack stalked back to the tactical holo, hoping to get a better view of his sister's retreat. When he saw it, a sense of dread took hold of his body. Resolve was already within firing range, heaping laser on Celestial's flank while Chimera continued to pound its front. The Chiss vessel was tough, but it was no match for two Imperial class star destroyers. Winesa didn't have a chance. Jack stared at the holo, frozen in a state of helplessness. He could only think. It wasn't fair. He'd lost Davin and Cheris when he was a child, Sim and Chak when he was an adult, and each time their deaths had been relayed by a holo message or the impersonal declaration of some Chiss officer. Now when his last sibling was about to be killed before his eyes, and there was nothing he could do. He went back to the front viewport, maneuvering days through the scrambling bridge crew. He squinted at the fire in the distance, desperate to see it with his own eyes. Two star destroyers were pouring blazing green plasma at one battered target. He saw the first spikes of flame as they tore through the shields and began ripping up the ship, exposing its guts to vacuum, burning away its oxygen and twisting its superheated durasteel hull to mangled wreckage. Commander, a voice said softly behind him, Celestial's engines are down. So are her shields. Jag looked over his shoulder to see Sial, Antilles. Her face was dark with bitter understanding. Thank you, Captain, he rasped. He couldn't manage any more. Commander, Creffy called from the tactical station. Chimera is sending boarding parties. Celestial is starting to fire escape pods and deploy shuttles but the imps still have a strong fighter screen going. They won't get far. Wynn would never abandon ship. He knew that. Still, he lurched back to the communication station. He had the tiniest, flimsiest spark of hope, and he had to follow where it led, no matter how painful. After an excruciating minute, the comm officer was able to get a signal to Celestial. His sister stood on the before him one last time, image torn by static. Wynn, he said, you have to get out. Get out now. Dallas sending boarding parties. She probably wants to raid the ship. We know, Wynsa said coolly. We're securing all special cargo now. Alpha Red. He hadn't even thought about it since the battle started. Jack shook his head and said, Win, you have to get out of there. Dalla will capture you? Believe me, you don't want that. I will never be taken alive. Wynsa said firmly. I've just activated the self-destruction within this ship. Of course. Jag had been away from the Chiss so long that he'd forgotten. All major warships were built with self-destruct systems to prevent them from falling into enemy hands. It was the sort of thing to expect from the Chiss, secretive and ruthless. Suddenly Sial Antilles appeared behind him. She said over his shoulder, Commodore fell. The knowledge you have is just as valuable as the special cargo. If the mission is to continue, we need you. There is no mission left, Wynsa said bitterly. Jack couldn't argue. Trinity was crumbling under the sustained onslaught of the combined renegade fleets. Unless Zanima's second managed to perform one of his miracles, they would be forced to either surrender or die within the next hour. Commodore, Sayal pressed, staying on that ship is the same as death. Wynsa looked frustrated. It is the captain's duty to see to the well-being of every being on her ship. I must oversee the evacuation. I cannot abandon my crew, captain. Then slag your duty. What about your brother? Captain Antilles, please, Jack said. He felt something wet in his eye. He blinked it away, faced Wynsa's blurring image, and said, Don't do it for me, when? Think of father. Think of mother. She doesn't deserve to lose her last child. I am not her last child, said Wynn. They lost me a long time ago. Jack shook his head. Please, Wynn. Static overcame the image, and for a horrible drawn out moment he thought she might be gone forever. Then she appeared again. Through the blurry holo it was hard to tell, but she almost looked contrite. Even if we get to the shuttles, they have a fighter screen, Wynn said. We can't break through that. You'll have help, Sayal said. I promise. Went flickered again, came back. She nodded and said, we will try. Celestial out. And then she was gone. Jack stared at the turned off console for a long moment. His mind was empty. 
His body fell slack, like it was going to fall over forever. Then somebody from across the bridge reported, Phoenix is approaching, three minutes to fire in range. Jack turned around and stared at the chaotic scene on Starless's bridge. Sial, standing next to him, placed a hand on his shoulder. We'll need to send a fighter screen to help cover them. The closest friendly is probably Vindicator, so we'll send them to Vernadin. What fighters? Jack croaked. I'll send the daggers, spades, torches, and the wraiths. We can't spare those. Jack waved hand at the tactical holo. We have a Star Destroyer and two Bakken cruisers inbound. We need something to defend with. We'll think of something. Right now, Weinson needs help. Sial squeezed his shoulder. Besides, I think Miri owes me a favor. Chapter 11 The first hints of dawn were creeping through the eastern sky. The veils of mist that hung between the mountains was turning shades of gray, silver, and blue. It was a sunrise unlike anything Tahiri had seen in a very long time, and she wanted to savor it, but she felt anxious. The Force was speaking to her, but she couldn't tell what it was saying. She sensed confusion and pain somewhere. Not on this mountain clearing with the U.S. involved, but somewhere far away. That could have meant elsewhere on the planet or it could have meant halfway across the galaxy. She wished, very badly, that she had taken some kind of long-range transmitter up the mountain. As it was, it rested with the shuttle in the bottom of the valley, and she had no intention of attempting that dangerous trek until daylight had fully crested the mountain peaks. She stood in the clearing and watched the dark sky, half expecting something to come out of it. Kadra Val and Scut were resting in the sleeping bags brought from the shuttle, having finally worn themselves out with Shaper Talk. Vletham and Nareth were curled up, asleep or at least unmoving, while Vario Shea prepared a morning fire. Kilaquad was inside her demudek, doing who knew what. None of them seemed agitated like she was, but she reminded herself that this was to be expected. For a long time, she'd been around Jedi and assumed Jedi-like abilities and traits from those around her. Now, after less than a day surrounded by U.S. and Vong, she was still getting reacquainted with their very different set of abilities. Vary O'Shea was putting the last few branches on the burning pit when Keela Quad emerged from her demudek. The shaper half stumbled outside. Her long neck was bent back, and she was staring up at the pre-dawn sky. What is it? Tahiri asked in U.S. and Vong. What do you see? Nothing, the old shaper hissed. But my biots, my guardians, they send something approach. Scut and Kadra Val, alerted by their speech, stirred within their sleeping bags. Tahiri pulled her lightsaber off her belt. I feel a distress in the force. I can't tell where it is. As she spoke, an icy sensation stabbed her awareness. She sensed cold, brooding determination that screamed Sith. There was no Sith like anger. Its icy intent and cutting ruthlessness reverberated with power of the dark side. They're coming, Tahiri muttered, shocked back to speaking in basic. Scut said, flinging back his sheets. There. Kilaqua stabbed a finger up at the sky. Tahiri stared, squinted, but saw nothing. What about those defenses? Scut sounded on verge of panic. Can't they stop it? Tahiri saw two flashes in the sky. Then a third. Flares seemed to fall from a point overhead, tracing brilliant arcs as they fell toward the base of the mountain. Before they could reach the forest, they flared again, then dissolved into darkness. What was that? Kadra Val said as she rose to her feet. No, Kilaqua said, visibly stunned. It can't be. What can't be? Tahiri snapped. He seated my forest. Kilaqua's shock turned to anger. He put my pets to sleep. You mean we're defenseless? Scut looked around. Who's coming? Villeth Dow? Kodra Val said bitterly. It has to be. Tahiri understood it all in an instant. Somehow, for some reason, Kila Kwa's ex-apprentice was coming back for her, and this time he wasn't going to take no for an answer. And this time, he was bringing Sif. Tahiri's lightsaber hummed to life. She heard the sound of an aircraft rending atmosphere, but no scream of engines, which meant a U.S. Hinvong ship. She stared upward again, 
and finally saw the lumpy shape of a U.S. Hanvong shuttle resolving out of the dim western sky. Twin bursts of flame shot from the nose of the shuttle. Tahiri ducked instinctively, as did the others, but the burning rockets shot over their heads. Before Tahiri could stand and recover, the shuttle swung low over the mountainside clearing with the silent agility of a coral skipper. A half dozen figures flung themselves out of the hole in the port side of the shuttle. Scut was scrambling for his blaster, and Nareth and Koldraval snapped their amphistaffs to life. Kila Quad stood frozen beneath the shuttle as six black forms fell to earth around her. A blood-red lightsaber blade flared to life, and Tahiri charged. Before she could get close, a blast of force energy knocked her off her feet. The U.S. Hinvong, unaffected, ran forward to be met by five of their own. As Tahiri scrambled back up, she saw a tall figure in a shaper's headdress wrap an arm around Kila Kwa's shoulders. The old shaper kicked and struggled, and Vario Shea moved in to help her. One U.S. Hinvong in warrior armor moved to block him, and Shea whipped his amphistaff staff around the warrior's legs, knocking him to the ground. Before he could raise his staff back up, a brilliant red saber blade flashed through the night, and Vary O'Shea's head tumbled from his shoulders and hit the damp earth with a sickening thunk. Nareth and Vletham shouted in fury and charged forward. Other warriors moved to block them while the Sith turned to face Tahiri. The red glow of his lightsaber revealed a hideous face, laced with red and black tattoos in some elaborate tribal pattern, topped by a pair of devilish horns. Tahiri charged across the clearing, and the Sith charged to meet her. Their sabers clashed in the dark, hissing and spitting sparks and flashes of light. This Deveronian in swirling black robes was half a meter taller than her, almost twice as big. He pressed his saber against hers and knocked her back a full step. She pulled back, ducked beneath the wide horizontal swung, and stabbed at his legs. She scored a shallow blow at his left calf, and he jumped back, hissing. Behind him, Tahiri saw the two shapers being pulled into the belly of the shuttle, as she knew she was already lost. The other U.S. Hinvong were still fighting beneath the hovering shuttle. She heard Scut's blaster pistol go off but didn't see any bolts. One U.S. Hinvong gored another with an amphistaff, but she couldn't tell who fell and who killed. It flashed by in an instant. Then the Sith was on her. He was bigger than her, stronger than her probably more powerful in the force too. His heavy blows knocked her back, one step, two, three, toward the edge of the clearing. In desperation and despair she tried to summon the bitterness and anger that had fueled her as Darth Kedis's apprentice. Both came easily. Kila Quad was already captured. She'd failed, yet again, just like she failed Anakin, failed Nin Yim, failed Jaina, and Anakin's parents failed everyone who ever believed in her or thought she could be something other than a billion broken pieces. She pressed forward, lightsaber moving faster than the Sith's. She knocked him back, two steps, and took another swipe at his legs. He jumped over her blade, swung his own down like a cleaver. She dropped, rolled, leaving saber scorched earth behind. She came out of her roll and spun back to face the Sith, lightsaber raised and was thrown into the forest by another force blast. Tahiri tumbled through the dark, lightsaber spinning out of her hand. The tree knocked her shoulder, her head hit the dirt. She slammed into a fallen log and stayed there for a second and forever, dazed and pained and blind in the dark. She reached out with the force, felt her lightsaber, turned it to life and called it to her hand. Its blue blade wheeled through the forest, slicing through branches and twigs, and his handle slapped into her hand just as the devil horned Sith fell on her like a bird of prey. She deflected his blade but pinned to the base of the log it was all she could do. Blue and red blades flashed in the dark, sparking, echoing through the dark woods. Every blow seemed to stab her deeper into the ground. Her arms ached. Her hands stung. She didn't know how long she could hold. Suddenly the Sith reared back, shouted, he spun to see what was behind him, and Tahiri saw the red of his lightsaber illuminate the hideous, deformed face of Lethan. The extolled raised one deformed, claw-like hand in defense, while the other brought an amphistaff round for another strike. The Sith brought his lightsaber down in one underhanded swing, effortlessly cutting Vlethem in half. 
No! Tahiri screamed and charged forward. Another failure. Another life lost because of her. She didn't have the strength for anger anymore, only bitterness and despair. She swung wildly at the Sith, but he held his ground. He blocked two blows, three, then stabbed his blade forward, taking her in the side. Pain shot up from beneath her rib cage, and she screamed in hot agony. She fell back, only to slam into the thick trunk of a tree. Her lightsaber hung at her side, and she hadn't the strength to lift it. The Sith before her raised his weapon and charged for the killing strike. Live. A voice screamed in her mind. The Sith seemed to freeze mid-blow. Her awareness reached out, her force and her vong sense both. The two halves of her, so separate always, seemed unified and whole. With the force she watched him charge, slowly. With her vong sense, she summoned Vlethem's amphistaff to her free hand. Strength came to her from nowhere and her arm shot up. The Sith's blade hissed and crackled against the amphistaff held high over her head. For a moment she saw the Sith's face in the light of his sparking lightsaber, and she caught the shock in his eyes. Then her lightsaber whipped up. The Sith's knees went slack. His lightsaber fell from his hand. His horn head tumbled off his shoulders, rolled downhill, and was lost in the brush. Tahiri stood in the dark forest, panting. She felt a dim sensation, like a hand brushing her cheek. Liv, the voice in her head said again, she knew in her heart it was Anakin's. When she was ready, she staggered back up the hill by the light of her saber. When she got to the clearing, the shuttle was gone, and so was Kila Quad. Four U.S. Hinvong bodies were sprawled in the clearing, Very O'Shea's headless corpse among them. Scott was there too, shifting and moaning in pain while Kodra Val tried to do something for his leg. Nerith stood at the mouth of Quad's Demudek with an empty look in his eyes. Tahiri shut off her lightsaber. To the east, mist glowed with the light of dawn. At the hyperdrive shafts, they at least got a warning. What good it would do? Venku wasn't sure. He knew that he, for one, was not in any condition to fight off an invasion by whoever was coming for them. Shrill alert sirens wailed through the air. People swarmed around the three shuttles on the landing pad, stuffing them full of supplies in preparation for an emergency retreat. There was no way to fit everyone and everything in the, and anyone able-bodied and capable of fighting was being asked to stay here and defend the hyperdrive cores. You sure you don't want to go, Katika? Muriel asked from his side. Venku looked at the old clone. You sure you don't? Muriel laughed. Just a few days back I bagged me a moth. I can't handle a few von gays. That was Muriel, of course, brash and bragging to the end. He looked to see Gata walking across the landing bay from the command center. Bess, Gendry, and Jaina Solo were not far behind. Oya Bartica, Mario called. You taking the last ship out? Gata had his eyes on Venku. I think I'll be staying here. I already explained, Jaina said. I need Bess and Gendry here. We don't have many people who can fight. What's the matter, GDI? Muriel crossed his arms over his armored chest. Think I'm too old to bust some Vongi's gets. I won't make you. Jaina looked at Venku. I won't make you either. I won't leave my people behind, Venku said firmly. He might not be able to run and gun, but he figured he could sit and snipe if he had to. Okay, Jaina sighed. Well, they should be here any minute. I want you at defensive positions along the north engine's rim. What are we looking at here? Mariel asked. Vanjis. Dala. One U.S. Hinvong landing ship, she said grimly. Ha! Mariel barked. I can't eat one of those for breakfast. It's afternoon, Babur, Gentry muttered. Hey now, Mariel spun on him. I'll have you know. Fear feck, Jaina said. Incoming, seven o'clock. All eyes went to the sky above. Something had pierced the cloud layer. From here it looked like a dark oval hovering over the landscape, but it was getting incrementally larger. Stations, Jaina commanded. Now. As Jaina darted off, Bess looked up at the sky, sighed, and said, I wish they'd let me keep my bye. No kidding, Mariel grunted. Venku knew the feeling. 
All he had were the lightsabers at his hip and the verping sniper rifle slung over his shoulder. Normally the verp's targeting system patched directly into his helmet hood, but since they'd left their bice back at the village, he'd have to use the built-in scope. Bess and Gendry broke into a jog, quick but not so fast it left the old guy's breathing dust. Venku could walk fast so long as he was on even ground, and that's what he did now, as the second shuttles kicked up air and pushed themselves off the landing pad. Isn't this Shabla planet supposed to defend itself? Muriel said as they reached the rim of the north engine well. Only when it wants to, apparently, Gadab said. What kind of deal is that? Muriel said as he checked the gas canister in his Blast Tech E67 carbide. Don't ask me. Will of the Force. You get in anything. Muriel looked to Gadab, then Venku. From the Force, I mean. Gadab shook his head, Venku too. The old clone swore, then lay his body flat along the thick metal edge of the shaft. There was a railing all around to prevent people from just tumbling in, but if you went down on your belly you had enough space to squeeze head, shoulders, and the rest of you through. But that was the last thing Venku wanted. He tried a short trot along the rim but found himself exhausted after just 20 meters. That still gave him a different angle of fire from Gadab and Muriel, so he dropped to his belly and prepped his rifle. The clone and the ex-Jedi were doing the same, while Gendry and Bess rode the lift down several levels into the shaft to join with some of the other defenders. Venku spared a moment to wonder where Jaina Solo had gone off to. Then the attack began. The U.S. Hinvong shuttle swung over the south engine first. It however for a moment around the base of the vane, some 30 meters over the mouth of the shaft, and dropped two dozen U.S. Hinvong paratroopers like seed spores. It swung over to the north shaft to do the same, but at least they had a warning. Venku rolled on his back and began firing manually upward at the shuttle as it passed. Gata, Muriel, and the other defenders on top did the same. Laser blasts smoked the rock-like hull of the shuttle, and when the portal opened on its starboard side to let the paratroopers fall, the Mandos concentrated all the fire they had on it. Two Vongis got riddled in the chest and fell into the bottomless shaft without evening firing their chutes. Venku rolled onto his belly, brought up the scope, and plugged another in his big ugly forehead right as he fell into the mouth of the shaft. Others kept falling and began throwing down their explosive thud bugs at Gendry. Bess, and the other defenders inside the shaft. The handheld laser fire had apparently damaged the shuttle. It wobbled soundlessly over the north shaft, then lurched away. Venku rolled onto his back again to track it and saw that it was heading for the central vein. Thunder clapped and shockwave tore through the air. He heard Muriel give a surprised yelp as a concussion mission tore through the Vongi's shuttle. It dropped like a rock in the middle of the landing bay, pouring black smoke into the sky. Venku adjusted his position to see the big Wookiee with the shoulder mount missile launcher standing at the entrance to the command center, waving a furry fist in the air and roaring victoriously. Then three black streaks raced out of the burning wreckage, faster than any human or Vong. The Wookiee was thrown to the ground and let out a scream of pain. A group of humans burst out of the command center's blast doors, dropped to their knees, and began firing at whatever black beasts had burst onto the scene. They looked like some mad hybrid between a lizard and an AKK dog, with three canted legs on either side, furry bodies, scaled muscular tails, and wide flat snouts with toothy, snapping jaws. They tore down one human, then another. Venku gaped in awe and horror, not even paying attention to the fight in the shaft. He brought up his rifle, stared through the scope though he had no hope of actually nailing of these monsters. Then, staring through the scope of his rifle, he saw the flash of a blue lightsaber blade. He'd seen Jaina Solo fight before, but not like this. She moved like an airborne acrobat, a blur of dark camo jumpsuit and dark brown hair, leaping, spinning, thrusting, barely touching ground. She sheared off all three legs from one side of a monster, sending and thrashing helplessly on the ground while the soldiers poured laser fire down its gaping, howling mouth. She went after another monster, slicing at his tail to get its attention. His massive body wheeled around with incredible speed and it vomited something from his open mouth. 
Solo leaped, dodging it, and threw herself over the back of the monster, trailing a streak of smoke and gore with her lightsaber. The monster howled, screamed, thrashed. A soldier, too close, was literally torn in half by his whipping tail. The other soldiers kept firing, and Jaina threw herself in the air one last time, coming down saber first, stabbing it right through the top of its head. For a moment she froze, lightsaber buried to the hilt right between his eyes, blowing blue tip jutting out of its throat. Then she pulled her saber out, jumped off, and let the monster collapse lifeless on the gore and debris strewn landing pad. He couldn't see the last one. Katika. Someone shouted, Got up or Mario? He pulled his eye away from the scope just in time to see it charging at him from his right flank. He froze, dead stopped, as the monster bore down on him with jaws open wide. Something slammed into the monster, knocking it off course. His six legs scrambled for purchase as Gadab dug his lightsaber into the monster's side. It locked, somehow, between the beast's armor plating, and as the old man struggled to wrench it free, the monster's body twisted. His tail whipped around, and his tip snapped through Gadab's left calf. Venku heard a sickening crunch, heard the old man wail, and saw him pitch forward. The monster spun on Gadab, Venku forgotten, and opened his hungry mouth. Then Jaina Solo was there. She threw herself at his other side and sliced off one leg. The monster roared and tried to take her town with his whipping tail. Venku, finally, scrambled to his feet. His balance was poor, his chest breathless, but he plucked his mother's lightsaber from his belt and threw himself at the animal. It was so distracted by Jaina and got up that it had forgotten its original quarry. He thrust both blades into his side one of them digging deeper into the wound Gadab had already made. The beast screamed, struggled. Jaina Solo leaped forward one more time, thrust her saber right into the monster's eye and spearing hot energy through his brain. The massive body suddenly went limp and collapsed on the ground. Viku and Jaina stared at each other over the dead monster's back, breathless, thankful it was finally over. Then Gadab screamed. They whirled in unison to see a U.S. Vong warrior standing over the old man, amphis staff driven, and between the armor plates on his back, pinning him to the ground. Got up, face down, writhed in agony as the Vong pulled the staff out of his gut with a sicking sound. Behind him, another was climbing out of the shaft. Venku roared and charged. Lost in unthinking rage, he slashed with both sabers, knocking the Vong's amphis staff out of his hand. He kept hacking, tearing one arm off his shoulder, scoring a deep gouge in his side. Finally, he brought both sabers to bear and tore his head from his shoulders. Behind it, the other Vong tumbled to the ground, blaster smoke pouring from the back of his head. Muriel was already getting to his feet and running for Gadab. All three of them converged on the old man. Jaina rolled him over, carefully, but blood was already spilling out from beneath him. His wrinkled old face was twisted in pain but Jaina grabbed one hand, held it tight. Mario bent over him, muttering Bartica, Bartica, don't go Bartica. Venku only stared, wordless, breathless, and helpless. He could feel it. He could feel him fading in the force. This man who had trained him, saved him over and over, guided him since he was a very small child, and he knew there was nothing he could do. He grabbed Gadab's free hand and squeezed it. It wasn't enough, but it was all he had. Then the ground started to rumble, and he knew things were going to get even worse. Some deep and awful roaring sounded within the engine shafts. A sound filled the air, like the sky being torn in two. He stared up, they all stared up, even as Gadab died before them. It looked like a knife had torn through the clouds overhead and the sky beyond was changing colors before his eyes. Even before she got to Ben, Vestera knew something had gone wrong. The initial plan, as she understood it, was to send four assault teams to strike different locations on Zanima Second. One shuttle, loaded with Voxen and U.S. Hinvong warriors, had been sent to disable the planet's hyperdrive core and prevent it from fleeing. The second had been sent to the mountaintop sanctuary where some U.S. Hinvong Shaper was hiding, Vilith Dal and Darth Vidya spearheaded that attack. 
Another attack team had been sent to ravage the largest settlement in the far distance, but it had been shot out of the sky during the initial approach on Zanima Second. The fourth team, riding not a U.S. Hanvong shuttle but the ancient Sith meditation sphere, was Vestra's own. She did not have to direct the vessel or search out Ben through the Force. Somehow, Ship knew exactly where he would be. It plunged into the planet's atmosphere and crept into his nightside shadow, so eager to find his former master that Vestra felt vaguely insulted. As Ship approached the village where Ben must be, she felt a stab of pain through the Force. Somehow, deep inside, she understood that Darth Vidius was dead. She didn't know how she knew the Deveronian Sith Lord had been no mentor to her like Lady Rhea, but he'd at least been a guy for a short time, close enough to create a bond in the Force. But she knew he was dead, which meant the mission to capture the Shaper had probably gone bad too. Vestera focused on the pain, drew strength from it. She'd lost so much already, Vidius was just fuel to the fire that would power her onward. Through ship's translucent walls, Vestera could see the faint lights of a village below, strewn out along what looked to be a small valley. The four U.S. Hinvong warriors crammed inside the ship with her stirred anxiously, clutching their amphistaffs to their chests. Vestera still felt strange and nervous with these beings she could not sense in the force, but so far, they'd shown no sign of turning on her. They knew, without fully understanding why, that the one Sith and true honor had conjoined fates, and one fell and rose with the other. In that, they were just like Vestera. Ship dove deep, hungry. His voice echoed in Vestera's mind. He is here? Here. Okay, Vestera muttered. Take me to him. The U.S. Hen Vong stared at her but said nothing. Ship swooped and low over the village, over low dome-shaped buildings lit from inside by burning fires. The entire scene was shockingly primitive, and Vestera felt a surge of excitement. If this village, this whole planet was still living in the Dark Ages, overtaking it should be easy. The rear portal of the meditation sphere suddenly opened, blowing cool, fresh air into the ship. The U.S. Hinvong let out a war cry and hurled themselves into the street. Vestera looked around ship's empty interior, said, wait here, and threw herself after them. At this time of the night the street was indeed empty. The warriors charged out to cause havoc which was all their mission entailed. They were a distraction, a way to keep this village confused while she sought out Ben. She stood beneath the hovering sphere, red lightsaber ignited before her, and reached out with the force, trying to pick up his familiar force signature. She found the faint life signals of non-Jedi, but nothing similar to the one she'd known so well, cherished, loved in her moments of weakness. Where is he? She said aloud, looking up at ship. You said he was here. He vanished, it said, like a blinking eye. What? She spat angrily. What does that mean? Is he here, or isn't he? Then she heard it, the snap hiss hum of a lightsaber coming to life. She turned and saw a figure standing in the entrance to a low domed building, holding a glowing blade before it. Vestera stepped closer, reached out with the force. This was not Ben's lightsaber and it was not Ben. She stepped closer, and in the figure's silhouette saw the shape of a woman, tall, long pale hair pulled off of her face. This woman was touching on the force, drawing strength from it, but in a feeble half-trained way. Who are you? Vestera said as she stepped closer. She held her blade in front of her but did not slow in caution. Whatever this woman was, Vestera wasn't scared of her. Stay back, the woman said. The fear in her voice was obvious. Vestera snorted. You're not a Jedi. I'm not, the woman admitted. Where did you get that lightsaber? It's mine. Vestera shook her head. You don't want to cross me. Just tell me where Ben Skywalker is. That's all I want. Somewhere in the distance, people began to scream. The woman's lightsaber dropped slightly as she strained to hear, and Vestera chose that moment to strike. The woman held up her saber to block one blow, then another. Vestera forced her back so her shoulder blades pressed against the frame of the door. Vestera grinned. It wasn't often she got to pin down someone weaker than her, someone utterly at her mercy. It was a good feeling and she savored it. 
where's Ben Skywalker? Tell me. Tell me, or I'll kill you. The woman snarled and took a swing as Vestra. Her thoughts bled into the force, and her attacks were easy to counter. The Sith sidestepped the blow and gave the woman a lazy, easy jab in the thigh. The woman screamed and dropped her lightsaber. She slumped against the doorframe, clutching her smoking leg. Is that all you can stand? Vestera hissed. What kind of fake Jedi are you? She held a hand before her and pinched two fingers together. The woman rose slowly into the air and her hands clawed vainly at her throat. Her head tilted back and choking sounds escaped her mouth as Vestera squeezed her trachea tighter and tighter until it was on the verge of snapping. Then, behind her, snap his hum. Vestera tossed the woman to the ground and turned around. There he was, standing in the middle of the street, right beneath ship. He had a violet blade but she knew it was Ben. However he'd hidden himself before, he now screamed at her through the force. Hello Ben? Vestera raised her lightsaber and stepped slowly toward him. It's been a while. Not long enough, Vez, Ben said. I'm not trying to kill you, she said. Then don't make me kill you, Ben said. She could hear his honesty, feel his emotions in the forest. He was ready to fight her, but he was not willing to kill her and that was why he would lose. She lunged, taking a swipe at his legs. Ben blocked, skirted back. They circled each other beneath ship, and the meditation sphere's thoughts echoed in both their minds. Good, good, it go to them. Anger, pain, suffering, give each other what you deserve. Shut up, Ben hissed. I should have Karking left you on Zayas. That was to be our fate, Ben Skywalker. Together we three are to find the end of the Jedi and the new beginning of the Sith. Not likely, Ben said, and lunged at Vestera. He went for her legs too, and she pushed his blade aside with her own. They traded quick feints, always aiming for limbs, neither willing to strike at vital organs. You don't have to do this, Vess, Ben said. If he thought she was taking it easy on him because she was soft, well, good. She could turn that to her advantage. She lunged forward and swung low, like she wanted to cut his legs off at the thigh. He blocked and gave her a forced shove, knocking her three steps back. He lunged after her, thrusting at her. She sidestepped and swiped down where his legs should have been, but he rolled to avoid her. He kicked up dirt as he rose back to his feet and spun around to block her downward swing. That one would have taken him right in the face, but he caught her blade with his own. Come on. Vez, Ben hissed. I don't know who's making you do this, but you don't have to. Could he know about Crate, about the strange dreams the Dark Lord had as he floated between death and life? No, impossible. Yet doubt flicked through her doubt of Ben, doubt of her own willingness to deliver him to the dragon, and in that moment Ben pushed against her blade. His two arms were stronger than her one, and she stumbled back. Ben swiped horizontally at her midsection cutting right above her hand. Her lightsaber sparked, flashed, and her blade died. She threw the smoking thing to the ground and suddenly stood before Ben, helpless. Ben took a step closer. He held out his spare hand while keeping his lightsaber ignited at his side. Come on, Vez, he said. You don't want to kill me, and I don't want to kill you. We can give this all up, Vez. All this Sith and Jedi stuff. Just live like people. That's what you always wanted, isn't it? Vestera shook her head violently. No. You're a fool. You don't understand. Yes, I do, Vez. The violet blade of his lightsaber receded, disappeared, and he stood before her as a dirty, panting, tired young man with pleading eyes. It was tempting, so tempting, to reach out and take his hand. Half her soul cried to do so. She didn't know what she'd do afterward, where they'd go together, but she knew it would be far, far away from all of this. But Lady Kai, Ship said, that is not your destiny. She reached out with the force. The blonde woman's lightsaber, lying discarded in the dirt, hissed to life. It flew through the air, a wheel of deadly light heading straight at Ben's flank. He pivoted and brought his own saber to life just in time to deflect it and send it spinning back into the street. It cut up a trail of dust before his light winked out. 
By then, Vestra was on him. She didn't even use the force. She came at him from the side when he was distracted and slammed a knee up right between his legs. He wheezed, dropped his lightsaber. She cracked an elbow right in his forehead, and the great heir to the Jedi Order collapsed in the dust like a sack of vegetables. Good, good, Ship cried gleefully. Come, Lady Kai. There is not much time. Vestera picked up Ben's lightsaber and hooked it on her belt. Then she picked up Ben's limp body with the force and floated it into Ship's open portal. With a short force propelled hop, she landed herself inside too. We must go, Lady Kai. Ship had suddenly gone from gleeful to panicked, and Vestera's sense of triumph disappeared. What about the Vong? She asked. She could still hear them attacking villagers somewhere in the distance. No time. Ship cried, and suddenly it flew into the air. The force of the acceleration slammed Vestera into the deck right next to Ben's unconscious form. She knew she'd have to bind him before he woke up, but Ship's mad flight was more worrying. Cold air rushed into the open portal until Ship remembered to close it. Through the translucent walls, she saw the lights of the village quickly shrink below her. What is it? She demanded, but Ship gave no answer. Suddenly the sky began to change colors. She looked at the night overhead and saw streaks of light overcome the stars. Ship? She shouted. What's happening? Is it? Suddenly everything shook. She had the sensation of tumbling, falling helplessly out of the sky. She was surrounded by whirling light and then her head slammed into something, and all she knew was black. Chapter 12 As her claw craft shuddered beneath her and the inside of Celestial's hangar gave way to a starfield torn by explosions and lancing plasma, Winsa fell felt nothing but shame. She was leading the last flight of claw craft left on Celestial, but even then, it felt like she was abandoning everything, her ship, her crew, the responsibilities she fought to gain for so long. The one salve was being in a claw craft again. She trained in the nimble fighter since she was a teenager, eager to follow the path blazed by her older pilot siblings, Davin, Cheris, most especially Jag. She'd admired them all, only to lose them one by one to flaming, heroic death, or in Jag's case, to a Jedi wife. Then she was tumbling through space, Lost in the moment, jerking her fighter's control stick this way and that, dodging green laser blasts as she tried to protect the evacuation shuttles punching their way through the fighter screen toward the distant gray wedge of Vindicator. The second renegade destroyer, Resolve, had already broken away from Celestial's drifting corpse to re-engage Captain Bernadette's ship. Combined with the attacks from the three nimble Marauder-class corvettes, they would deliver a major pounding and she didn't know how much Vernadette was willing to take just to rescue scraps of Celestial's crew. Vernadette's own TIE interceptors had pulled back just as three squadrons from Starless had arrived. The melange of Clawcraft, Ewings, and X-Wings were still outnumbered by the swarming TIEs from Chimera and Resolve, but at least now Winsa could tell who was friend and who was foe. She dropped in behind a TIE interceptor, that was lining up for a run on one of the shuttles and pumped blue laser blasts into its central cockpit, creating an exploding that sent both dagger-shaped solar panels spinning in different directions. Commodore, one of her pilot's voices crackled in her ear. Time is almost up. Self-destruct imminent. Copy, Weinsa said, and turned her comlink onto the broadest chiss frequency. All ships, self-destruct imminent. Clear celestial, repeat. Clear Celestial. She kicked her engines hard, outpacing the shuttles. She rolled her claw craft into a tight arc that pulled her back around to face Celestial, this time from a safe distance. Despite herself, she felt despair claw at her chest. Celestial had been her command, her responsibility, but in the end it had been helpless against the combined onslaught of two Imperial Star Destroyers. Now its systems were dead and its graceful dark body slowly drifted away from the ugly wedge of Chimera. She saw that Dallas destroyer was breaking away, her boarding shuttles returning to birth. They must have discovered the self-destruct countdown. A shame, Weinsa thought. She so wanted to take Dalla with her. There was a brilliant flash of light. Weinsa jerked her craft away lest she be blinded, even through the shaded lenses of her helmet. 
When the light dimmed Celestial's charred, blackened, twisted hull remained. She looked eagerly for damage to Chimera and saw some black scoring on the destroyer's underside, but nothing critical. Alch's craft, she told the general frequency. Punch for Vindicator. Go now. She hoped to take advantage of the confusion left by Celestial self-destruct. Unfortunately, it seemed the Imperial pilots had been told in advance. Most of them had escaped the blast and were now making runs on the fleeing shuttles. One right in front of Wyansa burst into flames, and she had to roll hard to port to keep from running through the blossoming debris field. Just as she pulled out of her roll, a chain of TIE fighters swooped down from the port side. Their laser fire splattered over Wyansa's shields, jerking her in her cockpit. Two dropped behind her and began lancing green plasma at her clawcraft. As she moved to evade, Something black flashed against the starfield ahead of her. She glanced at her tactical screen and saw both ties suddenly wink out. Chiss ships, this is Wraith Squadron. A harsh mechanical voice grated on her headset. The Gamorrean, Sabinering. Is Commodore Fell with you? Repeat, did Commodore Fell evacuate? Winds the switch to a matching frequency. Commodore Fell reporting, Wraith 1. One of your birds just blew ties off me. Thank the force, a woman's voice said with relief. My sister said she'll bust my butt if I don't get yours home safe. Wynsa was about to ask just what she was talking about when light flared in the corner of her vision. She tilted her claw craft to allow her a better view of the planet. Her jaw dropped in shock as a great banner of rainbow light, like a glimmering aurora, seemed to stretch out of Zanamaseka's atmosphere and reach into lower orbit. Suddenly the rainbow light swept through space like a downward arm. It cut through a cluster of ships a true victory destroyer, two gunships, a carrier, and the Mon Cal interdictor, and all of them disappeared in a giant fiery blossom. Then another banner of light appeared, this one stabbing through space and punching through both of the Bothan cruisers moving into attack Starless. It was second, Wynsa thought in awe. She'd heard this living planet could take extraordinary means to defend itself but she'd never been one to believe in fantastic stories. She never even believed there was some governing consciousness. She thought it all fairy tales made up by the Jedi, but now the raw evidence of Sekka's power left her breathless. Then there was another flash of light, and the planet was gone. What happened? One of the wraiths was squawking. Where'd it go? It's gone, Sabinarin pronounced. His mechanical voice managed a tone of gravity. Zanima Sekket, Left. Jagged Fell struggled to stand upright. Every single crewman on Starless had suddenly been thrown to the deck by the unexpected turbulence, and Jag himself had hit his head on the tactical console before going down. As he clutched his bleeding forehead, a hysterical corner of his mind thought, At least I didn't lose the other eye. He grabbed the console with both hands and pulled himself to his feet. Before he could bark orders, Sayal, and Tilly shouted, all hands, at your stations. Tactical team, report. Someone said, the planet, Captain, it's gone. Gone. The word seemed to reverberate forever in Jag's head. Ben. Tahiri. Jaina. Gone. Maybe the U.S. and Vong infiltrators had done something, maybe the planet had somehow chosen to flee on its own, maybe the engines had misfired somehow. He might never know. He might never see his wife again. Jagged tried to calm himself. The entire battle had left him in a state of constant near panic, but now he shoved it all down and found the orderly, disciplined officer he'd been bred to be, the kind they all needed right now. Give me a status on the fleet, he said. The tactical holo was down, so he turned his attention to the front viewport and tried to make sense of the broad swath of warships and debris. Zanum a second. Did something, sir, a dumbfounded lieutenant said. Both Bothan cruisers are gone, another reported. Phoenix seems to be adrift in space. Engines down. What about ours? Vindicator and Swift were far enough away. What about Mondromeda? Creffy asked he pulled himself to his feet, claw scraping across the console metal. A streak of red blood gleamed against the white fur of his snout. After a long, grim pause. The lieutenant said, she's gone, sir. All the ships there, the gunships, the Vic, 
they're all gone. No, wait, the cruiser, Sunbeam, she's drifting in space but she's intact, I think. What about the starfighters? Jag wiped a trickle of blood off his eyebrow. It's hard to tell. There's so much debris. Sirs, the comm lieutenant said, we're getting a transmission from Vernadette. Put him on, Jag said. Commander, we're having problems with the holo emitter. Audio, then, Creffy snapped. Do it now. A second later, the old Imperial's voice reverberated on the bridge. Starless, this Vindicator? We're bringing the last Chiss ships in now. What in space just happened? Jag's relief to have recovered wind was a mild bomb on the latest catastrophe. He said, the planet just jumped to hyperspace. Before that it defended itself against true victory. I can't see that, Vernada grunted. Commander, I wait. It looks like Dala is on the move. Jag cursed inwardly. Dala still had two star destroyers, an interdictor, and three Marauder Corvettes that had been out of range of Sackett's attack. Out the viewport, he could see the two Moncal cruisers loyal to Erecha firing their sublight engines. Sackett may have taken out half the true victory fleet, but including Dallas forces, what was left was enough to tackle the broken ships Jag had. Commander, the tactical lieutenant said, Dalla just jumped to hyperspace. Vernon had said, Starless, she just jumped. Repeat. We saw, Captain, thank you. Jag breathed. He could see the two Moncal ships, apparently unharmed by Zanima Sekhet's attack, hovering in the middle of space like they were uncertain what to do. Well, he thought, that makes three of us. Come on, he said, hail those Moncal ships, the ah. Uh. Lysentra and Nyethel, Creffy supplied. Right, Jag nodded, suddenly very tired. Hail Sunbeam and Phoenix too. Tell them we will accept their surrender should they choose to offer it. Half the crew stared at him, uncertain what to say. These ships, their crews and officers, had been alliance, yes, but they'd also just fought a pitched battle that had claimed thousands of crew and officers from Trinity Fleet. Now, come, Sayal said firmly. Yes, ma'am? The lieutenant began to adjust the frequency. Sayal walked over to the tactical console against which Jag and Creefy both leaned, weak and bleeding. Jag's cousin looked disheveled, yes, but unharmed physically. Do you think they'll do it? She asked. We have to give them the option, Jag said. And if they don't take it? Sirs, the communication officer called. Lysentra says she will surrender. Jag felt breath go out of him. What about the others? Nithal is considering the offer. Nothing from Phoenix or Sunbeam. Those ships are damaged. They might not be receiving our transmissions, Creefy said. They're also in no shape to fight, said Jag. With Lysentra down, Nithal should follow. What about Phoenix? Sayal asked. Her eyes held on Creefy. The Bothan licked specks of blood from his canines. He pushed himself away from the console and started toward the communication station. Lieutenant, he said, hail Phoenix again. Tell them I want to speak with Brenna Refcha, personally. When the light had lashed out of Zonima's second like a brilliant deadly rainbow, Miranda Fardreamer had expected to die. A part of her had been filled with dread, but another felt a surge of surprise and joy unlike anything she could remember. But then the light receded and she was alive, again, and things were worse than ever. Zanima Sekhet's shocking attack and equally shocking disappearance had left Phoenix's normally orderly bridge in a state of total chaos. The force of the attack had collapsed Phoenix's shields and tore open the decks hastily repaired since the fight in the nebula. The command tower had taken a massive concussive impact that wrenched its support structure, burst the aft bulkhead, and sent shrapnel cutting through the air like hundreds of flying knives. Miranda and most of the crew in the pit had escaped unscathed, but many on the upper level had been instantly and messily killed. Miranda had seen a refcha fall and was sure he was dead. Captain Welby was bleeding from the head and right leg but was trying to hold things together, even though she could barely stand. When she called Miranda out of the pit to replace the crew at the comm station, the Bothan had shocked them both by rising to his feet. 
As he staggered toward Welby, Miranda saw that he was clutching his left arm with his right. Everything below the elbow, uniform, and silver fur alike were dyed red with blood that dripped slowly and steadily onto the shrapnel-laden deck. She wondered how much time he had in him. She wondered how many any of them had. Miranda's technical knowledge of communication systems was minimal, and she spent several minutes handing tools to a lanky, brown fur fries lieutenant who was the only one of the communications crew not cut down by shrapnel and lying dead at their feet. The Frost did something to bring the console back online, and a bright red beacon winked on and off. What does that mean? Miranda asked. Incoming call, the Frost rasped. His punched a button, bent close to the speaker grill on the console, and said, This is Phoenix. Please repeat your message. This is Traz Creffy on Starless. I wish to speak with Admiral Arefcha. Is he alive? Creffy. Dazed by the shock of the attack, by the gore, and burnt debris strewn around her, it took her a second to place the name. The biggest hero of the U.S. and Vong War, Erefja's mentor, was on the line right now. Admiral, she called, spinning around to look for Erefja. She was shocked to find him right in front of her. His silver fur was matted with sweat, dirt, and other people's blood. His own dripped steadily from the red. Mangled mess of his left arm while his right paw pinched the blood vessels above his elbow to slow the bleeding. His gold eyes were half focused and his mouth panted open. A Admiral, Miranda stuttered. It's Creffy. Orefja blinked once, twice. A little focus came into his eyes. He rasped, step aside, ensign. Miranda scooted back, nearly tripping over the maimed corpse of a Rodian. Still clutched his left arm. Erefja leaned in close to the speaker grill and said, This is Erefja. You're alive. Relief was palpable in that voice, Bran. Listen to me. You have to surrender. Erefja's body rested in a soundless, humorless laugh. Bran, Creffy pressed. Half your fleet is destroyed. Admiral Dalla has taken her destroyers and fled. Captain Jennis has surrendered Lacentra. Trev Varen just did the same. All your other ships are destroyed or dead in space. Erefja picked his head up with effort and looked out the viewport. Miranda followed his gaze and saw the dark gray wedge of Starless gliding closer. In front of it was the black, twisted remains of a Bothan assault cruiser's aft engine section, Philia, or Darylin, she couldn't tell. And it didn't matter now. Erefja swallowed and said to his crew, engines, report. No one said anything at first. Then someone called, sublight down, hyperdrive down. Bren, Creffy shouted over the comm. There's no point in fighting. You have lost. Don't throw away your life. Don't throw away the lives of your crew. Erefja leaned in close to the speaker and hissed, I have a mission. Your mission is over. Creffy insisted. Erefja insisted. I'm not, not your man anymore. Erefja turned back to the crew. I need weapons report. Enough good people have already died, Bryn. Port Turbolaser Bank Online, Welby said. Forward Bank, online. Starboard, offline. A chill shot down Miranda's spine. He was going to do it. He was going to order those Turbolaser Banks to fire on Starless. They had no chance of winning, no chance of escape. They couldn't even move. But Erefja was broken enough, desperate enough mad enough at the carnage around him to order one last suicidal attack. And standing right next to him, staring at the face of certain, absolute death, Miranda Fardrima realized she didn't want to die after all. Not here. Not like this. Not for nothing. Her mother had died for nothing. Her father had died for nothing. She wanted to live for something, anything. Bren, please, Creffy was pleading, half forgotten over the comlink. Do you think Evan would want this? That name, whatever it meant, snapped Erefja out of his battle dazed stupor. He leaned over the console and said, Don't you dare, Trast. Don't you dare bring her into this. You already have? Creffy accused. There's no point in calling down more death. Surrender, surrender now. And I promise no harm will come to you. We are renegades, Erefja snarled. Criminals. Each and every one of us. We betrayed the Alliance. 
We just murdered thousands of our fellow officers. What do you think you're going to do with us? I can't decide that myself, Creefy said. But if you help us, join our fleet, you'll probably get a general amnesty for most of your people. Urefja head wagged from side to side. No. No, no, no. We went out here to kill the U.S. and Vong to annihilate them. We came here to finish the job you couldn't trust. We're not going to help you save the enemy. Then save your friends. We've lost half our fleet and Dala is still out there. The renegade U.S. and Vong fleet, true honor, they're still out there too. If you don't help us, all of us will die out here. Urefja blinked, swayed on his feet. True honor. They broke off from Zanima II to wage war against their old enemy. Sound familiar? No, 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 Urefja said. They're the enemy. They don't, they're not like. The Bolton's strength gave out. His knees buckled and he pitched forward. Miranda grabbed him by one shoulder, the froze by the other, and they helped him upright. His left paw still clutched his right elbow, curtailing the blood loss. It was the only thing keeping him conscious right now. His head rolled weakly to the right, and for a moment his gold eye settled on Miranda's. The war is over, Bren, Creffy said. The war ended a long time ago. Eref just swayed, but Miranda held him upright. His jaw worked up and down wordlessly before he finally found the strength to say, All right. We surrender, we surrender. Part 3. The Sword A long time ago. Jaina pauses for a moment near the mouth of the way station's hangar bay and watches stars drift past. Invisible amidst the sprawl is a lonely planet, their target, Korobu. Only an invisible force field separates the pressurized bubble of the hangar and the cold void of space. She normally doesn't think about that sort of thing, but it gives her a chill now. Something is calling to her from the void, something she can't explain, something that had dragged her all the way out to the unknown regions of space. At least she finally has her brother by her side again. She hears the clap of boots on the deck behind her and turns around. She already knew it would be Jason. Behind him, the rest of the Jedi buzz around their parked spaceships, doing final system checks before venturing further into uncharted space. Little Tahiri ducks under the fin of her second organic flyer while Lobaka is on top, long furry arms dangling out of the cockpit. Alima Rar nimbly gives her ship a look over and passes unwanted, winning smiles at Zek. Tiny Techly rubs her furry snout and awkwardly climbs toward her X-Wing's cockpit, going up a ladder not made for short Chandrafan limb. Tzar Sebatine ascends his own ladder with fluid reptilian grace. She remembers, very well, when they were last all together like this. That time there had been others. Tenoka, for one, now imprisoned in her palace on Hapes. And of course, the dead. Gana Rissold, Ola Hakor, Bella and Krasov Hara, Arobessa, Jovandrard, Rainer Thule, Anakin. I know what you're thinking, Jason says with a joyless smile. You always do, Jana replies, and it's literally true. Their twin bond has meant she'd had a constant companion for almost all her life. When she thought Jason, too, had died on that mission to Merker, she thought half of her life was gone forever. Jason has been away once more, this time on a five-year journey through the stars, seeking new ways of viewing the Force. As her brother, always curious, always striving. She's missed him, though. Today is her first time seeing him in almost five years. She looks at him, trying to figure out what has changed. A lot can happen in five years the U.S. Hanbong War, for instance, and the Jason who's come back from his odyssey is like the Jason she remembered the Jason who was half her life but subtly different, and she can't pin down how or why. What is it? Jason raises both eyebrows. Nothing Jaina looks away, at the void, she hadn't realized she'd been staring. Okay, Jason chuckles softly and steps up to her side. He stares out at the stars too and says, It's strange, isn't it? All of us, feeling the same call through the force, drawing us from every corner of the galaxy to this place, it has to mean something. It has to have something to do with that awful, fateful mission to Mirker, but Jaina has no idea what. She tries to sound teasing as she says, it must have been a loud call, 
if it brought you back to me again. I was just about done anyway, Jason says easily. I was getting kind of bored with Akina. Akina. Jaina repeats. That woman who led Uncle Luke on a wild bantha chase. The very same? Did she lead you on a chase too? No. She tried to teach me. She said I was her second worst student. Jaina snorts amusement. Well, there's a reason Uncle Luke's still in charge. Of course, Jason grins, though his eyes are serious. A silent moment passes. Behind them, somebody drops a hydro spanner. It clatters on the deck, and Lobaka howls annoyance. It's good to see everyone again, though, Jaina says. I wish Tenoka were here. Don't you? I do, Jason admits, and seems to flush a little with embarrassment. Same old Jason, she thinks. Too busy trying to save the universe and master the force to go for the woman right in front of him. Of course, Jaina's love life hasn't been anything to write home about lately either. So, she asks, do you think you're done? Or do you think you're going to go wandering once this is over? She hopes, very much, that he'll stay. That depends on what we find out there, Jason says. I've got this feeling. Like everything I've been wandering around, trying to find, is about to come and find me. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Who can say? We'll just have to find out. Something very grim, very serious passes over his face. What is it? Jaina asks. Nothing, he says, too quickly. Jaina frowns. It's not like him to keep secrets. He's been open with her, always, even when she turned into an emotional shut-in during the late stages of the U.S. and Vong War. Everything flowed freely through that twin bond of theirs, but now, it feels like he's holding something back, and to her own surprise, Jaina feels hurt. Something tells her she's not going to be able to pry it out of him, not now. Not when they're about to go on a mission. Later, hopefully, they can talk honestly. She reaches out and rests a hand on his forearm. Hey, Jason, she says, when this is all over, I want to sit down and hear all about your trip. There's not much to tell. Oh, come on. You were gone for five years. You've spent time with races and orders Uncle Luke probably hasn't even heard of yet. You must have learned something important. His eyes go cold and distant again, like they're staring through her into the void. Then they snap back, focus on her face. He smiles and odd, a loose smile, and says, Somebody said the point of travel is coming back to the place you started and seeing it with new eyes. So, is that what's happened? You're seeing all of us with new eyes. Maybe, Jason shrugs and looks back at the X-Wings, at their Jedi friends all together again. I have a feeling we're about to find out. He says it with a certain finality. He turns toward his X-Wing and starts to walk, slowly, with purpose. Jaina falls in at his side and says, Well, whatever happens, let me know. We'll face this together. Yes, Jason says, not looking at her. I'm sure we will. Chapter 13 The three veins of Zanima Seket's engine stabbed at the endless, sky-spanning blur of hyperspace. Brilliant blue energy swirled upward from the miles-deep engine wells, spiraling around the round smooth bodies of the veins before shooting freely outward, propelling the entire world across the stars. Jaina Solo stood knee-deep in tall grass, maybe half a kilometer away from the engines. They'd had just enough warning time to evacuate people that far from the wells. When the power had flared up from Zanima's bowels, she'd had no idea whether they were safe from whatever massive energies were being unleashed. She had no idea what effect the stress of a hyperspace jump would have on the planet's surface. When the light came she fully expected to die, burned to a crisp, or ripped apart by sound-breaking winds, or crunched by buckling of the earth. Instead it was quiet. Quiet and terrifying. She at least expected there to be a sound. Sublight engines were loud, and came in all sorts of unique flavors, from the thick drone of the Falcon to the trademark banshee will of a TIE fighter. The thing about hyperdrive engines was, you never heard them. You never got a chance, because nobody was ever outside of a ship when it was in hyperspace. At least, nobody who lived to tell about it. So what she got wasn't a drone or a banshee whale. The engines didn't make a sound at all, except for the low rumble of the earth beneath her feet. 
There was no wind either, and that was strange. Kilometer after kilometer of high grass just stood, straight up, every blade pointing, toward the spectral vision overhead. The most stunning thing was the light. The blue-white energy pouring out of the planet was so bright you couldn't look at the energy-wrapped veins directly. Every figure standing in the field cast a pure black shadow that cut like a knife through the blue-white grass. There were dozens of them, all survivors of the failed U.S. Hinvong raid on the engines. All they could do was stand, stare, and wait for whatever happened next. Now, I really have seen everything, said the old man dying at her feet. Jaina looked down at Gato. He was lying on his back on the stretch they'd hastily put him on, staring at the shifting lights in the sky. It was amazing he survived being moved. Bandages were slapped over his abdomen but blood still trickled down the sides of his mouth. His injuries were too deep, and Jaina knew there was nothing she could do for him. She bent down on her knees, joining the others watching over him. Venku clutched Gato's right hand. The old clone Muriel held his left. The blue white of the engine light cut his face at an oblique angle, forming black daggers of shadow on his face that highlighted every scar, wrinkle, and line from his long dramatic life. Bess and Gendry, no older than Jaina, sat on their haunches a step away, watching the old man die with silent respect. As Jaina settled down next to Venku, Gadab's gray eyes flicked away from the sky and caught hers. His mouth moved to speak words, but they came out as wheezes. She laid a hand on his armored chest. What is it? So, so, he rasped, cough blood. So much, so much I never knew. Jaina glanced up at the swirling sky. Surprises never end, do they? It's beautiful. Yeah, she had to admit. Kind of spooky too. No, got have coughed. Venku and Muriel squeezed his hands tighter. All of it, beautiful eye. Thank you. Jaina felt a tear in her eye. Don't thank me. I dragged you to this planet. He did it to save Katika, Mariel said. Don't blame yourself. It was his choice. Don't take that away from him. Gadab's eyes flicked to Venku's face, still black with shadow. Katika, I, sorry, wish I had. Don't. Venku sounded like he'd been crying. You were my boo or Bartica. I owe you everything. Wish shown you this. This is just a planet. Know this, so much, so much life. His head tilted back and rolled to one side. Eyelids shuddered and slowly closed. His chest stopped moving. She felt him fade into the force, without bitterness, with some regret. Then there was a bright flash, brighter than anything before. Jaina and Mario covered their eyes but Venku just hung his, his head lower. Then, when the flash died down, they looked up and stars again spread across the night sky. The brilliant blue-white from the engine shuddered and vanished completely, leaving them in the black field with only faint starlight as their guide. One by one, people fumbled for glorits and turned them off. Bess activated a torch on her armor and spilled a narrow beam of electric yellow light over grass that was starting to sway with new breeze. Then she swung it around and gasped. All eyes went to the beer where Gadab had been laid down. The canvas was there, and his armor, but that was all. Fear effect. Muriel gaped. It's true. What happened? Gendry said. Where did Bardica go? He faded into the forest, Jaina said softly, staring at the empty Mandalorian armor. Shapley incredible, Muriel said. I didn't believe they could really do that. He wasn't even a, I mean. I don't know how it works, Jaina said. I think it means he was, one with the Force when he died. I thought it was just stories, though, Mario couldn't control his shock. I mean, when, when Atane died, she left a body. I don't know how it works. Jaina glanced at Venku. The man's head was still bowed. He hadn't looked at the stars yet, or the armor his boar had left behind. Jaina gently laid a hand on his shoulder. Are you okay? Yes. He picked up his head at last. Two thin trails gleamed faintly on his cheeks. I'm all right. Silence lingered over the group. In the distance she heard a low moan from Hyuhana, Wraith Squadron's wounded Wookiee. 
then heard Shard Lat say something in response. Clever Dickett. He left the most important thing, Mariel said finally. He patted Gadov's chest plate affectionately. He told Jaina, bodies don't matter to Mandas. His soul, that's with Mandane, or the Force, or whatever. Maybe both. But this armor, that was him. That's what we remember him by. I'm sure he'd want you to take it, Jaina said truthfully, but she knew that wasn't the whole of it. In the end, Bard and Jusik had been more than just his armor. The group waited a good hour before approaching the hyperdrive engines again. It took that long for the shafts to cool down, and for a pair of sensor droids to confirm that there was no residual harmful radiation. They also called back the shuttles that had been scuttled when the Vong attacked. As the shuttle started unloading people and supplies, Jaina and Shar Lat went into the command station to see if communications and astro navigation still worked. The first thing Shar did was try and figure out where they were. The computers in the command station had an impressive series of star charts, and while Jaina wrestled with the comm system, Shar was working on the astronomic computer and attempting to get a survey of their current position in space. Well, there is some good news, he said, hunched over the navigation console while Jaina was on her butt, peering into the tangled bowels of the communications console. For some reason, the thing simply wouldn't switch on, and she was hoping it was just a single busted fuse or trip breaker. Such as, Jaina scooted out and got her head clear. Looks like we are in orbit around a medium-sized star. Enough to keep us from freezing to death. That's a start. I see three planets and an asteroid belt in the system. Nothing that looks life-supporting, though. Where are we, though? I don't know. Shar bit his lip. We're trying to match the constellations in the sky with our star charts, but we haven't gotten a match so far. We can't be that far from our old location. We weren't in hyperspace that long. Jaina glanced at the tangled wires in her hand and spotted a burnt-out junction between three cables. I need a three-piece breaker, she said. Got any on hand? I don't know. I'm not familiar with this place. Shar looked around the cramped command station. Every wall and corner was covered in consoles, closets, and shelves. Can you look? Jaina said tersely. As you say, great one. Shar went over to the nearest supply closet and began searching. Jaina turned her attention to the console's innards again and checked for any more burnt-out parts. She hadn't found any when Shar appeared before her, bent on one knee, holding a small three-piece breaker with both hands like a holy offering. Har, har, Jaina grabbed it. Shar got back up and dusted his knee off. Well, it's nice to see your sense of humor hasn't improved. Jaina didn't bother to argue. She had more important things to do than play along with jokes. One friend had just died, and she had no idea where the others were. She didn't even know where she was, physically or emotionally. Once she switched out the breaker, she shoved the console's wiring back inside and tried to turn it on again. This time it lit up and began its comforting mechanical hum. Well, Char leaned over her shoulder. What have we got? Jaina tried to contact the long-range beacon first, since they needed to call Jag assuming Trinity Fleet had survived Zonima Seket's sudden jump to hyperspace. Jaina hadn't felt Jag die, and she knew, deep in her gut, that she would, even if he wasn't force-sensitive like her. A red error message ran across the screen, and she shook her head. Okay, just try local communications, Shar said. Okay, let me call the village. See if Danny... Ben or Tahiri are there. She held her breath as she tried to patch in on the local communications network. If everything was down, it could take a long time to restore communications between the stations and villages scattered across the planet. To her relief, the image of a blue-faced pharaoh appeared on the screen. This is Jaina Solo from the engine station, she said. Is Danny Kui there? Are Ben Skywalker? The surprise on the pharaoh's face was visible even though the flat, Static blur screen. She said, Give me a few minutes, Master Solo. The pharaoh ducked away, leaving the screen empty except for the dim back wall of the small demudek used as a comm station. Master Solo. Sharp heard. My, my, that sounds dominant, doesn't it? Not compared to Uncle Luke. When we get back home, you should try flirting with the Grandmaster. 
Char made a face, but before he could retort, a familiar woman appeared on the screen. Tahiri, Jaina said. The blonde woman looked pale and tired, and Jaina wondered what ordeal she'd been through. Hello? The response was grim. Are you all right? Most of us, yes. The U.S. Hinvong attacked, but we were able to repel them and get a safe distance from the engines before they fired. Casualties. Some, she admitted. She thought about mentioning Gadab, but she didn't think Tahiri had ever met him. Besides, the woman looked like she had something to say, probably bad news, so Jaina braced herself and asked, what's wrong? Tahiri. It's been, she said. Vestera kidnapped him. Vestera. Jaina gaped. She felt a spike of anger and regret. She should have killed the Sith witch on Yavin 4 while she had the chance. She got away with him and ship. They took off right before the planet jumped to hyperspace, so we're not sure what happened to them. Jaina, I didn't feel Ben die in the Force. I like to think I would have. I didn't feel anything either, Jaina said, and tried to take hope from it. But we still don't know if he's here, or in space somewhere, and do we know where here is? Our astronavigation computer isn't working right. Neither is ours. What about the beacon? Can we send a signal to the fleet? Tahiri shook her head. We already sent crews out. It was damaged by seismic activity during the jump to hyperspace, but we're hoping to repair it. In the meantime, we have to find Ben. If we can find him, Jaina said grimly, we don't even know if he's on this planet. I know. We may just have to trust the Force, Tahiri said. She looked like she wanted to say more but held back. Tahiri, what is it? The woman took a deep breath. Jaina, I wasn't in the village when Ben was attacked. I couldn't do anything. I never blamed you. It's not that. It's I was on another mission, up in the mountains. The why isn't important. We got attacked by some U.S. Hinvong warriors and a Sith. The U.S. Hinvong got what they came for, but I killed the Sith. What did one say to something like that? Congratulations. I'm glad you're safe, Tahiri. I took some hits, but I'm okay, she nodded. But Jaina, when I was fighting him, when he had me cornered and I was ready to give up, I heard something, just for a moment. He touched me, Jaina. Anakin touched me. Jaina shuddered. Mara coming back, that made sense, sort of. Mara Jade had been here, met Sekut, and maybe forged a link with it through the Force. But Anakin had never been to Sekut, never even heard of it. She didn't want to think Tahiri might be hallucinating, but she couldn't deny that her friend had proven emotionally fragile in the past. What was it like? She asked cautiously. Was it like what happened with Ben? She shook her head. No. I just heard him. And just for a moment, he touched me through the force. I know it was him, Jaina. I remember how he felt. I've clung to it all my life, and I'm sure of it. She saw the look of gratefulness and awe on Tahiri's face. She didn't look manic or delusional. She looked tired, concerned, worried, but also calm in a deep way Jaina hadn't seen in a long time. I'm glad, she said honestly. And yet, in the back of her mind, she was worried too. Ben had spoken with his mother, Tahiri had been touched by the man she'd loved and lost. What was in store for Jaina? Then, there could be only one answer. The thought of it filled her with dread. After talking with Tahiri, she talked to Danny and got a further summary of events across Sonoma Second. The jump to hyperspace had caused minor damage in many locations and some injuries, but so far no one reported loss of life. Ben was still a mystery, and Danny promised to send queries about him to all the other settlements, but Jaina wasn't confident. The inhabited areas of Zanima II covered just a small fraction of the world's total land area. Danny also mentioned her brief encounter with Sekut, only instead of sounding relieved to talk to the living planet again, she'd been more worried than before. Sekut had appeared as a younger version of Tahiri, but this time it had been more than just an image. It had possessed matter, with weight and strength of its own, like a real living body. Even Hara had been able to see Sekut meaning it was far more than the usual force mirage. All in all, the conversation gave her a lot to think about. 
After that, she stepped into the night. A dim glow hung in the eastern sky, but true dawn was probably an hour off. Still, there was enough light for her to wander off into the grass. The wind was blowing hard now, and she tied up her hair to keep it from being thrown in every direction. She walked for a while away from the command station and landing pad, though three sleek veins still towered at her back. Thick clouds had mustered to the north, blocking out the sun. She saw flashes of light within the billowing vapors, felt wind blowing in her face, and wondered how long until the storm hit. She wondered how long the weather would be disrupted after the hyperspace jump, and bad it would be. She hoped there was enough space to shelter people in the command bunker and the shuttles, but she wasn't sure. She knew the Mandas had been out here already. They'd probably placed Gadam's armor in the ground, save some peace Venku took for himself to add to his eclectic wear. It seemed morbid to her, wearing around the remains of your loved ones, but at least it was honest. Jaina wore a cloak of ghosts too, far too many for less than half a lifetime. She just tried to pretend she didn't whenever possible. Then a voice behind her said, If you look away from a wound, pretend it isn't there. Does it really go away? Jaina turned, slowly. I was wondering if you'd show up. There was a man standing in the field just a meter behind her. It wasn't anyone she recognized. A little younger than her, he wore a pale tunic and had brown hair chopped short. He had a flat, expressive face. Even in the dark there was something piercing and sad in his eyes. But it wasn't a man. It was second, in some form or another. She watched the man carefully. The short strands of hair on his head blew with the wind. Clothes rustled around his body. Do you know where Ben is? She asked the first thing on her mind. He was kidnapped by a Sith just before you jumped to hyperspace. We don't know if they got away, or if they crashed, or anything. I don't feel he's dead, but... I'm not sure. The man's head shook. I thought you could, I don't know, feel where everything is on you at all times. The face looked thoughtful. Tell me, Jaina, could you feel a single mite crawling on your skin, if you already had thousands more, on you at all times? She frowned at the callous comparison but at the same time she recognized his point. She couldn't let herself forget how vast, strange, and alien second really was, even when it dressed up in a human's face. Can you try and send some please? She asked. I can, and I will, but my senses are stronger in some parts of me than others. If their ship crashed in the ocean, for example, it will be harder to notice than if they crashed in a forest, disrupting life there. It made sense, but she'd been hoping for an easy way to find her cousin and was very disappointed. Apparently, the disappointment showed. Second said apologetic Ally, I promise I'll try, though I do have other things I'm working on now. Jaina stared at that face, arranged in a similitude of human compassion. She was struck again by the way the wind played with its short brown hair, like they were really actually there to be buffeted. Can I touch you? Jaina asked, Are you a body? Or are you just getting better at projecting images? A little of both. The man extended a hand for shaking. Touch, please. Jaina didn't hesitate. She reached out and squeezed his hand. It felt a little rough, firm but pliant, warmed by an inner heat. It felt like a real human, but when she tried to sense a man in front of her she only felt the same vague richness of force energy she did everywhere in this world. She withdrew her hand, intrigued and a little frightened. How do you do that? I have been experimenting for a long time. Initially I wanted a way to appear to the U.S. and Vong directly, instead of using Jabatha or Danny as intermediaries. They revere me as a god, you know, which is strange. I wanted to know them personally. Something seemed different about Second now. When she talked to it before, it had projected a serene confidence which was perhaps to be expected from a being with force powers so beyond hers. Perhaps it was that face, with the sad eyes, but second seemed, unsure, somehow, troubled. How? She pressed. How can you just, materialize like that? The force is not just invisible energy, he reminded her. You can use it to push, pull, support, or interact with matter in many ways. 
and matter itself is the force. The body of your friend just faded into the force. Sometimes things can fade back. Jaina hugged herself. I know you summoned Mara's ghost. And Tahiri says she felt Anakin. Somehow. What about Gata? Barden Jusik, whatever you want to call him. Could you bring him here if I asked you to? The man's face looked pensive, like he hadn't thought about it yet. Maybe. A spirit can only come if it wants to come. My abilities only go so far. For some reason, that made her feel relieved. She didn't ask about Jason, though. She couldn't bear to hear his answer. Second said, you never answered my first question. If something hurts and you pretend it doesn't, does it stop hurting? Or are you just making yourself numb inside? I don't know what you're talking about. The man looked disappointed. Of course you do, Jaina. She scowled. Is that what you can do? Can you go prying into people's minds? I don't have to. I know the pain you've gone through. Tahiri told me everything. Jaina didn't get mad at the other woman. She felt relief that she hadn't had to lay down the awful story itself. I'm asking you because the question is relevant to me as well. The man tapped a finger on his chest. Do you know what happened while you were defending my engines? No, Jaina shook her head. I'm sorry. We were busy? Of course, the man's face smiled sadly. You see, after the U.S. and Vong ships came, another fleet followed. The fleet that was, apparently, searching the stars in the hope of destroying me. True victory. Jaina felt a spike of fear for Jagged again. The true victory fleet was far stronger than Trinity fleet in its current condition. She found herself doubting whether she really would feel his death in the force. They were ravaging my defenders, Second said sadly. Once they destroyed your friends, they would have surrounded me and rained laser fire down, scorching my surface, killing the beings I have sworn to protect. A hard look came on the man's face. So I reached out with the force. Energy and matter, Jaina. I smashed their fleet to bits. And then I ran, because I was ashamed of what I'd just done. Well, Jaina thought dumbly, that explained the light in the sky. The man's expression grew hard, but now I think back, Jaina, and I am not sorry. They killed my friends and threatened to kill my children. They were like animals, so I slaughtered them like animals. By the thousands. Tell me, Jaina. Is this the dark side? Jaina stared at the man's face, so rent with his own confusion and anguish. She'd had no idea the living world could have such human emotions and be torn by such a mortal dilemma. I don't know, she said. How could she judge a whole world? When you struck them, was it in anger? No, Second said. I felt cold, determined. I had to protect those I cared about and was willing to destroy whoever stood in my way. Ruthless, cold determination. It sounded so much like Jason. As he'd fallen slowly, inexorably to the dark he'd rarely been driven by anger. He was old and mature enough to control his own emotions. Rather, he'd let the dark enter willingly, bit by bit, because he'd wanted it too. He thought he could use the dark side for noble ends. But in the end the dark side had used him, and destroyed him, and left the rigid evil husk of Darth Kedis behind. And yet she owed the planet her life, the life of her friends, probably her husband's life as well. How could she condemn a being and be in his dead at the same time? The man was still staring at her, quiet pleading on his face. She felt something tickle her cheek, the first sprinkle of rain. Lightning flashed in the north and thunder rolled across the wind-swept plain. I'm sorry, she said. I, I don't know. I understand, the planet said, but sounded disappointed. It is a difficult problem, for which there are no easy solutions. That's life, she said softly, as thunder rolled again. The man nodded. Perhaps I can consult someone more knowledgeable soon. Jaina stiffened in shock and fear, even as the wind blew harder. She knew what it meant, and it knew she knew, but as she stared at that sad stranger's face, she had to say it, name it, the source of her pain, the wound she tried to look away from but wouldn't heal Jason. He and I were close very once, and I can feel him in the forest still, restless, confused, striving, still very alive, 
even in death. You can't bring Jason back. He's a, a what? A Sith Lord. Ben and Uncle Luke said they had confronted Jason's ghost in the Lake of Apparitions in the mall. They said he was no longer Sith, but still twisted with bitterness and spite, unrepentant. She'd been glad she hadn't been there herself. The Force tells me something, Jaina, Second said. It tells me a dragon is coming. A dragon? She frowned. What dragon? There are Sith in league with the True Honor fleet. They have helped corrupt my children and use them to their own ends. And they will be coming soon. And you think, Jason can help us defeat them. Jason's dead. He's a ghost, stuck in, I don't know where. But he's gone. Is he? The man held up his hand. And what is this? Jaina stared, dumbstruck, speechless at what she thought he was implying. Jason and I were very close once. Closer than I've been to any mortal being, I think. I can't sense him now. Even in death he is unique, restless and powerful. If he's willing, I believe I can do more than just summon his spirit. It was incredible. It was impossible. It was horrible. You can bring Jason back to life. The man shook his head. Jason died. That could not be undone. However, I do think I might be able to give strength and form to his spirit for a time, as I have to this vision you're seeing now. She had no idea what to say. No idea what to think. Please consider this, the planet said. I need to consider it myself. In truth, I am not even sure it will work. But I believe it is worth the attempt. The force is telling me that we will have need him of in the battle to come. Thunder cracked louder than ever before. Jaina looked at the storm clouds to the north. They were almost on her now. Lightning flashed and rain sprayed her face on the wind. She looked to the space where the man had been, but he was gone. She sprinted to shelter before the thunderstorm came, pounding the bunker and landing pad and grassy fields with hail and spears of rain. There was nothing to save her from the storm inside. Chapter 14 Wynsa Fell felt very different than the last time she stepped foot on Starless. To be sure, last time she had arrived in a shuttle, this time it was in a Chiss Claw craft. Before she had been captain of Celestial and commander of all Chiss Expeditionary Defense Force elements in Trinity Fleet. Now she didn't know what she was, and that scared her. She'd grown accustomed to certainty over the years. Not knowing, making things up as they went, was disturbing and frightening. And she had to admit, a little exciting too. Maybe she understood her brother a little more. Once her claw graph landed, she was escorted by a pair of blue uniformed alliance guards to the conference room beneath the bridge. They were still treating her like a captain. Then, and while Jag probably meant well, it felt like a mocking reminder of the vessel she had been entrusted with, only to lose. The guards let her enter alone. When she stepped into the conference room, she saw Jagged and Traz Creffy standing on the far side. Welcome, Commodore, Jack said with audible warmth and relief. She flinched from such an open show of affection, all the more because he seemed oblivious to the deep loss she had just experienced. It didn't hurt as much as losing Sim, Chak, Davin, or Cheris, but she could think of nothing else that came closer. I'm not a Commodore anymore, she said. I have no ship to command. Until Chilla notifies us otherwise, you are still a Commodore, and still leader of all CEDF personnel on this mission, Jack said sternly. Is that understood? Yes, Commander, she acquiesced. Good. Jag gestured to the table. Now let's sit down and talk things over. Jagged sat down at the head of the table, Creffy right next to him. Wynsa hesitated, then took the seat right next to Creffy, leaving all three of the bunched at the corner, looking out at an otherwise empty table. Jag asked the Bothan now, can we get a summary? Creffy's white fur rippled slightly. Currently, all command staff and non-essential crew on Phoenix, Lacentra, Nyathal, and Sunbeam are confined to quarters. We pulled everybody we can spare from our other ships to act as guards. Wynsa shook her head. You can't keep the entire crew under lockdown. If they want to, they can retake their ships and you'll be down even more people. I realize that, 
which is why I'm going to make a decision quickly, Jack said. Not weak, she noticed. Maybe he'd end up a strong leader yet. He looked to Creffy. What's the status of Phoenix and Sunbeam? Heavy structural damage to both, the botan said. However, I think we can get weapons and engines for Phoenix back online in less than 15 hours. And Sunbeam. Do we have a full week to spare? Jack sighed. I don't know. I'm hoping, praying, Zanima Second survived the jump and we'll get a signal soon. If we do, I want to jump as many ships as possible to his location. So for now, put all manpower into repairing Phoenix. Use as much of his own crew as possible. Creffy looked reticent. Jack pressed. What is it, Admiral? I'm no Admiral. Creffy shook his head. I was just thinking that the people on Phoenix are probably very loyal to Irefcha. Unless he tells them to help us, we won't be able to trust them. Many of them might even refuse to help. Then we'll need his cooperation. Can I count on you for that? Jag's eyes locked with Creefy's. The Bothan looked evasive, but in the end he nodded. I shall do my best. What about the people on Sunbeam? Weinsa asked. Keep them there for now. This is good a place as any for them to stay until we figure out whether to redistribute her crew or try and fix her. What about their captain? Terra Vatrum was seriously injured in the battle. We've transferred her to Valediction's Med Bay and kept her stable, the same as Phoenix's captain. They're in no condition to do anything soon. All right. Weinsa honed in on her main target. What happens to starfighters, shuttles, and crew from ships that are already gone? Jag met his sister's eyes, held them for the first time since she'd come aboard. What do you think, Commodore? My fighter squadrons will still fly for you. The hangar on Vindicator is already over capacity, but we can send a squadron or two to replenish the stock on Jim or Starless, she said. We can also help keep guard over the prisoners. Excellent, Jag nodded. As for you, I was hoping you could take command of Phoenix. Her spine stiffened. Me? She'll need a captain. We're going to have to let most of her crew come back, but there's no way Irefja leaves the brig until this mission is over. What about Mr. Creffy? She glanced at the old Bothan. I hold no rank, he said. Many in the Alliance consider me a traitor for siding with my people against Jason Solo and Cha Nyathal. Besides, I am old. I am an outsider. I am not familiar with Alliance ships or crew or customs. I would be a terrible choice. She crossed her arms and looked squarely at her brother. Admiral Creefy, however, is one of the greatest heroes of the Vong War. If Irefja's followers will accept anyone as their new commander, surely it would be Irefja's own mentor. Jag stared at Wen, his face a cool calculating mask. Then, to her surprise, a goofy grin slanted across his face. He told Creffy, she makes a damn good argument. Too good, the Bothan conceded. And what do you plan to do? Commodore fell. I want to pilot, she told her brother. Please, put me in charge of all chess fighter wings. If I'm to command your CEDF forces, let me command them. Jag raised an eyebrow, based on a ship. Most of our birds are in Vindicator, but I'll go to Starless, Phoenix, or wherever else you want. Jag looked thoughtful. Interesting possibilities. For now, you can return to Vindicator. We're going to have to get a complete appraisal of all ships before I can make a final decision. Very good, she said, satisfied. Also, what happened to your attempts to fix the long-range transmitter on Starless? Jag blinked, like he'd forgotten all about it. He probably had. We were going to do repairs, he said finally, but then the battle started. I'll have to talk to Captain Antilles. If you wish, Weinsa said, I can contact Chilla and ask for reinforcements. There's no guarantee we're going to be here in a day, or two, or however long it will take for us to find Zanima second if they come at all, which they probably won't, he said. Quite so, she said softly. Jagged sighed slightly. But please, go ahead. One more question, Commodore. What happened to Alpha Red? Creffy showed no surprise. His violet eyes took on a hard edge as he looked at Weinsa, waiting on her response. Weinsa wondered how many others he'd told. 
I sent our scientists to personally dispose of the Alpha Red samples, she said. However, they did not survive the flight to Vindicator. We believe they were on board Celestial when she self-destructed. So you're not certain, then? As near to certain as can be, she said, then added honestly, we do not have any in our possession. The only sample of the virus still in this fleet is the vial your wife stole from us. All right, Jag nodded. I just wanted to hear it from you. He believed her, then, believed her implicitly. She was surprised by how good that made her feel. Wines had got to her feet. I'll be on my way back to Vindicator, unless there's anything else. Jag remained in his seat. We'll need to go over the command crew of the surrender ships and decide who to trust, but that's something Mr. Creefy, and I will have to decide through interviews. Right now, I want you to go back and send me a complete roster of all the ships and people you still have. And contact Chilla. And give Captain Vernon at my regards. Of course, she paused before turning for the door. Jack sensed her hesitation. Anything else, Commodore? She didn't know what to say. Somewhere along the line, in the ten years since she'd lost Jag, her own emotions had become a stranger to her. She normally thought of her younger self, the one who'd loved to tease Jag and pester mom and dad, as a little brat, blissfully ignorant of adulthood hardship. Now, for the first time, she found she envied the girl she'd been. That one would have known what to say. Thank you, Jagged, she managed. Thank you for everything. If it wasn't for him, her own shame would have condemned her to death with Celestial. Now she was confused and hurting, but also alive in a way she hadn't been in a long time. You're welcome, Jack said. He didn't say anything more. She knew he understood. She turned and stepped into the hallway, where two guards escorted her back to her waiting ship. Locked in her tiny cabin aboard Phoenix, Miranda Far Dreamer had a lot of time to think. Her first thought, actually, had been about escape. Logically, she knew it was foolish. The habitat decks were now full of foot soldiers from Starless and Karuska Gem, making sure all the true victory believers were locked tight in their cabins until someone could figure out what to do with a whole ship full of mutineers. Still, the first thing she'd done was march over to her desk and pull open the small, innocuous drawer where she kept her mementos from her trip to Tatooine including Ben Skywalker's lightsaber. The drawer was empty. She cursed the empty room, angry that they'd seen through her plans, that they'd invaded her privacy, that they'd taken pretty much the only thing on Phoenix to which she attached personal value. It was a Jedi's lightsaber, after all, the kind hard Mando warriors stuck on their belts like trophies. She was proud to have taken it, even if everything else on the mission had gone awry. But since they'd taken her lightsaber and her other trophy from Tatooine, she simply lay down on her bed and stared at the ceiling for a while. She had plenty of things to think about, none of them good. When she joined True Victory, it had felt like she was being swept up in something greater than herself, but also something made for her, something that would provide purpose to a life generally spent with little direction and a lot of aggrievances. True Victory was dangerous in a lot of ways, but it meant something, and that had been his most attractive quality. Now true victory was gone, unless you counted Dallas' ships, wherever they went. When she'd been forced to stare down the barrels of Starless's guns, she discovered she hadn't wanted to die after all. Laying here in her cabin she found she had nothing to live for either. Revenge was out. So was the thrill of a larger cause. Even if she didn't get locked up in some Alliance prison cell for the next decade, she had no idea what to do with her life. She had no family, no friends, nobody to care if she was gone. In some ways prison might be better than forgiveness, at least there she wouldn't be forced to wander among normal beings living normal lives, the kind that had been stolen from her by the Jedi and the Vong barely after she was born. She was ruminating on the pointlessness of it all when the door to her room slid open with a soft hiss. Miranda leaped off the bed, landed at her feet, and stood stiff at attention. She didn't know who she'd been expecting to see, but it certainly wasn't Myrie and Tilly's. The woman wore a dark green jumpsuit. Her hair, brown streaked pink and silver, was pulled back in an incongruously military bun. Her cool blue eyes took in the room with one sweep, 
and she said, just like mine. It was, in fact, minor variations in the furniture, perhaps, but the size and shape of the room was exactly the same as the one Myrie had spent over a week locked up in. You survived, Miranda said, because it was all she could think of. During Mary's time of captivity on Phoenix, Miranda had been charged by Captain Loro with the job of talking to the prisoner and trying to convince her of the rightness of True Victory's genocidal crusade. That had been a bust. Mary had been too good at heart, too well raised, to be even tempted by their mad quest. You survived too, Myri said. I'm glad. I've already lost a friend today. I'm sorry to hear that, Miranda said awkwardly. She'd never been good at empathy. So now what? Your case is under review. What does that mean? It means that Fell and Creefy want to repair Phoenix and put her back in action. They've already granted pardons to lots of the technical crew so they can fix the engines and weapon systems. Odds are we're going to need them whenever Dalla or the Vaughn come back. Some have refused on principle, but most want to at least improve their chances of survival. Lucky them? I don't have those skills, though. You used to be an agent for Erefcha. You did jobs for him. If you mean dirty jobs, then yeah, I did. I killed a man on tattooing to keep him quiet. I ended up chased down by a couple of Criffin Jedi. Speaking of which, what happened to the stuff in my desk? You mean the lightsaber? Mary raised an eyebrow. And the other thing, where are they? Safe. Miranda sighed. Is that Jedi Prince with you? Skywalker's son. Because that's his lightsaber? I figure he might as well have it back. Ben Skywalker was on Zanum a second when it jumped away, Mary said. We're still trying to find out where it went. Well, good luck with that. I can't help you there. Or anywhere else. I was useless to Arefja in the end too. He just stuck me on the bridge because they needed a warm body to push buttons. Mary looked at Miranda but said nothing. Her eyes were sad, or worse, pitying. Miranda looked away. Eventually, Myri asked, What happened to Captain Laurel? I see she isn't on the crew list anymore. Miranda's throat went dry. She swallowed and, without looking up, said, She's dead. Mary couldn't have been surprised. With a cold and level voice, she asked, How did she die? Miranda sighed and looked up, holding Mary's eyes. She was executed by Erefcha for helping you escape. Mary blinked, confused. What do you mean? When your escape pod was floating around, we had you pinned down. But Captain Laurel told the gunners to fire on Valor, Dalla's old Clone Wars destroyer. That's how you got away. She couldn't hide what she'd done, so she let Erefcha execute her. That was the only way to put it, really. After Mary escaped, Laurel hadn't put up any struggle. She'd accepted her punishment and gone in front of the firing squad without a single show of regret. In fact, just as the lasers hit and dropped her to the deck in a crumpled smoking heap, she had smiled. Miranda would never forget the slight, satisfied curve on the old woman's lips, underlit by the glow of laser blasts, not until the day she died. She did it for you, Miranda said. She decided in the end she'd rather save you than have her revenge. Mary's face wavered, like it was on verge of melting. Tears ran down either cheek. The woman looked away and held the sleeve of her jumpsuit up to sop the wetness from her face. She didn't just wipe them away, she stood there like that, body turned to the side, face pressed into forearm, chest and back shaking with silent tears. Miranda had no idea what to say. All she felt, watching Mary and Tilly's cry in front of her, was how lucky El Scoloro had been. After a long life defined by loss and anger, with nothing to live for but her hate, she'd found something better, something worth giving up her life for. Miranda still hoped, deep down, there was something worth living for, but in the end Elskal had managed to define a lifetime of pain not with more destruction, but with an act of selfless sacrifice. Eventually, Myrie lowered her arm and turned to face Miranda with damp eyes. Thank you for telling me, she said. Miranda nodded. Listen, I, um, I'd like to help. Do something. You mean you want to be released? Yes. 
but I also want to do something besides sit in the cell. Help repair Phoenix, anything. Would you help crew the ship, even if it means fighting Dallas people to protect Zanima Second? She had to think about that. She still had no love for the U.S. involved, but she had no love for Dalla either. When she joined True Victory, she felt intoxicated by the thought of making a major change in the galaxy by exterminating the Vong and forcing changes in the Galactic Alliance. Maybe, somehow, she could force a change this way too, and do something that really mattered with her life. More likely, she was going to get herself killed. But if she was going to die, she didn't want it to be locked in her quarters. She could at least die on the deck of her ship, like Mom and Dad. I'll do it, she said. I'd like to help take Dalla down, if I can. Mary nodded. All right. I can't promise anything, but I'll try and talk to people on your behalf. Thank you, Miranda said. I want to live to see that Jedi Prince. I have some things I need to give him. It wasn't much to live for, but it was a start. Jagged Fell was pretty good at hiding his anxieties, but so was Sial and Tilly's and that meant she could see through him. The commander of Trinity Fleet stayed impressively busy in the aftermath of the fight. There was, to be sure, a lot of things to be done to repair the damage on Starless, salvage wrecked ships, figure out what to do with all the true victory members, and decide how to crew Phoenix. Jagged Fell managed to take charge of it all with daunting focus and efficiency, and Sial tried to manage everything on Starless as best she could. Nonetheless, he was getting tired, and she knew Jagged had been awake for longer than her. After Creffy set off on his shuttle to take command of Phoenix, Sial tracked down and intercepted her cousin as he hurried from the flight deck to the communication center below the bridge. As soon as she found him, she grabbed his attention by snapping a salute and rattling off a list of status updates. Jagged heard it all and kept nodding, but she could tell his attention was starting to slacken. Finally, she said, Sir, don't you need some rest? Fell took a moment to respond, like he hadn't realized she'd asked him a question. I'm quite all right, Captain. You should look after yourself and grab some rack time. I just took some stems, sir. That's no substitute for sleep. I realize that. You've been awake for longer, sir, and you should go first. When we find Zanima. I know, he snapped, holding up a hand. I assure you, Captain, when the battle resumes, I will be on top fighting for him. Sayal frowned. She knew that obstinacy well. Can we talk without rank for a moment, sir? She was surprised when a tired smile formed on his face. All right, Sayal. Go ahead. She swallowed. We need to set staggered, scheduled breaks. We don't know when Zanima Second is going to call us, and we can't keep running on stems until it does. Yes. I know. He sighed and rubbed his temple. When Dalla captured you, frankly, I was a mess. I was running on stems and adrenaline and fear the whole time. I thought that everyone's fate depended on me. She laughed softly. And when I got to you, you'd already freed yourself and brought Mary back from the dead. I figure odds are even that your wife might come to our rescue. I don't doubt Jaina, Fell said. She's always made the right decisions always done what to be done. I just want to make sure we are in good enough shape to give her the extra help she needs in the end. Of course. He rubbed his temple again. Your sister is all right, isn't she? The wraiths lost one, but she got through okay. Help save your sister in the end. Ah, yes. Of course. That's right. Fell sighed and closed his eye. It seemed to take great effort to open it again. Captain Antilles, I believe you may have a good point. I like to think so, sir. All right. Very well. I am going to do one last thing in the comm station, then retire to my quarters. I'm glad to hear that. However, I will only do this on one condition. He held up a finger. The moment I roll out of my bunk, you crawl into yours. Sial smiled. Stem should be worn off by then, sir. I hope so. Thank you for slapping a little sense into me, Captain. No slapping involved so far, sir. Talking sense, I mean. Feld drew himself up straight. Get to work, Captain. I'll let you know when you're good for rack time. 
Take whatever you need, she saluted, smiling. Oh, believe me, sigh all, I intend to. Chapter 15 Some heroes we are, huh? Jasmine said with a sigh. She sat on her cot with her back against the wall, both legs splayed out in front of her. She had a series of back to bandages over her left thigh and another, thinner one wrapped around her neck. When she spoke, her voice was hoarse and rasping thanks to the Sith, which who nearly choked the life out of her. Scott grunted his approval as he lay flat on his own cot, staring up at the clinic's curved ceiling. I figure it's actually a little poetic, she continued. I get stabbed in the left leg by a Sith. You get your right one torn up by a U.S. Vong. We'll both be hobbling around like invalids for a while, thanks to mirroring wounds delivered by both halves of our looming enemy. Ack! Scut shouted as Payne stabbed up his leg again. He tried to proper himself up on his elbow so he could look. Stay down. Jessman and Kadra Val barked in unison, one from his side and the other from around the Nova of Payne that was his right thigh. So anyway, Jessman went on. I was able to drag my useless butt over to the comm shed and talk to Shar a little bit ago. He says Yuhana got hurt too, and you know, that made me feel better. Because if a big strong wook like her could get hurt, then a wimpy little Jedi dropout like me put up a good fight. She'll be fine by the way. Drickall patched her up. They'll be on their way back here soon though. I heard it's the comm system they need to fix now. Scut screamed again as Payne stabbed up his leg and fanned out through his torso. It was gone as quickly as it came, leaving him panting, staring up at the ceiling, and clutching the reed shoot frame of his cot with both hands. From the bottom edge of his vision, he saw Kadra Val stand up, the tentacles on her shaper's headdress writhing. She looked at him as though she was inspecting a particularly ugly kind of insect and said, You are far too sensitive to pain. Too bad. Scott grunted. I am not one of your warriors. I did not start stabbing myself since the age of five. Kadra Val wiped her long-fingered hands on the apron of her woven dress. Well, perhaps you will get used to it. I am done for now. Wonderful, Scott said. I cannot wait to see your beautiful handiwork. With more grunts and groans, he managed to prop himself up on his elbows and look at what she'd done to his leg. The thing she's wrapped around his thigh was the color of mud, and had a scaly texture. As he looked at it, it seemed to expand and contract slightly, like it was breathing. He titled his head, looked at it more, and thought he saw one little mirror black eye staring back at him. That was enough to drop him on his back. What is that thing? It is a Morlaith, Kadra Val said. Matter of fact, I made sure it was well fed before attaching it to your wound. Once the food processes through his body, it will start ejecting important proteins and tissue into your system that will greatly accelerate the healing process. You are saying, Scut trailed off, brain struggling to comprehend. All his life he'd fancied himself a great biologist, a creative inventor who tried to salvage the scientific genius of his people without all the nasty stuff that came with it. As it turned out, he'd been the worst kind of amateur, fumbling through motions learned from somebody else without understanding anything at all. At least, that was how he felt with the Morlyeth wrapped around his leg. Oh, he muttered, oh Pudu. You could put it that way, Jasmine said with a giggle. Not funny? It will heal you faster than this back to material from your fleet, Kadra Val said. Our supply ran out not long after we broke contact with the Alliance and I've been experimenting with more Lyoth Breeze that would serve the Pharaoh population instead of Bakta, with mixed results. Therefore, I did not think it wise to apply one to your human friend, as well. Trust me, Jasmine said, I am just fine with Bakta. Scut listened to their voices without looking at anything except the ceiling. He didn't want to risk eye contact with that thing on his leg. How long do I have to keep this on? Based on your wounds, Perhaps a day, Kadra Val said. And then what? Am I going to need a cane or something? Oh no, she said. You will be totally healed. Huh? Jasmine puffed. Lucky. Well, okay. Scut had to be logical. That was a bright side. I guess I will just stay like this, not moving, not looking at my leg, for another day. 
You will be lucky to last so long, Kodra Val said. There are still enemies out there to fight. Don't remind me. He heard the rustle of Kodra Val's headdress as the shaper shook her head. You would not make a good member of the warrior cast, Vil Gorset. I never wanted to be. I like my face the way it is, thank you. Not all the warriors mutilate themselves now, Kodra Val said. Particularly those who worship the new god, the Ganner. They place quite a prize on a comely, symmetric physical appearance. Just like the one they worship, how fitting, Tahiri said from the corner of the room. Scut didn't strain to look in her direction, but he asked, when did you show up? Just now, she said. He heard her footsteps as they clapped across the clinic's hard floor. Oh, you've got a more life. He should be healed in a day, Kadraval said. I only had to wear one for a couple hours, but I was a little kid at the time. For a moment, Scut wanted to ask what in the cark she was talking about. Then he remembered that Tahiri Vila was also Rena Quad, and she had a whole separate set of memories implanted in her skull by a mad U.S. Hanvong shaper on Yavin 4. It made his own life look simple in comparison. I was just saying that he would make a poor warrior, Kodra Val said. However, I believe he would be a fine shaper. Really? Scut asked. He hadn't known Kadra Val very long, but she didn't seem like the joking kind. Oh, yes. Your ingenuity is quite impressive, especially considering that you were working within the limitations of the Amphithe Alliance. Oh, well, that's great. Um, thank you. Not at all. I look forward to seeing what else you can do once you are healed. He felt a hand pat his left calf. So rest well. I want to see you in peak condition. He heard the swish of skirts and the clacking of feet as she turned and left. He stared up at the ceiling for a long time. Nobody spoke. Finally, Scut asked, was she flirting with me? Jessmine tried to stifle a laugh poorly. Tahiri said, you as Hanvong shapers tend to be women, and they tend to look down on warriors as muscle-brained brutes. So she was complimenting you? Definitely. Well, that's Amwa. I'm going to have to think about that for a while. Take your time, Jessmine said. It's not like you're going anywhere else for the next 24 hours. Hopefully, Tahiri said, her tone more serious. What have you heard? Scut asked. He heard the other cot creak under additional weight and turned his head carefully to the side. Tahiri sat at Jessmine's feet, shoulders hunched forward. A little bit from Jaina. Tahiri said. She's on her way now. She says she's talked with Sekut. The planet's living awareness, Scut reminded himself. He'd read the U.S. Hinvong legends about a single consciousness guiding U.S. Hinter, and had studied the biology of the late world brain that they had installed on Karuskin in their attempt to replicate their homeworld. Still, the scientist in him had a hard time picturing some collective consciousness emerging out of chaotic nature. If it had happened here, why not other planets? If there was an answer, it probably lay in the force, but that was untouchable to him. Second said the planet was attacked, Tahiri continued. The fleet called True Victory went after it. They attacked our fleet and would have beaten them. Then Second reached out with the force and attacked True Victory. Jesmond frowned. How does that work exactly? I don't know, but has done it before. Not in a long time, though. Tahiri looked worried. I guess Sekut tore through most of the True Victory fleet, then jumped away. Scud wanted to ask about Starless and about their friends up in orbit, but he knew Tahiri had no more answers. We're sending crew out to repair the long-range transmitter, Tahiri said. When they fix it, they'll send out the encrypted beacon signal that should bring Trinity fleet. Assuming they're still alive, Scud thought grimly. Tahiri forced a smile and looked them both over. You'll both be fine, though. You should be on your feet and back to normal soon. I'm sure we'll need you both. Tahiri, Jasmine said, I'm sorry about Ben. I... I know you already told me. Tahiri held up one hand. I know you did the best you could. You tried to stand your ground against a Sith, and an especially nasty one at that. Your mother would be proud. Dad would be disappointed I didn't blow her up. Well, you can't please everyone, Tahiri shrugged easily and looked at Scud. 
You too. You did a great job trying to tackle those warriors. Fat good that did. Kila Quad kidnapped, two dead. But the others lived. That's what's important. A frown creased the scars on her forehead. You can't dwell on your failures too much. That'll eat you up inside. Believe me. Heard you bag yourself a Sith Lord, Jesmond said. I don't know if that's quite the right term, but yeah, I got him. Tired satisfaction shone on Tahiri's face. And you know what? When he had me cornered in the woods, I was scared out of my criffy mind. Jesmond chuckled, and so did Scut. In truth, it did make him feel better to know that Tahi reveal a famous Jedi, Force user, whatever could get scared witless. A glance at Jesmond showed she felt better too. There was a knock on the door. Scut didn't look in his direction, but he saw Tahiri pop to her feet. Jaina, the blonde woman said, that was fast. Strong wind at our backs, a cool female voice responded. Tahiri, can we speak outside for a minute? Of course, Tahiri glanced at the two wraiths. Rest up, you two. I'll see you later. Scud turned his face back up to the ceiling as Tahiri walked out of the room. A second after she was gone, he heard more footsteps and the low grumble of a Wookiee. He was pretty sure there was only one Wookiee on Zanima second, and that meant Jaina Solo had brought the other wraiths back with her. Sith spawn. That creature looks hideous. Charlotte cried. Oh, and there's something on his leg. Har, har, Scut said humorlessly. You holding in there, Hughana? Jessman asked. The Wookiee grunted affirmative. Well, Char, and I saw our share of action too, Drickall said defensively. Vong paratroopers, sailing down into hip to drive engine shafts big enough to ram a Corellian Corvette inside. This is one crazy planet. Cher's white-haired head appeared on the edge of Scut's vision. He gave the U.S. and Vong an appraising look and asked, seriously, what is that thing? Do you really want to know? I have to say I'm curious, yes. Drickall's horn head appeared next to him. I am too. That's an interesting piece of work. So, in the most clinical, detached, scientific way possible, Scut explained. He at least had the reward of watching Cher's face contort shock and disgust. When he was done, both of them looked like they were about to puke. Uh, Shar said, sorry I asked. Jaina led Tahiri on a slow, meandering walk through the lanes of the village and beyond, into the hills where grass grew high and copses of bora trees shot upward like pillars bristling with colorful leaves. The overhead sky, however, was overcast with gray clouds that seemed to suck all color out of the landscape. First, Jaina talked a little more about her encounter with Second. She talked about how the planet had taken the form of a man she didn't recognize, and how that man had possessed form and strength, even warmth, like a living being. She talked about how Second didn't know where Ben was but would try and ascertain whether he was still on the planet's surface anywhere. Finally, she talked about Jason. When Jaina was done recounting what Second had told her, Tahiri frowned in confusion. Are you suggesting what I think you are? That second could somehow bring Jason back? I don't understand either. Like a force ghost, but given form the way it does to the images it creates. But what does that mean? Could Jason move around, do what he wants? Could he leave the planet? Could he use the force? I don't know. Second says it can't resurrect my brother. It can just give him form for a little while. Jaina didn't know if that was really a difference. She went on, he says we'll need Jason's help. He says a dragon is coming. Tahiri stared out at the hills, the village, and the sprawling gray clouds, and hugged her shoulders tight. Summon a Sith to fight a Sith. Why would that be a good idea again? Ben and Uncle Luke said he's not a Sith anymore, wherever he is. But he's no Jedi either. No but I don't know if he ever was. You could say the same about me, Tahiri sighed. The question is, which Jason would we get? I keep so many versions of him in my memory, you know. Most of the time he's Ketis. He's pale and sulky. His eyes are angry and yellow. He'll do anything to anybody to get what he wants, because he thinks he knows what's best for everybody. 
He'll play with your emotions, draw out your hopes and fears, and use them to trap you. Tahiri, croaked Jaina I. And sometimes, she continued, still staring into nothing. Sometimes I remember the other Jason. I remember him when he was always doubting, always wondering what his place in the force was. He used to bug the hell out of Anakin, and me too, sometimes. And then there's the Jason tore at the end of the war, after he died and came back. He was, strong man, still not sure of everything, and hurt in all kinds of ways, but a lot of those were ways I'd been hurt in. Losing Anakin. Spending too much time with the U.S. involved and wondering if they'd left a piece of themselves inside you. He was, a really good friend then. For a little while I almost thought I was. She stopped, shook her head, as if to banish old memories. Jaina understood, though, and it made her heart ache. Tahiri had spent so many years aching for the young man she'd loved and lost. The man she seemed destined to be with forever, and the closest thing she had to Anakin was his brother. But in the end, Jason had manipulated those feelings, turning them against Tahiri herself and the entire Jedi Order. And that was the man Sekut said they needed, the man it offered to summon. Weakly, Tahiri asked, which Jason do you remember? All those and more, she thought. But she said, I try not to think of Jason at all. I know. But Jaina, he's your brother. You can't just pretend he never existed. I can try. He was half your life. Exactly, Jaina thought. For the past four years, she'd been trying hard to forget half her life. Sometimes she even succeeded. She blew out a breath. What would you do? If Sekit offered you a chance to summon Jason, knowing everything we know, what would you do? Tahiri stared out at the clouds, contemplating. I don't think I can forgive Jason for what he did to me. I hope I never see him again. Then we won't summon him. You asked my opinion? Tahiri looked at her with sad green eyes. I'm not trying to tell you what to do. The only one who can make that choice is you. And I agree. What Jason did, I can't forgive that. Uncle Luke might have been able to forgive Darth Vader. But I, I don't have that in me. Jaina shook her head. I was never as nice as Uncle Luke. Okay, then we turn second down. Tahiri sounded disappointed. It would be easy. Just look second in whatever pass for us at the next time it deigned to show up and tell it, no thank you, we'll handle the oncoming dragon on our own. But it felt like running away. She didn't want to see Jason again, didn't want to face the half of her life she'd thrust a lightsaber through four years ago. But she also knew she'd never get another chance. Cautiously, Jaina asked, If I do summon him, will you be with me? She expected an angry reaction, but Tahiri just nodded with sad eyes. Whatever you decide, I'll be there for you. Thank you so much. Jaina reached out, took Tahiri by the shoulder, and pulled her close. She rested her cheek against Tahiri's blonde hair, nestled her nose in it, so the other woman wouldn't see her tears. What are you going to do? Tahiri asked softly. I don't know, but I'm afraid I can't afford not to do it. There might be other ways to beat the Sith. That's not what I meant. A long, sad pause. I know. The Mandalorians, like Jaina and the three wraiths, had taken the shuttle back to the village. They talked little on the ride there. They buried Gotham's armor in the field outside the hyperdrive veins and at the time it had felt like a good place to consign Bardica to an eternity with the mandate. The ceremony had been simple and had felt like a satisfying farewell at the time, the kind God of would have liked. Before doing so, Venku had taken the right forearm plating from God of's armor and added it to his own. He also took God of's weapon and clipped it to his belt alongside both of his mothers, though what he'd do with three lightsabers he didn't know. On the ride back to the village, he felt curiously empty. He was no stranger to death. He felt his mother die in the forest when he was a small child. He'd watched his uncles and brothers die one after another in a lifetime of warfare. That kind of life made you numb to death, especially if you went to lengths to suppress your natural connection with the Force. Gotham was different, though. In his connection with the Force, and his love for Etain, though he'd never out and called as such, Bardica had been the closest thing Venku had to a real father. In the back of his mind, 
Venku had always expected that when the old XGD finally kicked it, it would hurt the way death was supposed to, the way his mother's had 65 years ago. Instead, he felt next to nothing. He knew he should have. He saw the pain on Muriel's weathered, lined old face. He could see it on Bess and Gendry's too, but Ordo's grandkids hadn't been as closely bonded to Gadab as Venku himself. So, an hour after arriving in the village, Venku left the others behind and went for a walk in the forest. He knew what he wanted and was loath to admit it to himself. He wanted to see Gadab again. He wanted to see his boar pop up out of thin air and have a chat, just like Mara Skywalker had done with her kid. He wanted the force, this strange burden he'd been born with, to be worth something for once. But since he couldn't get that, he wandered around the borer trunks, looking up through layers of colorful leaves at a leaden, dreary sky. At least the scenery fit his mood. After a while of wandering, he sat down on a fallen log and tried to get his bearings. This cloudy sky gave no hint of the sun's location, not that that necessarily meant direction with a rogue planet like this. He looked around and tried to determine the path he'd taken but failed. Venku tried to remember the last time he'd gotten himself lost. For some reason, he didn't mind this. He didn't even have the desire to get found again. So he spent a long time sitting on the log, staring at the trees as they shifted and rustled in the wind. Tentatively he allowed himself to open to the force, as he had when he'd first woken up on this strange planet. He felt life? Yes. So much life. Insects, birds far up in the canopies, little mammals crawling through the underbrush. All manner of life stretching for the sky and fungi growing in the decay of undergrowth. The cycle of birth, striving, death, and renewal. The natural order of things was very Mando, or at least so the Mandalorians liked to think. It was part of the reason why they never industrialized Mandalore, like so many other planets. That, and the fact that they were rarely organized enough to tackle ambitious building projects. Growing up, the valleys and forests outside Kiramorit had been a constant reminder to young Kataka of that harsh, immortal order of things. Maybe that's why he didn't feel stranded here in the wilderness, even though he was lost. He was allowing himself to sink to the subtle motions of life when he felt a presence in the forest, far stronger than any bird or tree. Lifelong warrior instincts kicked in and he rose to his feet. He had a blaster on one hip and three lightsabers clanking off the other and his hand went for the ladder. But he recognized that sensation in the force. Powerful, determined, tired, and sad. It was Jaina Solo. She appeared in the distance, walking slowly in his direct iron, weaving in and out of the tree trunks. He took his hand off Gotham's lightsaber, sat back down on the log, and waited for her to come. When she got close, he said, were you able to track me? I asked Muriel where you went, actually, she said casually as she walked up to his log. I wondered a lot. Got lost. How do you find me? I felt you in the forest, she admitted. May I sit? Who's stopping you? Good man, no answer, Jaina said, and sat down next to him. They looked out at the forest, neither speaking. It was very still and very quiet except for the faint rustle of leaves overhead. Venkus felt a little angry at being robbed of his peaceful solitude. He asked, What did you haul all the way out here for? I wanted to talk to you. So talk. She glanced at him like she was disappointed somehow. Then she asked, How is everyone holding up? We're Mandas. We've buried plenty of brothers before. Don't give me the tough warrior guy act. You're not fat. How are you holding up? I don't know, he admitted. He was an old man. This was going to happen sooner or later, especially if he kept on going on missions with us. He could have stayed on Mandalore, she observed. He didn't have fat blood. The Nanavaris didn't affect him. Everyone he cared about did. We're about family, you know that. An Aeliite is a lot more than blood. Of course he was going to come with us. You're right, she said. Family is more than blood. But blood's still part of it. It wasn't for Venku. His mother and father both died when he was a child. He hadn't loved Ordo, Mario, Fi, or the others because they came from the same Awa Bait Vada's Darman. 
He loved them because they raised him, taught him, and made him into a man. And because, with no blood family left, they were the only thing he had. Sometimes he thought his crusade to unite the entire Mandalorian nation sprung from the fact that he had to create whatever family he could get. Jaina continued, I need to make a choice. A hard one. A long time ago I talked with you and got up on Mandalore. I remember. The sunset had been glorious, the conversation sad. That talk helped me do what I had to do. I had to kill my brother, Jaina said with difficulty. Now I might have to do something else. And what's that? I might have to bring him back. He stared at her, trying to understand. Did she mean bring back his force ghost? He was a little surprised that hadn't happened already. As he understood it, little Jason Solo had spent a lot of time on this planet before going bat Asa crazy, and Second could probably summon his blue ghost with ease. Still, he didn't envy Jaina the conversation. He hoped to talk with Gadab, and all his life he'd nursed a secret desire to talk to his Jedi mother's ghost, especially when he was young. At the same time, he never wanted to talk to his father, who not only died but killed brothers for his son's sake. Even now, it was too hard to really face. He was thankful that Darman had been a plain, powerless normal. What would be the point? He asked. Aside from hurting yourself. It's not just about Jason. Second insists he can help us fight the Sith that are out there. More Sith. It figured. At least this time the Force users were swinging their blaze around in the unknown regions, where they wouldn't knock over any civilizations. He knew better than to say that to Jaina though, she clearly wasn't in the mood. And, he admitted, the three metal cylinders weighing down his belt made him a little more amenable to saber jocks than usual. That, and the craving he had to talk to got up, just once more. I love him, Jaina said softly. Still, and I hate him for what he did to Mara, Ben, Tahiri, and so many other people. And you have Inku thought, but Jaina Solo wasn't so selfish as to wallow exclusively in her pain, though she easily could have. What can he really do? Venku asked. Just show up all blue and hazy, give some cryptic advice if he's in the mood. Not just that, Jaina shook her head. Second can, give form to him. So it says. Now he was alarmed. Give form? What does that mean? It means give him a body? Bring him back to life. That's not what Second says. It just means, I guess, bring him back for a little while. Fear effect. And he thought Second had been crazy before. Now this living planet could apparently bring people back from the dead. The possibilities and consequences were staggering. He stretched out with the force, felt the forest around him, in many ways so like the forest on Mandalore. It beggared his mind that a world so similar to what he'd known could also possess such mind-bending power. Do you want advice? He asked. Because this sounds way out of my league. Jaina laughed bitterly. Yeah, mine too. If you bring him back, what's he going to be? It doesn't make sense to bring a Sith Lord back to fight more Sith. I know. Believe me, I know. But I think, it's different. Jason was never really a Sith, just like he was never really a Jedi. He was only Jason, whatever that meant at the time. She sighed and pulled the lightsaber off her belt. Still sitting, she pressed the trigger and a violet blade hummed to life in front of her. They call me the Sword of the Jedi? Did you know that? I did. She certainly earned it. Swords cut. They stab. They rant. They bring justice and slay dragons. I've done all those things. And you know what? Swords don't heal. They can't. They just keep tearing holes. Empathy was a strange thing for Venku. A warrior's life had burned most it out of him. He cared about his clan, and the Mandalorians both individually and as a race but he made a point not to care for others outside that clan, especially Jedi. Gadab and Kalbabur's bitterness had been burned into him from a young age, and for the first time he was starting to regret that. Right now, his heart was aching for Jaina Solo. I recognize that saber, he said. That's the one you trained with on Mandalore. I used it to kill my brother, she said stiffly. He thought as much. 
It was a grim thing to hold on to a constant reminder of your sins, but he'd seen it before. After Niner slotted Darman, he said, Bartica wiped his memory. It was hard for him. Niner was his brother, but he did it because it was the only way Niner could live with himself. Bartica told himself he was being merciful, but he never decided if he'd done the right thing. I think a part of Niner still remembered, though. He kept the gun. He didn't carry it around with him all the time, but he kept it in a locked drawer. Unloaded. I'm not even sure if he knew why. Not consciously, but he kept it hidden there. We didn't even know until he passed, and we found it in his house. He couldn't let it go. I can't tell you what to do, Venku sighed. I don't have any answers. I think if I had the chance to see my father again, talk to him, fight with him, I wouldn't. Couldn't. I've spent all my life trying not to be what he was in the end. Jaina nodded and stared at the brilliant violet white of her sword. But, he admitted, you're a lot braver than I am. Her saber still burning, Jaina pushed herself off the log and got to her feet. She looked down at Venku, gave her saber a little wave, and asked, are in the shape to spar? The question took him a little by surprise. His body still felt sluggish, like his brain and muscles weren't connecting right. Well, he was still in better shape than most men in his age. Venku stood up and pulled God of Saber off his belt. Without asking, he tossed it to Jaina, and she caught it easily in her free hand. As she ignited it, he drew both his mother's sabers. I'm not used to fighting with two blades, Jaina said. You're never too old to learn, Venku said. Besides, I'm old and broke down. I could use the handicap. Okay, Jaina chuckled lightly easily. She angled her body slightly forward, her saber pointed flat and forward, Gotham's held diagonally across her chest. Show me what you've got, she said. Swords of light blurred, flashed, and sang through the forest. Chapter 16 While Chimera did not escape the battle at Zanima second undamaged, her crew nonetheless considered themselves lucky. The destruction the living world wrought on Admiral Arefja's fleet had been stunning to behold. Philaior herself had felt her jaw drop open in terror and awe at the sight of giant waves of rainbow light sweeping across empty space, leaving flaming wreckage in their wake. When Dala had given the order to retreat to hyperspace, the entire crew breathed sighs of relief. Philaior was occupied with damaged surveys and repairs for hours afterward. The boarding team sent to pillage the Chiz vessel had discovered the act of self-destruct program, and most of them had been able to evacuate in time. Still, some of the explosion had damaged Chimera's ventral turbolaser batteries and shield projectors, and EV teams were sent out to repair them. As had happened after the battle in the nebula, Philire felt happy to lose herself in her work. It was a tired, true adage that nothing brought a crew together like times of crisis. She felt like she was gaining the trust of Chimera's personnel while she oversaw repairs, and in turn was coming to trust them as well. She was also glad not to have to deal with Dala. After the battle and hasty retreat, the old admiral had gone grim and silent with barely concealed anger. The anger of Nadasi Dala was the stuff of legend, and Philior did not want to be in her vicinity when the dam burst. Of course, it had to happen eventually. After some 12 hours of direct and repairs, Philire was summoned to Dalla's private ready room. The gunnery section chief, wearing a concerned expression, had wished her good luck. It made her feel a little better, but only a little. When she stepped into Dalla's ready room, she was surprised to find the woman standing at the counter in the far corner of the chamber, pouring a glass of amber-colored wine into a pair of slim glasses. Good day. Admiral Philire remained by the door with a military straight posture, hands clasped behind her back. Dalla said, Good evening, actually. At least based on the ship's internal chronos. Ah, I'm sorry. Good evening then. Come, come, Dalla waved Philire over to her side of the room. Philire walked forward and tried not to show her deep concern. Sulky Dalla, she could handle. Angry Dalla, she was expecting. But happy Dalla. After all that had just happened, she couldn't wrap her mind around that miracle of the universe. Dalla picked up one glass of wine and raised it. Have a drink, Captain. 
You've been working very hard and deserve a moment of respite. Thank you, Admiral. Filier picked up the other glass and clinked it lightly against Dallas. Truth be told, she was very tired and one glass of wine would probably put her to sleep, but she wasn't going to tell Dalla that. Let's sit down, Dalla gestured to the sofa. I want you to tell me about the repairs. Filier sat down on one end of the sofa, Dalla on the other, leaving the middle cushion empty between them. Taking occasional sips of wine, not too strong. Thankfully, she explained the status of repairs on the shield generators and turbolaser batteries. She also gave a thorough accounting of the TIE fighters and shuttles lost during the battle. Dalla listened, nodding and occasionally asking questions, but the woman seemed distracted, like there was something far more important she wanted to get to. When Philire wrapped up her briefing, interest lit up in Dalla's eyes. They were finally getting to whatever she wanted to talk about. The old woman took one more sip of wine then put her quarterfold glass down on the low table next to the sofa. She leaned forward a little and said, Captain Filier, we have made an important discovery. Filier had guessed as much, though she wasn't sure what could warrant the drastic change in the Admiral's mood. She asked, have you located Zanima II? Not yet, unfortunately. Resolve has been sending out probes, though of course any search is a very long shot. However, when we do find Zanima II, or the Vong fleet, we will be ready for them. How? Filier frowned. Before being forced to evacuate Celestial, our boarding teams made a very interesting discovery. They encountered a biological laboratory on the ship, which contained a heavily sealed Durasteel safe. Naturally, we decided whatever was in there must have been important. Our people managed to load it on the last shuttle off Celestial. Filier felt disappointed in herself for not keeping better track of the returning boarding parties. She'd been so caught up in repairs an important element of the ship's operation had slipped beneath her concern. Of course, it was very possible the boarding crew reported directly to Dalla, keeping her out of the loop again. Have we opened the safe? She asked, though in this case we clearly meant Dalla's special agents, whoever they were. We had to cut it apart in the end, Dalla said. What we found was a collection of small vials containing identically composed biological material. What kind of material would they need to put in a secure safe? A very good question. However, from the start I had my suspicions. They turned out to be correct. A confident smile spread on her face. Tell me, Captain, how much do you know about the last battle of the U.S. Hinvong War? Phil Iyer fought a frown. She'd been young when Karuskin had been liberated, too young to fight and it hadn't been covered very extensively at the academy. It had been a joint operation, mixing Imperial, Alliance, Happen, Chiss, even Smuggler's Alliance elements. The staff at the academy had preferred to focus on pure Imperial tactics, using battles by all Imperial fleets. Rather than try to hide her ignorance, she admitted, I'm sorry, Admiral. I haven't studied it closely. Captain, you should at least know that while Imperial and Alliance vessels broke through the Vong defenses on Karuskin, the Happens and smuggling vessels formed a protective cordon around Zanima II. It was rumored, though officially denied by the participants, that the U.S. and Vong were able to slip one small ship past the defensive cordon and set it on a direct run for Zanima II. Unlike today, the living world was reticent to attack its enemies. Supposedly, it intercepted this ship with several of its own and flung both out into the oblivion of space. I see, Philire said, though she couldn't see what such a minor incident had to do with their life and death struggle now. It was also rumored, said Dalla, that this special ship was a late arrival to the fight. Supposedly, it came from Kalula. Kalula is a planet near Mon Calamari that the U.S. and Vong were using as an advance base for their assault on the Alliance's temporary capital. However, shortly before that assault, the Vong threat on Kalula was neutralized. Quickly, suddenly neutralized. How? We don't know, Dalla shook her head. All we know is that, with barely any effort, the Alliance was able to kill every U.S. and Vong on the planet. Everything was destroyed except for this one escaping ship which later threw itself at Zanima II. I'm sorry, Admiral. I don't understand, Philire admitted. 
Now here is the critical part. Dalla leaned closer. There was another rumor from around that time. The Alliance and the Chiss had co-developed a bioweapon that killed U.S. and Von life forms. This virus destroyed every piece of Von life it touched on a molecular level. If that ship from Kalula was infected with the bioweapon, the U.S. and Von must have thrown it at Zanim a second in the hopes the weapon would destroy the living world as well. And you're saying that is what we recovered from Celestial? Dollar Grand. Exactly, Captain. We even tested it on some of the coral skipper debris we salvaged during the last two battles. Within an hour, they were coming apart on a molecular level. Phil Iyer fought down a shutter. It sounded like a terrible weapon. Of course, was killing them with a the bioweapon any better or worse than killing them with turbo lasers and concussion missiles? If the Alliance really had used it on Kalula, that alone was proof of his potency. Phileir licked dry lips. So, you plan on using it against the Vong? Of course, said Dala. Her hands balled into fists and pounded at her thighs. We set out on this mission to destroy the U.S. and Vong. Eradicate them from the galaxy forever. And that is exactly what we're going to do. Phileir had known that. She'd agreed to participate in genocide when she joined Admiral Dala's crew. Somehow, she never really understood the true enormity of it until this moment. It was suddenly very hard to breath. We're working on distribution methods now, Dalla continued. Naturally, we can't just pack vials into explosive missiles. For Zanim a second, at least, we should be able to program a probe that flies into its atmosphere, then releases the bioweapon as a spray. For the battleships, we're not yet certain. Some kind of boring missile, like the one we use to attach the homing device, may be useful. We only have a limited supply of the weapon, and it is very important that we make optimal use of it. Phileir was hardly listening. To so thoroughly eradicate an entire enemy race from the galaxy seemed too brutal, so ruthless, so imperial. Not the kind of empire Jagged Fell, Vitor Riich, or Gilad Pelian had built, but the empire of Darth Vader. Emperor Palpatine, and Grand Moff Tarkin. Tarkin, who had been Dalla's mentor and lover. Phileir cursed herself for being so blind. Dalla had talked about bringing the Empire back to his roots. This was his root, the extermination of all enemies and subjugation of entire races. There was strength and order, and there was brutality and mass murder. There was a line between the two one Phileir feared to cross. She didn't know if any of that was showing on her face. Apparently not, because Dalla, still eager, leaned forward and placed one of her hands on Philire's own. When the next fight comes, we will be ready to end it permanently, she said. I just wanted you to know that and be prepared. We must keep it top secret for now, but once the deed is done, I will make certain the whole galaxy knows the part you played in bringing about this total victory. There were no words. Phileir's jaw creaked open. She managed to say, Thank you, Admiral. My pleasure, Dalla smiled as she sat back. Together, my dear, we shall make history. Vilith Dal had not expected his former mentor, irascible at the best of times, to cooperate with her kidnappers. He was, therefore, surprised when Keela quite eagerly threw herself into the examination of Darth Krait's Vondu and Crab armor. He realized how stark for a true challenge his mentor had become. That desire seemed to have carved out a piece of her sanity while leaving her scientific skills intact. While he was grateful for her help, Vilith Dow was now aware how close he'd come into falling down her same path of madness. For that, he supposed he had to thank the Sith. Barring Crate and his scientist Dishon, the Sith tended to avoid Vilith Dow. He was not surprised by that. In a way these Sith seemed as secretive and xenophobic as his own people, the difference being that the Sith were a clan you joined of your own will and effort, as opposed to one you were born into. He wondered, a little wistfully, what biological modifications it would take for a U.S. Vong to use the Force. He had to say he admired the Sith for their dedication and purpose. Vilith Dal, Keela Quad, and Dishon worked in conjunction to survey Darth Krait's situation. The former Master Shaper devoured all of the data already collected about Krait's curious condition and spent hours with the Dark Lord, performing examinations of her own. 
Vilith Dow was surprised by the patience with which the Dark Lord took so much prodding, questioning, and occasional slicing by what was clearly a deranged shaper. Incredible, incredible, Keela Quad muttered to herself as the three of them exited Crate's chamber, leaving the Dark Lord to meditate and rest. She was fiddling with Vilith Dow's casa, which she'd used to perform the survey. What is it? Dishon asked. The Sith scientist, much like her master, kept an impassive expression when working with Keela Quad. Vilith Dow felt a little regret that she had not been born U.S. Vong. She would have made a fine shaper. Still, the black tattoos that crawled along her brown face were appealing in their own fashion. Incredible, incredible, Keela Quad repeated. She spun an alarmed gaze at Vilith Dow. Do you understand who he is? What he is? What? He is Unyamka in the flesh. Kilaqua slapped the castle with the back of her hand, as though it contained incontrovertible proof. Unyamka. Vilith Dow fought a frown. When he studied under Kilaqua, she had, like so many shapers, expressed private disdain at the other cast for their rigid belief in the gods. Her domain had produced at least one notorious heretic, and Kilaqua had had to publicly skew to orthodoxy to avoid the taint. Now she seemed to be insisting that the man in another room was an actual god. She'd lost more of her mind than he'd thought. Your god of war? Dishon asked, politely curious. He is made for war, Keela Quad nodded enthusiastically, making the wilted tentacles on her headdress bob. His body, molded of human and U.S. Hinvong elements. The fire in his eyes. The anger in his soul. She was speaking metaphorically then. Good. Villa Dow had started to worry. He asked, do you think there is a way to stop the armor's growth into his wound? Oh, yes. Yes, Keela Quad nodded. Most certainly. How do you plan to do it? The old shaper chuckled. You never had the touch with our biologicals the way I did, Villa Dow. The matter is simple. We need to make that piece of armor cease to grow. And how will that be accomplished? She chuckled again. We must take it out, of course. That would kill him, Dishon objected. Kilaqua shook her head again. You don't understand, Sith. Not at all. We remove that piece of armor and replace it with another. Simple as that. It wasn't simple at all. The armor plating had joined with Dark Crate, binding tissue and even organs with the strange hybrid of human and U.S. Hinvong biology. In theory, one could physically tear the armor out, but that would kill Crate and the armor within minutes. We must breed a replacement first, Keela Quad said. And then, careful surgery. Vilith Dow glanced at Dishon. He could see the hesitation on her face, probably much like his own. Still, he had brought Keela Quad for this purpose. He had run out of ideas himself, and he saw little option other than to trust that his old mentor was still competent. Keela Quad looked at him and asked, What kind of shaping facilities does Mola have aboard the fleet? Quite adequate, actually, he said. That had been a condition of Villith Dow's joining true honor in the first place. Excellent. We must go there at once. Keela Quad started for the exit portal. Take half the guard and go back to the shuttle, he told her. Leave the rest with me. I have a few things to take care of, but I'll be along shortly. Keela Quad barely noticed. She just nodded and walked right out the door. Vilith Dow released an exasperated sigh and looked at Dishon. She was not always like this, I assure you. You can tell there's a keen mind working beneath everything else, Dishon said. Do you think she can do it? It's possible. If anyone can, it's her. She's the most brilliant shaper alive today. Then we have no choice but to trust her. The sooner she can make the attempt, the better. Only if she succeeds, Vilith Dow reminded her. If she fails, we both die. You realize that, don't you? If she fails, and Lord Crate dies, then my life will be without purpose, Dishon said simply. It would be better to be dead. So like a U.S. and Vong, Vilith Dow thought. He eyed the woman and again felt admiration for the black tattoo sprawled across her wood-colored face. What is it? She frowned. It occurs to me that, in all the time we have worked together, I have always been imposing on you, 
Vilith Dao said. I know your people have not always been comfortable with that. I think it's far past time I made a reciprocal offer. Dish's brows furrowing, bunching up the tattoos on her forehead. Will your people allow me on board? Oh, I'm sure some will object, and most viciously. Voran La floated to the top of his mind. However, I believe I can convince Ma La that you have much to offer. Can you guarantee my safety? She asked pointedly. Of course. I think you would be very interested in our facilities aboard on a regained. Once there, the three of us will continue our efforts to fix Darth Crate, together. Dishon considered for a moment, then nodded her agreement. Villad Dow was glad, not just because he enjoyed her company, but also because, just as they three had to work together, they three would live or die together. No, not three. Four. You couldn't leave out Darth Crate. Two you was involved, and two Sith. Live or die together. Chapter 17 Jaina spent the rest of the day in a state of constant tension. She fully expected Zanima Seket to appear before her suddenly with the face of that brown-haired human again, or the little boy, or Nen Yim, or even Jason himself, and ask for her decision. But it had not. So she instead went about her day as best she was able, visiting the work crews at the comm station and reviewing the situation with Danny and Har. Danny had sent out a number of survey ships to scan the planet's surface both for signs of irregularities and for Ben in particular, but they turned up with nothing. Jaina wasn't surprised. It would take weeks to search every corner of the entire planet's surface, and that was assuming Ben was even on this planet at all. For all she knew he could be held captive by the Sith, floating lost in space with Vestera or even safely aboard Starless with Jag. That last option was too appealing to hope for, and she tried to put it out of her mind. For dinner, she gathered around a fire with Tahiri, the wraiths, barring Scut, laid up in his bunk and refusing to move, and a handful of pharaoh technicians. The conversation was soft and easy, and the stars above their heads had been beautiful. When you were on a spaceship, you saw stars through every viewport, but for some reason you only truly appreciated them when you were on a planet at night, preferably enjoying a meal with good company. She spent a few hours like that, listening to Shar and Drickall's lame jokes, gleaning information from the pharaohs, and envying the weirdly satisfied look on Tahiri's face. It hadn't been enough for her to forget the horrible choice she had to make, and when she lay down in the cabin Danny had provided, she tossed turned, and completely failed to sleep. A few times her fatigue almost got the better of her, and she drifted into a woozy half-awake state, but she knew she'd be counting the hours until dawn. At one point, when she was in one of those near-sleep states, she felt something through the force, like a hard nudge. She jerked upright and threw back her covers, but stopped before getting out of bed. She had no idea where to go or what to do, she fumbled in the dark for the switch at her bedside. An artificial glow lamp, brought from the shuttle, winked on. Gold light spilled across her bedsheets and the curved walls. Sitting in the far corner was an old man. It wasn't second. She could sense this figure as an individual presence in the force. It was, however, faint and ethereal, like an echo of something distant but stronger. Instead of jumping out of bed or calling for help, she curled her legs up against her chest, wrapped both arms around her knees, and asked the ghost, Who are you? Someone thought I could give you advice, the old man said. He had a white beard, thick but trimmed, and soft blue eyes that seemed strangely familiar. Then she realized that he was dressed in the layered brown robes of a Jedi. Were you here? She asked. Have you been here before? The old man looked around the dark room. Not this particular place, but yes, I was on Zanima once. A long, long time ago. His smile on his face was sad and wistful, but also kind. Then Jaina realized where she knew his face from. It was the same one she talked to in the field outside the hyperdrive engines. It had been smooth and clean-shaven then, and over 30 years younger, but the something in the eyes and smile were unmistakable. I've met you, she muttered. I don't think so, the old man shook his head. I haven't. Well, I haven't been anywhere since before you were born. What's your name? She asked, though she already knew. 
The old man shifted slightly and placed his hands on his knees. Your uncle used to call me Old Ben. I came here once with your grandfather. Jaina had no idea what to say, what to think. Her uncle had told her that Ben Kenobi had appeared to him from time to time as a force ghost, offering important guidance and strength, but had finally stopped appearing not long before Jaina herself was born. From everything Jaina knew and had heard, even the strongest Jedi appeared as force ghosts only within a limited window of time after their deaths. No one had understood why or what that meant. It had always been yet another mystery of the Force. How did you get here? She asked. Kenobi's smile was amused. Master Yoda once told me you should never ask the Force how, where, when, even why, those you could hope to answer, but never how. Then why, she asked. Why here? Why now? I understand you have a choice to make, said Kenobi. Jaina fought a shudder. Second says it can make my brother live again. And do you want that? My brother was a Sith. I killed him. Sadly, Kenobi said, my brother was a Sith too. Jaina stared, confused. She knew Jedi and Kenobi's time were taken from their parents at a young age and raised without families. Then she realized. My grandfather, you weren't the one who killed him. No, the smile grew even sadder. My brother killed me. I'm sorry. It was all Jaina could say. Kenobi shook his head. I chose my sacrifice, and it was not in vain. My death allowed your uncle and parents to plant the seeds of the future. And in the end, they were the ones who redeemed Anakin. My brother wasn't redeemed, Jaina said. She felt her face tighten and expected tears to come, but her eyes and throat were dry. I know, Kenobi said. He apparently knew everything, despite being dead. Jaina didn't bother to ask how this time. The things he did, he killed our aunt, Luke's wife. He tortured Ben, tried to turn Tahiri dark. He killed so many people. So did Anakin. Yet in the end, Luke's love redeemed him. She shook her head. She'd heard that story over and over, taking it into herself as a symbol of all-powerful redemption, but she couldn't believe in it anymore. After her own brother had turned monster, it became too hard to fathom. She asked, after Anakin turned dark, after what he did, did you blame yourself for not stopping his fall? The old ghost nodded sadly. I spent many years in exile, watching over your uncle and waiting to redeem myself. Sometimes it seemed like I would spend forever regretting the decisions I had made, the ways I had let my brother down. But you tried, didn't you? I mean, you never gave up on my grandfather. He couldn't have. The Kenobi from Luke's stories was always too good, too saintly to do that. But Kenobi said, that was your uncle. He never stopped believing. I told him he had to fight and kill Darth Vader. After everything I had seen your grandfather do, I couldn't believe there was a spark of goodness in him. A tiny smile pulled at his lips. I was wrong. I want to believe, but I can't. After all he's done, after the monster he turned into, I can't imagine how he could atone. How? Kenobi repeated. I know, I know. But that's how I'm used to thinking. I'm a mechanic. A pilot. A soldier. I look at the details, the specifics. I used to be like that too. It infuriated Anakin. And your brother, was he focused on how? Not Jason. She shook her head. Maybe Anakin, our Anakin was. But Jason, he was all about who he was. What his place was in the grand scheme of things. The why behind it all. That sounds like my Anakin. Do you think he would have been satisfied by his place as it stands now? No. Of course not. Jason wanted. He always wanted more. Then perhaps that's what he needs. Maybe Kenobi was right. Maybe. Given form again, Jason's soul could find some way to redeem itself. But she couldn't figure out how, and she couldn't push that doubt from her mind. The ghost sensed her conflict. In the end, I'm afraid you will have to do what all Jedi do. The same thing I did when I stepped back from Darth Vader and held my lightsaber in front of me, begging him to strike. What is that? Trust the Force, he said and trust your uncle and mother to do the things I couldn't. 
I had to let go before they could make things right in the end. She found she couldn't deny his argument. She took a deep breath and said, I still don't know if I can do this. Do you want to save your brother's soul? Kenobi asked. Yes. More than anything. She didn't say that it was the only way to save her own. Then do what I did, and trust. The tears finally welled in her eyes. She blinked and wiped them away. When she looked up, Kenobi was gone. Jaina couldn't sleep after that. She threw on a coat and went outside. The night air was damp and cold. Shivering, she walked down the lane to a fire burning alone in his pit. She crouched in front of it, warmed her hands, and looked up at the sky. There was the faint hint of dawn in the east, but everything else was still a vista of icy stars against icy blackness. When she looked back at the fire there was a boy squatting opposite her. She nearly fell back in shock. The boy gave her a wry grin and asked, how'd it go? Jaina steeled herself, looked the living planet in what amounted to its eyes, and said, I'm ready. I want to do it. Wizard, a smile slanted on the boy's face. I want to get Tahiri up. I promised her she would be with me when I did this. Take your time. Make sure you're ready. The boy stood up, and Jaina did too. It's going to be a little bit of a trip, actually. A trip. Pack warm things, second advised. You're going someplace cold. Jaina and Tahiri stood on the mountainside, squinting at sun-bright snow. They had both borrowed insulated pants and jackets from the village, as well as breathing masks and the sleek black second and shuttle now resting 50 meters downslope. Each woman had a heavy pack on her back containing rations, heating tools, a spare set of clothes, and a portable transceiver. Tahiri's lightsaber dangled from her belt. Jaina carried both her own and Barden Jusix. They were as ready as they were ever going to be, so they kept climbing up the mountain to the ruins that lay up ahead, half buried in snow. Why here? Tahiri asked. She was right next to Jaina, but she had to speak extra loud over the roar of wind. Second said it was born here, Jaina explained. It said this was where it first achieved consciousness, when the old Magister died during the first U.S. Hanvong attack 70 years ago. Could have picked a better place. Jaina nodded agreement. In addition to the cold and thin atmosphere, the mountain was covered in snow that glared painfully bright in the midday sun. The high wind sometimes kicked up sprays that swirled upward through the air in elegant white whirls. In another time it would have been pretty but right now Jaina just wanted to get it over with. When they reached the flat promontory on which the ruins sat, both women looked around. Jaina didn't know what to expect. She was hoping Second would show up in some form or another and ask her once more, just to be sure, that she wanted to do this. She didn't want Jason, whatever Jason he'd be, to appear before her suddenly. She needed to brace herself for what was about to happen. Cave, Tahiri said, jabbing a finger at a large boxy indentation carved into the mountainside on the far end of the promontory. Sounds good, Jaina grunted. Anything to get out of the snow spraying wind. From the inside, it was clear this room had been constructed as part of the Magister's palace complex. The wind and snow-swept walls were cleanly carved, and Jaina thought she saw faint signs of painted frescoes. Well, Tahiri asked, now what? No idea, Jaina shivered. Whatever happens, I hope it happens soon. No kidding. Is Second going to show up at least? I hope so. I think. There was a sudden, strong gust of wind that brought sheets of snow swirling through the cavern. Jaina and Tahiri both covered their faces to keep icy flakes from getting in their eyes. As she buried her face, something struck her so hard she staggered. She heard Tahiri give a short cry as though pain. Then it rang clear in Jaina's mind, a sensation and a force she could never forget but had never expected to feel again and could not believe she'd lived without. She lowered her arms and raised her eyes to the snow-white glare of the cave mouth, where her brother stood among them.